please welcome to the stage Dr. Lawrence Krauss. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you all. It's very nice. Thank you. Good. Some people showed up. That'll make it more, you know, I like talking to Travis, but it's nice to have some other people around. Well, it's raining out there. We're not mm -hmm. used to the rain. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, I saw it raining. I thought, oh, that, that's going to ruin it. But then I realized we were in Vancouver, so it's probably... Right. Well, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, um, in spite of the jet lag... Um, which I don't normally get, but it's amazing. I live on now on the extreme east coast of Canada, the part that never gets mentioned usually when people talk about Canada. And, um, and it's a four hour time difference, not a three, and that extra, extra hour is, uh, it's, uh, it's the same time distance as when I go to London, which I was a, a few weeks ago. But anyway, it's great, nice to be back in Vancouver. It's been a while, it's nice to be back with you, it's been a while too. Well, this is your fourth Pangburn event. You yeah. must like something. Yeah, yeah. No, I've, yeah. we've had some good times, and it's nice to be back. And I hope it'll be the beginning of other things. But it's it's nice to be back in Vancouver. It's and you been... you also notice my space pants slash painter pants. Y yeah, um, yeah. I've had these. I've worn these for most Pangburn events, by the way. I've washed them a couple times in between, but. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're always like yeah the galaxy. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to check in on a couple things before mm -hmm. we jump into the book. Believe in God yet? Uh, I don't believe in anything. Um, <laughs> belief is a word that scientists shouldn't use. Um, oh, man. Things are either likely or not likely. I mean, I use the word belief like many things. I, 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 I fall in the traps of common language. But, but belief is just a ridiculous word, right? Because it implies accepting things for which there's no evidence. And... and um, yeah, it's either likely or not likely. I do have a God detector in my backpack, which I could have brought out. It, it, it still says no on it, but, but anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Ed, now, and I know you love triggering philosophers, because that's very triggering They're so easy to trigger. It's really... it, 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 when you say believe, because uh, a philosopher would say that, um, you know, belief is essentially uh, how, you, how you feel uh, towards a certain proposition, right? So, so if, if, if the proposition is God exists, you feel a certain way about that proposition. You either believe it or you don't, right? Well, yeah, but that's got nothing to do with rationality. Although, as another philosopher once said, reason is the slave of passion. Mm. And, um, and that's probably true. I think we, we rationalize. In fact, I talked about it in, the, in this book and when we talked about consciousness, that that we, we invent stories to rationalize uh, experiences that we might have to make it seem as if there, there's some rational reason for doing things. And so humans do that. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you ask me what I feel, sure. I, I'm, in that sense, although I used to say, like my late friend Christopher, Christopher Hitchens used to say, he called himself an anti-theist. Yeah. And, um, and I used to say I was an anti-theist. His argument was if there were... You know, if, even if there were a God, he wouldn't want to live in a universe with one. And, and I feel that way too. I, so, so my feeling is yep. to oppose the notion of a God. But that means I have to be skeptical of myself if I recognize that my predilection is to not want there to be a God. I should be ultra careful before, when, I, when I make the claim that there's no evidence for God because I know that I, you know, we all want to believe in, well, in Fox I, Muldar's language. Yeah. And... and, and uh, and so I should be ultra careful to realize that that's my preference. But in spite of realizing that's my bias, I, I recognize the universe gives no evidence for... That's all, that, I mean, that's the whole point. There's just no evidence and there's no need. We talk, you, you like to talk about it a lot, I know, and um, I get dragged into it, but, but there's this illusion that somehow the God question is important in science and it isn't, it just never comes up. I agree. 40, 50 yeah. years being a physicist, and, and I've never heard the word mentioned in any physics meeting. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I think it's more LARPing. You know, LARPing, people, people like go out, they, they, they imagine certain things are the case, and they play as the character or as the person who believes in a, in a god. I, I don't, if, when I see how people uh, who claim to believe in a god, the way I see them act, it seems like they, 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 they will play that way when people are looking or when they're thinking about it, but when they're not thinking about it, they're, they're just kind of doing what everyone else yeah. is doing. Yeah, I don't want to 
cast dispersions on an event. Yeah, but I've been I've been on stage twice with De Dinesh D'Souza, and I won't do it again. <laughs> but um, would you ever talk to Dinesh again? By the way, oh, I talk to him. Sure, yeah. I talk to uh, lots of people. I mean, I learned from my friend Christopher Hitchens, who had the best, you know, one of his good friends. I, I mean, you know, he he was a bulldog, but he was one of the most tolerant people I've ever known in terms of not canceling people because he disagreed with them. Mm. So I remember when I was at his place once, and, he, and, and we, we, we actually, before he died, he was going to have a filmed event, which I would have been great, with one of his good friends, Antonin Scalia, okay? Mm. And me and him and someone else, and I would have liked to, to, to have that. But Denise is a pleasant fellow. He just spouts nonsense and, and does it for a living. And it's been very good for him. But, uh, but we did debate on, well, there's a, what's it called Intelligence Squared. You and, did, And yeah. we won. Uh, it was easy to win yeah. um, that uh, about, I forget what the question was, but it was something about God <laughs> and um, him and a professor from MIT. But the reason we won, I shouldn't say this, but, um, but I will. Um, Do it. <laughs> the reason we won was that the, the non-believing part of the audience was, was trickier than the believing part, which maybe doesn't say good things about them. But so the way this thing works is that you, people vote beforehand on this show and they, you know, what their, you know, is whatever their belief is and then the program happens and at the end people vote afterwards and then whoever changes most minds wins. Okay? But it was clear that the audience, so what happened of course is that the non-believers all said they believed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and there's, uh, at least that's my opinion of what happened. Anyway, it was an overwhelming change, and I thought it, they were just trickier, and I, I would have done that if I'd been in the audience, so yeah. anyway. <laughs> okay, well, one other thing I wanted to check in on before we get into the book is James Webb Telescope. Uh -huh. Has anything come up for you uh, that has uh, turned a light on that made you go, wow? Well, yeah, sure, every picture. Just like the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, you can't see those pictures and not be amazed. And yeah, and in fact, there is a, unfortunately, there's this, I get emails all the time, people saying, hey, is it true the, Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope has disproved the Big Bang? And the answer is no. Uh, it's brought out questions, but the, you know, again, at the edge of knowledge, at the edge of what we're measuring, the data is always, there are always inconsistencies in the data. That's, that's what makes it the edge of knowledge. And, and so there, there was a ridiculous, in my opinion, New York Times article that I had to fend off a lot of email about saying that basically this was, there were all these things coming out that suggested the Big Bang, our, our standard picture wasn't true. And the point is that James Webb is designed to do a number of things, but one of the things it's designed to do is to look back to the earliest, the first light, to the earliest stars, the first galaxies. Because in our picture, we're trying to understand how they evolved. And, and, and a really big question is, is uh, you know, we see large black holes, or what looked like black holes, that are things called quasars. Black holes are really the most, if, if they're really black holes, they're really the most visible objects in the universe because if they're galaxy-sized, as some of these supermassive black holes appear to be, then, um, if things fall, when things fall into them, they emit a lot of light. And the only explanation for these things called quasars, which are the most luminous objects in the universe pretty well, is that they're huge, supermassive black holes and things are falling into them. They are, they, they could just be things that look like black holes, and, and I've written an article with a, with a, a colleague, and um, I see a professor here from, from Simon Fraser, who was a former who was at my university when I was chair of, at Case Western, who knows about, about this, but um, saying that maybe, we, you know, maybe it just looks like a black hole and it walks like a black hole, but it might not quack like a black hole. Mm. And, um, um, but anyway, uh, so the question is chicken and egg argument. There are a lot of these things in the early universe. How the heck did they form? Did black holes form first and then galaxies coalesce around them? Or did, or did small black holes form in, the, in galaxies and then combine and merge. And these are some of the questions that James Webb would answer. But one of the things that is surprising is there are more galaxies, apparently well-formed galaxies, because 
Galaxies take a time, time to look like ours. Our, our Milky Way galaxy cannibalized lots of small galaxies and still is. You know, the large Magellanic clouds and the small Magellanic clouds, and I'm still allowed to call them Magellanic clouds. Um, they, they, uh, they're small satellite galaxies that will be cannibalized. And the, and, and the Andromeda galaxy, which is that beautiful galaxy that you see all the pictures of that looks just like our own galaxy, um, and it is essentially just like our own galaxy, a nice spiral galaxy. It's heading towards us at about 100 kilometers per second. In about 5 billion years, it will collide with our galaxy. Not much, it sounds like a dramatic thing. It won't, you really won't know. The night sky, it'll get bigger and bigger than the night sky until it becomes part of our galaxy, and our, our galaxy will rearrange and become a, probably something like an elliptical galaxy, but there won't be much collision of stars or anything because most of it's empty space. But, uh, so that, that'll be a big, merger, but so galaxies to form their present structure ha cannibalize small galaxies, etc. And I think people had expected to see these nascent galaxies in James Webb at early times that looked very different, and some of them do. But what seems surprising is there's more well-formed galaxies than imagined. And that's difficult to understand in terms of what's called the standard model of cosmology. But, you know, it's just... It, it doesn't kill any, it's just, it's, it, 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 it's interesting. And, and, and the trouble, of course, with our universe is we have a sample of one that we can measure. And most of the predictions of our models are statistical because uh, that's how we, you know, we, we can work on, it turns out we think all of the structure in our universe comes from quantum mechanics and things are statistical. And so you can make statistical estimates about what's likely to happen. But rare things happen all the time. And, and, and tales of distributions happen all the time. And, and there's another thing that, you know, is kind of claimed to be a big challenge, the Big Bang, the rate of expansion of the universe. Some, uh, two different ways of measuring it come up with a sort of a two to four percent difference of the rate at which distant galaxies are moving away from us. And some people are making a big deal about that. And, and I'm a natural skeptic about everything, especially observations, new observations because they're often wrong. And, um, and I also, I'm old, which helps. <laughs> um, and I'm old enough to remember when I was a young faculty member, there were two measurements of what are called the Hubble constant, this expansion rate of the universe. And one measurement was 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Doesn't matter what those things are, it's a number. Um, and pl uh, pl with an uncertainty of plus or minus five, 100 plus or minus five. And there was a, the other set of measurements were 42, a lovely important number for cosmology, 42, I was, I was rooting for that, but anyway, 42 plus or minus five. Okay, now so it's obvious that the observers, their, their estimates of their errors were probably underestimates. Okay, now the difference is something like 69 versus 72. And by, I mean, by the way, at the time, when it was measured to be 100 or 50 more or less, I said, it's going to be 75, because it has to be somewhere between, that's what it basically is. So, but though error bars and those things, but 68 versus 70, the error bars are like plus or minus one now, apparently. And so people are making out a big deal about this potential difference. And maybe it's, it's a big deal, but it's a difficult thing to do, and, and it's hard to estimate uncertainties. In an experiment, you can estimate your uncertainties because you can twist the dials, and you can see how things change. You can estimate the systematics. But when you're doing an observation and you can't twist the dials of the universe, then it's harder to know what you don't know. I mean, really, when you're, when you're estimating the systematic uncertainties of a scientific experiment, you're estimating the things in some sense that you don't know, the things that you think could, give you, could bias your experiment. And of course, you can always miss those. And science is full of examples of missing those. Scientists try really hard to estimate them and, and, and you know, really do a good job in the whole, but so I'm less, uh, you know, there, there are things that are interesting, and that makes life interesting, but I don't see anything that causes me to, um, you know, to jump up and down, and, and in retrospect, it's going to be great, we'll have a whole night with you know, my answer to one question, <laughs> but um, I love it, <laughs> uh, they, I, I'll, I'm, hmm, this will be self-serving, but that's okay, I am. Um, the, there was a different time in the 19, early 1990s when I got involved 
in looking at the data from cosmology and, and looking at all the data, it appeared to me and a colleague of mine at Chicago that, um, it took me a while to convince him of that, but we did, eventually did, um, that the data was inconsistent with the picture of cosmology that we all knew to be true. And that time was that we live in a flat universe dominated by dark matter, and, uh, and um, that was the standard model of cosmology. And the data was simply inconsistent with that. And, and so we wrote a paper arguing that the only solution to make it consistent would be something that's more ridiculous than the data, is to say that empty space had energy. And, and in fact, to make it consistent, empty space would have to have 70% of the energy of the universe. It was ludicrous. And we wrote that paper primarily because um, I felt it, would, it pointed out that some of the data must be wrong. Okay? And I remember talking to a few people. I remember talking to Saul Perlmutter, where I, vis I spent a, a month at, at Berkeley, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And um, he was looking at a way to measure um, the total energy of the universe, in a, in a, in a sense, by looking at supernovae, the, the rate at which the universe expands. And, he, and I remember him saying, well, just, we'll, we'll prove this wrong. You know, that was in 1995. And three years later, um, they proved it right. And I was more shocked than anyone else. I, I thought the data had to be wrong, um, but, but it meant we had to have a, the biggest revolution in cosmology since I've been a cosmologist, that, that empty space had energy. And Saul and, and Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Um, Brian Keating I had on my podcast mm -hmm. um, pretty recently, and he, I don't know if you get this sense, because I know you, you've talked to him, um, do you get the sense that he's trying to look at uh, different models, uh, trying to steer away from the Big Bang model? Well, well I look, of course he is. Because that's, you know, every, that's the other thing that scientists want to do. Is they want to go in every day and prove their colleagues are wrong. Right? It's I mean, a good that's, thing. And yeah. it's really important to realize that because everyone thinks that, you know, everyone wants to keep the status quo, that science, scientists are invested in, in not allowing, you know, some fringe ideas to be, to happen. Now, scientists are people, that's a well-guarded secret. But, um, and so therefore, yeah, people do want a, their own pet idea to be right and other people to be wrong. But, but, um, but science progresses by proving your colleagues wrong, in a sense. And so, yeah, Brian, I, you know, he's an observer, and I think, obviously, he would like to make a discovery that uh, requires us to change our picture. But that doesn't happen very often. Most of the time, when there are, when you read something that's astounding, most of the time it's wrong. Remember that when you read the newspapers. Remember it if you read the scientific literature. When I read scientific papers, you know, I have this rule, this mantra, I learned from the publisher of the New York Times, which I used to write for. Um, uh, and he, uh, the, he said, I like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. And so that's my mantra. If, if I read an article in a scientific journal, I say, in order for me to accept that, my brains have to fall out. I, I think it's likely wrong. Now, it doesn't have to be, but likely is the key word. What's likely? And, and, and speaking of the event that you've conned me into doing in, in New York, um, <laughs> Um, the, Richard, Richard Feynman talked about, you know, UFOs in terms of aliens, and he gave my favorite line, which I'll certainly use in New York. Um, he said, I think UFOs, and by UFOs he meant aliens, okay, are much more likely due to the known irrationality of human beings rather than the unknown rationality of aliens. So you just, in the likeliness test, almost anything that you can imagine, no matter how absurd, is more likely than the claim that these are aliens. And, yeah. and it's true. Anything you can think of is, is more likely from, as a physicist, and I'll certainly try and argue that on, in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. Well, to the book. Well, that's um, a good idea. I thought we could start at the beginning if you think there was one. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. I think, it, uh, yeah, it, 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 there was something like a beginning. I mean, we can say with great certainty that, 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 that the universe is, in its present form, is 13.8 or so billion years old, plus or minus, you know, 0.1 billion years, so 13.7 to 13.9. The observers would probably say less error than that. But it's, you know, it is, there's no doubt about that. 
The hard part is the first, well, not, it's, I was going to say the first second, but that's not the hard part. What's, what's, what people should realize is we can measure things and test our ideas back to at least the first second of the Big Bang. So we can test the major features of cosmology right back to, and now we can, with the Large Hadron Collider, we can test our ideas back to the first millionth of a millionth of a second. But what, what's, if you really want to think about this as a, as a scientist, then the beginning is infinitely far away. Because the proper way of thinking about this is powers of 10. And in powers of 10, you know, so, so you've got 10 to the minus 1 seconds, it's a tenth of a second, 10 to the minus 2 seconds is a hundredth of a second, etc. And each power of 10 takes you back another factor of 10, closer to the Big Bang. Um, and every power of 10 gets harder and harder to, to, relate, to measure here in the laboratory. And to go all the way back to zero is, in some sense, an infinite number of powers of 10. And people and, can look this up if they look up the logarithmic scale. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, but what happened at t equals zero is we, we just don't know. We don't know. And, and as you said, I, I, think, I couldn't hear you that well in the back, but the, the, first, three, the first sentence of the, of the book, I think, says the most important three words in, in science are I don't know. And I think that's... And in, and, we were talking backstage, and I don't know if you said, I think you may have said this, but that's so important now, especially this week and all. And I mean, in, in well, human affairs, to understand yes. you don't know everything is so important. And, I, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, I write these things. is Because I think the lessons of science could be so much, can make the world a better place in so many ways if we use the techniques of science to assess our own yeah. situation. But anyway, we don't know. Well, and I think that's why this book is more than a physics book. I really do. I think it's a, it's a book of how to think well. I do. Well, I, thank you. Well, yeah. I mean, I think all science books should really be that. And that's really what we should be doing in schools, which is not giving students a bunch of facts, because that's facts are unimportant, because, you know, my phone has more yeah. facts and more misfacts than I could ever have. Yeah. It's a matter of thinking about how to tell the the, the wheat from the chaff and how to, and how to ask questions and, and uh, um, how to think critically. That's what we should be teaching students in an era dominated by social media. Uh, uh, so anyway, I think that's an important thing. But to get back to the beginning, um, we don't know because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, which is what we think is a theory that's required to, we have these two profound pillars of physics, at least two, but two basic profound pillars the um, quantum mechanics, which governs the way the world behaves on very small scales, and, um, and general relativity, which is a beautiful theory that describes certainly the way the universe behaves on large scales, and all scales larger than our scale. We, general, gravity is largely irrelevant in this, in this room. I mean, it, sure, you notice it when you try and get out of bed in the morning, but it's the weakest force in nature, and it doesn't impact on human activities at all in the sense of the processes that govern our lives. Um, but on all larger scales, it does. But it, it is incompatible, we think, with quantum mechanics. And so a lot of people try and come up with ideas to unify that, and some people string theory or loop quantum gravity. There are a lot of people who make claims. But we don't have a theory that, that is clearly a theory of, of quantum gravity. And, um, and, we, and there's some people who claim we don't even need a theory because maybe quantum mechanics doesn't operate on very small scales. I would discount that. In fact, I think they're wrong, probably. But I would discount that because there are very, some very smart people. My colleague of mine uh, uh, who won a Nobel Prize, Gerard Tuft, who's one of the smartest physicists I've known and didn't, you know, revolutionized the field in the 1970s, he's pretty convinced that quantum mechanics is an effective theory that on smaller scales it doesn't. It's not true, but you know, he, well, I think he's likely wrong. Yeah, if LHC would just, you know, get to work and show us the graviton, we're we're good, right? Well, LHC is going to show us the graviton, but it's <laughs> but it'd be nice if it showed us something new. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Higgs was a big Higgs discovery, great, but yeah. it was a disappointment for me to discover that we were right. I always much prefer to be discovered to be wrong, because mm. then then there's new things to learn. I mean, that's what makes it exciting. I was certain the Higgs particle didn't exist, and I had I. I had a lot of papers ready 
when it didn't, wasn't going to exist. When you, say, when you say you were certain, do you mean certain in the incontrovertible sense? No. In the dogmatic sense? You no, know, obviously I, I think, not. Because, well, you know, if you, I, once I realized it was there, I changed my mind. Yeah. That's the way it is. But. And that's, I think it's important to point that out because there's a, there's a incontrovertible type certainty that people apply to things like, uh, you know, Christian dogmas and things like this that de demand that you be absolutely certain, incontrovertibly certain about something. Well, no, knowing the truth, yeah. knowing, knowing the answers before you even ask the questions, that's the real problem. Uh, and it's yeah. not just Christian dogma, it's, it's any dogma. And as you've, you've sure, read anything yeah. I've written over the last three or four years, you know, the secular dogma bothers me just as much as religious sure. dogma. Anytime people make a claim that no one can question, the claim that there are more than two sexes, say example. And if you if you argue that sex is binary, then you're in some areas you're cancelled. And and the idea that you can't ask those questions and and discuss this. In fact, I was just with I'm sure my friend, another friend of mine, Charles, who's in the audience, a doc, a neurologist. Uh, um, he was shocked. I wrote a, just wrote a piece for for Quillette about the American Anthropological Association that cancelled a, a a a panel that was going to talk about sex and gender in anthropology. And they canceled it for a variety of reasons, but one of which that, that discussing that would be hurtful to some people in the audience, in some anthropologists. And, and, it would be, and even then they wrote another piece saying it would be transphobic to have such a discussion. This was about sex of skeletons, among other things. Okay? Hmm. And that's the antithesis of science. The, the, it literally is the antithesis. They don't understand what science is all about, which is... Science proceeds by dialectic. It, it proceeds by debate and discussion to try and achieve an understanding of where we're at and to not even be able to have a discussion of sex and gender for fear it might offend people is what you would expect to see in a variety of places, but certainly one would hope not in a scientific society. And it terrifies me that that's happening more and more well, in, in and this the, country and elsewhere. Yeah, and, the, and that's where the minimum requirements for fruitful dialectic are not being met. So something's going on there where uh, a dialectic that could bear fruit just can't happen. Yeah, so, yeah, and, 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 and it's, usually it's, we're seeing it in it, universities yeah. all throughout this country. I mean, this is not maybe it wasn't the point of the of the event, but I, it's bother, it bothers me that I can't not talk about it. Yeah, universities should be the one place where where no idea, no nothing is sacred. I don't think anything's sacred in general, but it's the one place where you should. Expect, and I, I said this a long time ago, the purpose of education is, is to make you uncomfortable. One of the purposes of education. If you're not uncomfortable, then you're not learning. You're not pushing yourself. And so, but we're living in an environment where too many students feel they should never be uncomfortable and too many faculty and university presidents think that, you know, it's better to not make them uncomfortable and, and, and be on the right side of that, of that social justice movement, and, um, and then there's no learning. So back to the first section on yeah. time. I have a major bone to pick with you oh, about uh, time machines, because ever since I was a little boy, I wanted a time machine. Didn't you all want a time machine? Well, of course, we all do. We all did. I, you know, I even probably let, tried let me, building one out of a cardboard box. Can I, before you go on, can yeah, I take yeah. a poll of the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two way reasons you'd want a time machine. One is to correct the errors of your youth. How many people would like to correct the errors of the youth? Okay. And the other is to relive them. How many people? <laughs> More people. I just, I knew it. Okay. Just, just, just checking. Okay. Go on. Yeah. Sorry. Well, and, uh, and then, yeah, I think about it and then I think maybe we're getting a little closer and you read some things, you hear some things, you read Einstein, you, you look at a different thing. And then all of a sudden you come along in your chapter yeah. and you say, we don't only need a time machine, we need a space travel machine. Yeah, that's, you know, it, it, I, I think that's the first time I wrote about that. I thought about it when I wrote my Star Trek book and a book after that called Beyond Star Trek. It's something that never is realized. It, 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 it's sort of one of these trivial things that makes time travel even harder if it's not hard enough. I love H.G. Wells' book, The Time Machine. It's one, I, I love it, I love his stuff. But, but the problem is, the Earth is going around the sun at 30 kilometers per second, okay? So if you go back an hour in time, the Earth will have moved 
3,600 times 30 kilometers, more than the size of the Earth, you would pop out in empty space, <laughs> which would be a, a rude awakening. <laughs> and, um, and so you have to have a sp machine that also moves you wherever the Earth is at the same time, and that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. We, but believe me, the time alone is a pretty big challenge. We were talking that would make a really good sci-fi comedy. Yeah, yeah right? we had a different view of it. You wanted them to realize they, they wanted to do that. And I, I, want, I thought it'd be great to have a sci-fi comedy where the whole, you know, all of society gets together and they make a time machine and, and the guy pops out in empty space. It would be, anyway, <laughs> it would be- The any, end. Yeah, yeah the end. It would be yeah, everyone, like everyone gets run over by a truck. But, yeah. you know, time, again, time travel, if you ask me, I spent a lot of time in the book and elsewhere showing that we can't show that time travel is impossible. In fact, the general relativity treats space and time the same. And I can, I can come to Vancouver and return home in, in space, so why can't I go to the future or past and return home? And the answer in general relativity is you can. It, you just have to find the, the right universe to do it in. Right. And the question is, do we live in a universe that allows time travel? And, and I think it's highly unlikely my, my late friend, Stephen Hawking, who wrote the foreword for that Star Trek book, it's, it used to say that time travel was impossible. He actually had a party once where he invited time travelers <laughs> and no one showed up. <laughs> and, um, and, and then he said, you know, that was his argument. If, if, if time travel were possible, we'd already be inundated by tourists in the future. But I, I as you may have may heard me say this before, I, I countered him that they all went back to the 1960s and no one noticed, so. Or, you know, or they might not tell us, right? Well, in fact, that's a, a new thing. That's not just true about that. That's true about aliens also. I think yeah, it's quite yeah. likely that advance, if we ever get to discuss aliens, that, that which, who I think, by the way, I think there is likely intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, although I think it's highly unlikely you'll know about it. But, yes. um, but it's also the question is, if, it were, if there was a highly intelligent society, what, what interest they'd have in ever letting us know of their existence or even talking to us. So, I mean, if I was an alien, I'd looked around and saw some people treat, treat each other around here. I'd be like, yeah, it's I'm not, keep it's this not just secret. that. It's yeah. if they were really sophisticated, they'd have nothing to learn or nothing. In fact, they probably would sit, uh, I'm a fr friend of mine, I think uh, Frank Wilczek and I have discussed this, uh, uh, that they'd probably just sit staring at their navels and going, um, because um, <laughs> they, they knew everything anyway. There's nothing else to do anyway. <laughs> There's a piece here I wanted to read from uh, page 35 on time. We don't know if the presently observed energy of nothingness, of space itself, is really a fundamental property or just a transitory one, like the energy that drove a presumed inflationary phase in the early history of our universe. So there's a I don't know there. Yeah, I mean, we know that the, the, our universe, we think, I shouldn't use the word no. We think it, all of the, uh, the best possible idea for how our universe came to look like it does today. And the only one we have, in my opinion, that, that self-consistently does do that is this idea of inflation. Um, that at early stages, there was a really rapid expansion in the universe. And it's a natural consequence of most of our, the extensions of our, of our theories of particle physics. It happens in almost all of them. Um, the hard part is getting it to stop, but there was a, there's a rapid expansion. And, um, but it does, it, in our universe, it stopped. It, if it happened, it stopped and actually produced all the structures we now see. It, it, the great thing about inflation is it takes small quantum fluctuations, and if the universe expands very big, those quantum fluctuations turn into real classical fluctuations and they become ultimately galaxies and stars and planets and people. So if you want to see quantum mechanics, the universe, just look around. It's re but, and, and it's a beautiful idea. Um, and, uh, but that had to stop. If it continued to expand forever very fast, nothing, no structures would ever form. And, um, and so that stopped and we, and, it, and we have an understanding of how that can be, that it was energy stored in empty space because there was what's called a phase transition the same as the kind of transition that when ice turns to water, water turns to ice. And, and, um, and when that happens, energy is released. And, and when you have a phase transition on a cold winter day, colder than normal in Vancouver, but freezing enough so that um, at just around rush hour, it's raining like now, but let's say it's a much colder, then 
Uh, the, the roads don't freeze because the cars are sloshing around the water and all that. But then after rush hour, they suddenly freeze. You get black ice because it's the preferred state to be in. It's below zero, but, uh, but uh, the, the configuration's been in, in as water when it really wants to be ice. And in the process of freezing, it releases energy, okay, because it, it's, in the, it's in the state it didn't want to be in. The lowest energy state at that, time, at that temperature and pressure is ice, and it was water. And, and so our universe could be in that kind of state where it, for a while it hangs around not being in the lowest energy state, storing energy, that would cause this big expansion, and then releasing it. Well, we, we are in a, as I said earlier, we've discovered, and by the way, the number we estimated, 70% is exactly what the observers discovered to be, 70% of the energy of our universe resides in empty space. But we don't know why. We, it's the biggest mystery in science because we don't know if it's fundamental or if we're just in another kind of inflationary phase where, where something's gonna happen. And, I, and the problem with that and is... And if you had to place a bet, because I do wanna know if you had to place a bet, is it fundamental or emergent? That's the... I... Well, it depends on the day. Um, <laughs> uh, really, it does. I mean, I, you know, I'm, it's a completely uninformed bet. I, I, I think it's... I, 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 it's crazy no matter what it is. I think it's, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it was the absolute lowest energy of empty space because that would, I, I like that idea because that idea is completely inexplicable. Why empty space should have that small energy c confronts everything we understand in science right now. So I, I, I kind of would like that to be the case because it would mean there's something really fundamental we don't understand. And the other reason I'd like it to be the case is if it isn't, and there is going to be another phase transition in the fundamental properties of, of matter, then when that happens, it could be that everything disappears, right? Because all the stable structures no longer become stable if we go to a different ground state. And, and the good news is you wouldn't know it. It happened at the speed of light. So it get you before you, you before you knew it was going to hit you. So, but I will say, I'm very happy that I wrote, I don't know, a dozen years ago, I don't remember how long, a paper saving the universe, um, showing how we could, this, you could have a phase transition. You could explain naturally why, why the energy of empty space was what it was. And if, if we were in an unstable state that was gonna have a phase transition, but the way I worked out, that phase transition would not produce anything that would change our, our lives. So it's almost certainly wrong, that paper, but it might be right. You know, if it I, is, I, all of saved the universe, yeah. which is good for a day's work. I actually uh, quite hate time. We've already burned 50 minutes. Uh, really? We well, that's, I think I, I burned 40 uh, of them in my answer to your first question. Um, no, it's, it's good. This is really important. I did, you know, I was, I was telling you this when we were having a conversation earlier about uh -huh. how surprised I was that you put a section uh, on consciousness in yeah, this book because it, like literally every time I would ask Lawrence about consciousness, whether we were doing a podcast together or whether we were on tour, he'd say, ah, I don't want to fucking talk about that. Like he didn't, he didn't want, have anything to do with, uh, yeah, with no, consciousness. Yeah, I certainly didn't. I mean, it's it, because it's such a murky topic and it's also such a difficult concept. And as I told you, I, and partly because I have fr friends, um, are good friends of mine in Phoenix, who, who one of them, she reads everything. And every week she would tell me about a new book on consciousness that unveiled the meaning of consciousness. And then I, I reminded her, which I talk, I think I mentioned in the book, that someone told me, or I read once, that, and I think it's true, that you can tell how much is known about a subject by how many books are written about it. Yeah. The more books, the less is known. Yeah. And um, you know, you only need one book on quantum mechanics, Dirac's book on quantum mechanics, that's all you need. Yeah. And, and, and uh, that doesn't mean there aren't more of them. But, so, but, but on the other hand, this is addressing the key unknown, known unknowns. And by the way, the book in Britain is called The Known Unknowns. In, the, in Canada, in the US, it's called The Edge of Knowledge because The Known Unknowns is a quote from uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who some of you may have heard of. And, um, and uh, my, my, my US publishers felt that that would be too divisive if we had a quote from Donald Rumsfeld. So they changed it. It's a great quote. It's a, you know, I, don't like, the guy, good, I don't like the guy at all, but it's a great quote. Wouldn't that have been good marketing, though? Like, they, they I, thought I people, think so, but they thought it's people were going to see the title and, no, oh, I can't. You know, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't. The, the, with newspaper articles and books, the publishers have the final say. And um, 
And uh, The Edge of Knowledge is a nice title. It is. Um, uh, but um, I forget where I was leading to, why I was leading that, but, the, but what, what the, your question was. But <laughs> in any case, the known unknowns is, is, a, is, a, um, is for me, you know, that's why I talk about co consciousness. Because look, if you're going to ask about fundamental questions, there's five sections. There's time, space, matter, life, and consciousness. If, it, if you ask what are the key frontier known unknowns about science, you have to talk about consciousness. And, and the other thing that I only realized after the fact, if I'd thought about it, I would have been, would have been obvious to me, that makes this so neat for me. It was also fun to learn about consciousness and learn about some experiments about consciousness. So one of the reasons I write books is to learn things. Otherwise, it's always the same book over and over again. But, um, and I know some people who do that. But anyway, um, uh, um, something about consciousness. Oh, um, so, uh, well, I forget what I was going to say. I made that joke and then I lost That's it. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, hard problem. Uh, did you discover anything when you were looking at the consciousness issue of any value, or do you think it's just this deep hole of despair that we're still well, just kicking I think it's rocks? A, it, it's a very, you know, oh, now I remember why, what, what I was going to say before I get there. I was just going to say that what is interesting is that it's not surprising, perhaps, is that the deepest questions facing science are precisely the same questions that everyone asks who aren't scientists. You know, how did the universe begin? Can you travel in time? Are, there, are we alone in the universe? When I see green, do you see green? It's the same thing. You know, all of the questions we ask are the same questions that science is asking. And I think that's interesting. And, and with consciousness, we're not, we, uh, there's a lot been learned about the brain and the way it works. But when it comes to consciousness, I don't think we're much beyond the same questions that everyone asks about what, what some people say, and, and, and both philosophers in particular, but some neuroscientists would say, and it's reasonable, that consciousness is an illusion. Of course it is. We put, we put together this, this notion that there's an us inside our brains, and it is an illusion, um, that there's some central control panel person there operating things. But that's, saying that, mean, you know, it, like many things philosophers say, means nothing, because... Um, <laughs> The question is not, you know, okay, is, it's an illusion. The question is, how does that illusion arise? Mm. Everything we see is an illusion. The, the solidity of this chair is an illusion, okay? But the, this physics explains how that illusion arises. And so what, what, I, what, I did, what did surprise me, and I, I read a lot of, I knew, I've known a lot of conscious, people who work in consciousness and learned a lot from them, but I read books that I wouldn't have read otherwise, and what was interesting to me was that even I def the chapter before I talk about what is life and defining what life is is a little surprising. Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, the, the definitions you come up with for life, most of them are satisfied by fire, and fire isn't alive. But as hard as it is to define life, defining consciousness is harder. And most researchers who talk who, who work on consciousness. Don't even try and define it because it's we don't have an extra. Well, and and after the book came out, I did a, a, an event with Noam Chomsky. Yeah. And uh, and he said argued that maybe that's where you're leading, but he argued that you know maybe the whole question of is just the wrong question. Yes. He, he thinks ultimately in in the best worlds we'll have a mathematical theory of how things work, and we won't worry about the 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 the, mech, the mechanisms in that sense. The example being just like. Electromagnetism, the most foundational theory of modern science, James Clerk Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, the four Maxwell's equations that physics students wear on their chest and t-shirts. Um, when he developed that, it was, and, and to define it, he had a theory about, you know, how the empty space worked with wheels and pulleys and all of that in order to get the equations, but, but we've thrown that out. Just have the equations. We don't think of the wheels and pulleys. And he, he, Noam has argued that we won't even talk about consciousness. We'll just have a mathematical theory of... Yeah, of how, I, I don't know. At yeah. this point, I think I agree with Noam on that. I had him on my podcast recently, and we talked about the same thing. Yeah. Um, well, you know, he's, he's dogmatic about a number of things, but... but um, <laughs> uh, uh, or I wouldn't... Well, anyway, he's sharp cookie. So... Um, uh, but um, anyway, it is yeah. a, it, what, what is what was fascinating, and one of the things I really enjoyed doing there, I actually know this guy, Michael Gazzana, uh, uh, he's at UC, UCSB, I think he's still alive. Um, I lectured there with him, he's a neuroscientist. But they, he and, and uh, 
and also Joseph Ledoux, who's another neuroscientist I know at NYU, um, uh, they were involved in, in but Gazanagan, in particular, these split brain experiments where people who have epileptic seizures, they found um, that if they, if they cut, cut the corpus callosum, cut, yeah, the yeah. thing that connects the two hemispheres, that it reduced the severity of, um, of, uh, of epileptic. But it, get, it made them great test subjects because those two parts of the brain couldn't communicate together. And there's a great experiment that shows how people fool themselves. And, um, and the corpus callosum, by the way, is the, is, is, is the thing that, because it connects the brain, sort of involves yeah. in multitasking. That's why my wife says men have smaller corpus callosums than women. <laughs> Lawrence they, so they does, can't multitask as well. Lawrence does provide so many amazing examples like that in the book. He goes through Einstein and, and trains as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some really They're cool funny. things in Maxwell. Um, now, please step up to the microphones uh, oh, okay. if anyone, for anyone who has any questions. Uh, be brave, uh, even if the questions uh, seem simplistic. I'm sure they are not. Um, yeah, thank you. Let's go. Um, or now's your time to leave, politely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You're first. Uh, I'm going to apologize right off the bat for being late. Um, no worries. But I've waited a long time to actually ask you this. Oh, okay. uh, is there anyone in the audience who's ever seen the Isaac, Isaac Asimov debate about nothing? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, 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 no, so, Neil so moderated that. You'll have to help me a little bit with the first name. He was the yeah. expert on zero. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I used to, I got the philosophers mad at me because I said they're experts in nothing. Yeah. Can you step a little bit closer to okay. the mic? Sorry. Awesome, Jim, thank you. Jim Holt was the next one. Yeah. The, the not philosopher, he's the... Um, he's a writer. He's a, a writer. writer. Yeah, he was very clear about that. Uh, and he experienced zero, or sorry, nothing, uh, twice. Professional bowling and, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, every night during dreamless sleep. Okay. Which you didn't love. Anyways. Uh, and then we had um, Mr. Bugle, uh, Richard Goddard. Goddard? Rich Goddard? Okay. I can't remember who all was there that day. Okay. <laughs> and so he had a Bugle and he had an idea of what nothing was. Yours was um, no time, no space, no energy. Correct? Nothing is a very comp. Is a, is, is a, science is my whole point with that book and the discussion, which, which again, it's hard for classical philosophers to understand is that our notion of what nothing is has changed dramatically. But that's okay. People think it's a cop-out. In physics, the difference between nothing and something is now largely non-existent because nothing can become something, and something can become nothing. And so, um, and that's not a cop-out. It's just called learning. Well, I think what the, the, the critique here is that um, a boiling pot of fundament of, of uh, virtual particles popping in and out of existence is not nothing. Yeah, it's but a those, state of potential. That's the critique you know? of people who haven't read my book. Because, right. Um, I, I, you, you address this. Yeah, I know I address it, but yeah. there, there's all these, especially the religious ones. This may not be your question, but it doesn't matter. I'm answering it. Just wait. Um, <laughs> uh, the, I was actually um, going to give you an opinion eventually. Yeah, but the point is I'm not talking about virtual particles popping in. That's one kind of nothing. There are many kinds of nothing. That's the simplest kind. Empty space is one yeah, kind of nothing. Eva, That's the nothing of the Bible, by the way. No. And, but, but I'm saying that no, there was no space, no time, and that popped into existence. So there was no space. Everything we now experience did not exist in the sense there was no space and no time. But that's allowed if quantum gravity is, a, is correct. Space and time can pop into existence. So it's not virtual particles in empty space. It's space and time themselves. They're, our universe didn't exist, and then it existed. Now, that may not be nothing for you, and I don't really give a damn, but that's, I think, a pretty good argument, a definition of nothing. Sure. Okay. We won't talk about Eva and her string theory okay. on the Okay, other so end. what's your question that I haven't answered yet? <laughs> My question is, if you were to take yourself out, and this is not fair to ask, but I'm going to. If you, do, if you were to take yourself out of that panel and looked at the other people's versions of nothing, which uh. one do you think you would gravitate towards most? No I mean, one's. Oh, okay. No, I mean, look, you know, I, I, I think that... Because Rich had an idea that, that outside of the emerging universes, the outside of the event Well, the, but the point is, the key point is there doesn't have to be an outside. It's easy, if you think it, it could be, although I think it's unlikely, but it could be that our universe is all there is. 
And space itself did not exist and then existed. And there's no, and, and so people tend to think of a closed universe must have something outside of it, because the Earth is a sphere, and there's something outside of a sphere. But if you're on the surface of the Earth, the surface of the Earth, if you're an ant, that's everything, okay? And you can have a closed three-dimensional universe, and there's nothing outside of it. There doesn't have to be anything outside of it. There may be, if, especially if there's a multiverse, which I think is most likely. I think it's quite likely that there are many universes now, based on what we know. Um, and I even have proposed ways to indirectly try and just demonstrate that's the case. So it's not, if that's the case, it'll turn it from metaphysics to physics, which is always a good thing. But there doesn't have to be an outside. And I, I think it's, I think it's, um, it, it's a, a kind of misconception to think about what, what something would look like from the outside when there isn't necessarily an outside. So that's Fair my problem. Thank, thank you. Sure, sure, thank that's you. a good question, thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. First of all, uh, thank you for telling me that the book has a different title in England. I'm going there in January, and I'd hate to pay twice for the same book. <laughs> that, that's another good thing about having two titles, actually. <laughs> uh, you, you won't remember me, but uh, you and I uh, indulged in some meaningful conversations several times at the uh, Imagine No Religion conf uh, oh, conferences okay. I do remember up, those in, wonderful up in Kamloops. Um, a few years yeah, back. Yeah, I remember, run by a lovely guy, yeah. Um, my question, you, you said during this evening, I can't remember the exact word you said, but you Me think, too. You think, think that it's, uh, there is other life in the universe. Oh, I'm really, I by bet there wouldn't be surprised to find other life in our solar system. You think there, that there's life elsewhere in the universe? Oh yeah, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't. So my question is this, by your definition of the word, would that be a belief? No, I said it's likely. <laughs> uh, 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 it's uh, highly likely. Um, life in the clouds and Venus? And it's based on evidence, okay? So I, I, have a whole, I try and explain it in the book. Yeah. But, um, but here, here's the basic argument, it's pretty simple. So the first thing you realize is that life evolved on Earth about as soon as the laws of physics allowed it to. Um, Within, within 500 million years of the formation of the Earth, there were the oldest fossils of, of, of formed. And now it couldn't have formed much earlier because there was this, what's called this period of early bombardment. As Jupiter was forming in the first 100 million years of the solar system, um, there were an incredible amount of stuff in the, in, the, in, the, in the solar system and it was bombarding the Earth and it would have evaporated the oceans and everything. And we're fortunate, one of the reasons there's life on Earth is that Jupiter exists, because Jupiter acted like a cosmic vacuum cleaner that kind of swept out or knocked things out into the outer solar system, okay? And when that bombardment subsided, it took, you know, almost 100 years for that, million years to ha for that to happen. Within a very short time, life evolved. And so we know, that, we know that there are certain ingredients that appear to be precursors for life on Earth. One is water, the other is sunlight, and the other is organic molecules. But all of this, those exist in profusion, not just in our solar system, but in the galaxy. One of the, you know, there's, you just heard about the comet bits that were brought back to Earth from, uh, and, and uh, they've discovered organics in there, but we can look at the spectrum of, of comets and, and we can see organic materials, we can see the basis Effect, we see amino acids, okay? So all of those exist in profusion, and so uh, it, it, it's hard for me to imagine with there being 100 billion stars in our galaxy and 100, now we know that almost all those stars have solar systems around them, so maybe 100 billion solar systems, that, that um, if they have the same ingredients, that that hasn't happened. Now, um, but we, we don't know about that. I, I have... And, and the, the other thing is discovering life on Mars, extant or extinct, more likely extinct life on Mars, would not be evidence of two separate genesis. Because the other thing we've learned is that no planet is an island. Um, because we learned that materials, and if you're, you're old enough, but some of the audience isn't remembering, Bill Clinton in 1996, I think, had a press conference in the White House where he met, made, basically announced the discovery of life on Mars. A Martian meteorite had been discovered in Antarctica, okay? A Martian meteor discovered not on Mars, but in Antarctica, which is why we go to look at meteors. This, I'm going to wake people up. And why do we go to Antarctica to look for meteors? 
It's white, exactly. So you take a snowmobile. I, I was volunteered, actually. I didn't get selected, but I wanted to go on and do it because it requires no skill. Um, <laughs> uh, you just take a snowmobile and you drive around. If you see a rock on the surface of the ice, you know it came from up there. Okay? And, and, so, and this meteorite from the Allen Hills in, in Antarctica had been discovered. And, it, and we know from, from previous missions to Mars what the comp composition of Martian soil is, etc. And this one, we knew it was from Mars. And when it was sectioned, these chemists at Stanford saw these small spherical globules that looked very similar to the earliest um, fossilized life on Earth and in, in, in measured from uh, Australia and, and other places where the oldest rocks are, and some of them from Canada. And, um, and so it was, it turned out they were 50 times smaller, though, with, but when it's grown up, they, and, and, and it was a big claim discovery. Of course, it turned out that there are non-biological ways for that to happen, and most people now think that that was the case. But what it did force us to realize is that microbes, we all know about extremophiles, microbes could easily survive in a rock the, the, the voyage from Mars to, if they're knocked out of Mars by a, by a collision, a comet or asteroid hitting Mars, and they could make the Earth, and they could potentially survive in a relatively inert state. So, as a friend of mine from whom I've learned a lot from, Andy Noel, who's a, a, a fantastic geo, geologist and biologist, um, and, and on some of the Mars rovers teams, that if we discovered life on, on Mars, it, wouldn't be, it would surprise him most if it wasn't our cousins, okay? Mm -hmm. But, so that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be definitive proof that there's been two genesis of life. But the great thing is we now know there are oceans in Europa, Enceladus, moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and they're, they're separated by five to 10 kilometer thick ice, okay? And so they're separated. And, but those are spewing out organic water containing organic materials, okay? Yeah. And so, there will be missions, and there are planned missions, to, to actually drill in Enceladus and go into the uh, oceans and, and, and see if there's microbes. If there are, that would be extremely strong evidence that there's a second genesis of life in our solar system. If that were the case, there'd be really strong evidence that it was ubiquitous. Yeah, else, yeah. Not intelligent life, but life. Now, I have a bet with my friend Richard Dawkins, by the way, Everything, you know, I I've ran a, an institute at my university and ran a lot of meetings on the origins of life, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to write this chapter so I could update my knowledge of it. And um, I, my bet, again, because I'd like to be wrong, is that life discovered the only chemistry that works. You know, people said, well, maybe the, the, the amino acids, the, you know, the tw 20 or 21 or whatever that are used by life, maybe they're different amino acids in other life forms, maybe different base pairs of, of DNA, um, uh, because you could imagine that happening. My bet is that physics and chemistry, that, that enthalpy, that, 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 that ultimately there's one route that works and life discovered it, which means if that's true, then all life forms in at least all life forms in situations like ours on planets around stars might have DNA with the same four base, four base pairs, have energy powered by ATP. Uh, it'd be, it might be identical. And so I have a bet with him that, it, that, that any time we discover new life, it'll be exactly the same. But I'd like it to be wrong. Yeah. Anyway, that's Thank you, Thank you so question. much. Sure. Um, Lawrence, did you want to touch on uh, Venus clouds? Yeah, uh, life? I'll touch on Venus I think, clouds. I think that's very interesting. It is, and yeah, yeah it is and isn't. Um, one of the last places you'd think to look for life is Venus, because it's hellish. It's, it's going to be like, the Earth is going to be like that in two billion years, by the way. Just wait. Um, because of a, of, of, of a greenhouse effect, not due to the carbon dioxide we're producing, but eventually the sun will be 15% brighter in two billion years, and um, water will evaporate from the Earth's surface, and water is a really good greenhouse gas. And, um, and, and it'll, it'll, the surface of the Earth will become like that of Venus is now, you know, maybe five or 600 degrees Celsius. Um, so you'd think that that'd be the last place to look. But it turns out that clouds around Venus are very dense. And there's a layer of, of clouds which has a density of water. 
on Earth, and probably temperatures and pressures that are not too different than Earth-like temperatures and pressures. So people have argued maybe there are life forms in the clouds of Venus. And one group of people claimed to find a, a, a chemical compound that they suggested was strongly suggestive of life in the clouds of Venus. They were wrong, okay? But it is a place that nevertheless now has new interest for some people. Um, and, and an exciting claim was made, and like most exciting claims, it was wrong. <laughs> That's the thing I want to remind you of. Most exciting claims you will read about in the newspapers and science are wrong. And the real problem with a lot of the way they're reported is they're reported, but when they're proved to be wrong, you never read the stories afterwards. And that's why a lot of people think science is just so faddish. Because today we think this, tomorrow we think that. And, and it's because all these wrong things get attention. And they get attention because universities and other places want to get money. And so they have press offices that give press releases on these great discoveries. And science journalism has largely ended because newspapers don't have money to generally have science reporters. And so most of them just take the press release and publish the press release. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it's, but that, and that's news. But when a, you know, a dog doesn't bite a man, it's not news. And so um, you don't read about it later on when it's wrong. And I think that's a real problem, but that's just the way it is. Anyway, I get to pontificate about so many relevant <laughs> things. Okay, <laughs> yes. Hey, Lawrence, how you doing? Nice to see you. Um, so and you and your little one here, nice yeah, to see yeah. you. You touched on this, uh, the previous question, but I still kind of, trying to visualize the correct way to think about the universe because, you know, we were used to seeing things with bounds, you know, we can see the edges of them. And when you talk about the universe, there may be nothing on the other side of it. It's a hard concept, right? Because what's not, nothing is in this space. It's a hard concept, yeah. So, yeah, I know, and uh, uh, it's an empty space, but that's something, isn't it? Well, it, but that, as I'm saying, it doesn't have to be any space at all. But, I mean, it's hard to think, in a closed, look, the difference between an open, closed, and flat universe, these are three-dimensional things, they're not two-dimensional. So, and we can't picture them because we live in this, so, you know, in this world where there are three spatial dimensions and we, and a flat universe is just the universe that we all think we live in, where, you know, we all feel we live in, where the X, Y, and Z, now that I live in Canada, the X, Y, and Z <laughs> axes um, uh, are always pointing in the same direction. Right. Curved universes are ones in which the X, Y, and Z axes here are pointing in this direction, but somewhere else are pointing in that direction. It turns out to be three different kinds of geometry. There's, and flat is exactly what I told you. And closed is closed, but it's not closed like a two-dimensional sphere, it's like a three-dimensional sphere. In a closed universe, you look out far enough in that direction, and you see the back of your head. Okay, if you look far enough in that direction, the back of your head. An open universe is hard to picture, this, the two-dimensional analogy is often called a sand a saddle, um, it's infinite in spatial extent. A closed universe is finite in spatial extent. A flat universe is generally infinite in spatial extent. It goes on forever, unless you have something called topology. And, it, it, and so, um, so in a closed universe, it's just, there isn't any, there isn't any, you, when you think of the surface of the Earth, you think there must be an inside and outside, because the Earth has an inside and outside. But once again, it could be that the surface of the Earth is all there is. And then if you draw dots on the surface of the Earth and it expands, those dots all go farther apart from each other um, and none get closer. But there is no outside and inside. You, if you go far enough, you don't fall off the edge. You come back to where you began. Right. And, and so, and my bet, by the way, if you want me to bet. I love, I love bets. making bets about things that we'll never <laughs> discover in my lifetime. So I can be, <laughs> I, I often say I never, don't make predictions about anything that's less than two trillion years in the future. For two reasons. It's, it's simpler to make such predictions and two, you won't know if I'm wrong. But um, um, my bet is that, we, that our universe is closed on ultra, ultra, ultra large scales that we can't measure and maybe never will be able to measure. Um, just is it expanding too? Is, it, is, is, correct to be, is that the correct way of thinking? Is you hear about expanding universe. Is it actually expanding then? Or? Oh, it is expanding. Yeah, yeah, it's expanding, but it's, but, but it's closed. It's just like a balloon like getting a balloon, bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. All the dots are getting further and further apart on the surface of the balloon. Right. And, and my, I, th I think the most likely possibility is that our universe is a closed universe, but on scales that are, because of inflation, if you blow up a balloon very large, if you live in Kansas, the Earth is flat, okay? It looks flat, because it's very big. 
And inflation blew up our universe to be so big that it, one of the predictions, it's not always a prediction, but one of the kind of generic predictions of inflation is that the universe is flat. And we've discovered that all, all, within the accuracy that we can measure it, the universe is flat. Space is flat. We've measured it to 1% accuracy. Space is flat. But that 1% lives, but I'm saying it's not flat, at, not at 1%, but some hundredth decimal place. You know, it's yeah. not. And, and, um, but we have measured it. And that was the reason we, by the way, first proposed dark, what's now called dark energy, because the theories told us the universe is flat, even though the observers hadn't yet discovered that. And there just wasn't enough matter to make it flat. And the only, one of the possibilities, the only thing was to add energy to something else. Because the geometry of the universe is determined by the energy within it. That's the content of general relativity. The energy and mass and energy of space determines the geometry of space which then determines the motion of the matter within space, and it's that nonlinear relationship that makes general relativity so, so complicated compared to Newton. But so we needed something else to make the universe flat. But now the observers have measured that on all observable scales, the universe is indeed flat. One of the other arguments that suggests to us that inflation is likely. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. Hey there. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for coming out here in Vancouver. Uh, you're fantastic to listen to, so I'm, I'm very happy to be oh, here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, so I have, I have uh, two separate questions, but I'll go on one, and if there's time, then I'll go for another. Uh, one that I'm wondering about is in the direction of uh, gravity, because we, we don't know quite what gravity is. We know it works. We can you know, figure out the equations for it, but we don't know what it is. Do you believe that at any point in time we will understand what it is, the point where we can actually work with it and, you know, be able to leave space easily rather than need to use rockets and, and things like that? Do you think that's well, a possibility? The first, well, the first answer to your question is, is it, you, you, can, you can guess what my answer is going to be. But my answer is I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. want that, though. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but let me say, we can, let me, but this part of your answer, question, which is actually misplaced, because we do know how to work with gravity. There's this illusion. We've got a great theory. It's called general relativity. And, and part of the fault is the string theorists, who are a lot fault for a lot of things, in my opinion. But, <laughs> but, but one is calling this theory, string theory, theory of everything. It's really a theory of almost nothing. <laughs> it's a vitally important theory to understand the beginning of the universe and what happens in the center of black holes. But we don't need it for anything else. For everything we can see, general relativity works unbelievably well. So we have a wonderful theory of gravity. It's only those two little places we don't understand. Now, they're important from a philosophical perspective, the beginning of the universe we'd like to understand. So we do have a workable theory of gravity. Do I think we'll ever have a theory of quantum gravity? I don't know. I, it's not, I, I suspect it's not around the corner. I'm skeptical that string theory is at least, we don't even know what the theory is right now. But uh, it's, very, it's, got, it's well motivated, let me point that out. It's very well motivated. <laughs> but I'm skeptical because of the requirements in general for, at large, or for a, a large number of extra dimensions. So I'm, I'm skeptical of everything. Um, so I, I, I don't know, it's a hard question. Um, but, but it's the only way we'll ultimately be able to answer the first question that Travis asked. It's the only way we'll unambiguously be able to say what happened at the beginning of time. I can argue what's likely and what's plausible, and I've done that in a several books, um, but I can't argue with, with the kind of authority that I could if we had a theory of quantum gravity. So, but, I mean, you know, people work hard, and, and one thing I will say is there's no evidence that we won't. People say, well, maybe the universe is so complicated that our human intellects will not be able to comprehend it. And that's potentially true, but I see no evidence of that of some fundamental barrier. Every time there's a barrier, we eventually get around it. And that's why I think it's con worth continuing to ask the questions. So the, Maybe and, someday there will be. Yeah, and, and this brings up a tough question. And I know Eric Weinstein and some other people have brought this up, saying that uh, string theory has just been a big waste of time. And all well, these they don't understand what string theory is. Right. I, I, think, I don't think it's a big waste of time at all. It's, we've, uh, hard, it, it's well motivated. and. Good people have thought about things a lot, and it's produced a lot of interesting mathematics, mm -hmm. but it's also produced e useful tools that have been used elsewhere in physics. What it hasn't done is what it claimed to do in 1984, which is unambiguously describe a theory that for why our universe has to be the way it is. So it's failed in its original promise, and my, again, my friend Frank Wilczek always said string theory is promising, 
and promising and promising and promising. <laughs> but, um, but, but, so, but that's okay. The, so the hype I used to argue against early on, I got called a critic of string theory. I think even like many false things in my Wikipedia page, it says I'm a critic of theory, string theory. <laughs> but um, but uh, I'm a critic of the hype. But I wrote a whole book about why it was well motivated in a sense. Um, but it, it, hasn't, it hasn't come to fruition that way. But it's been, it hasn't been a failed effort. It hasn't been, I mean, it hasn't been useless. Uh, it's smart people doing, working hard often produce useful things. So yeah, I think people who just say, oh, it's been a big waste of time, really, it's easy to say that. And, um, but I, I don't think it's true. Well, especially coming from Eric, Weinstein, where his geometric unity idea... Which I do hasn't. think is a huge waste of time. Yeah, it, it hasn't produced a damn thing, and Eric yeah. is out well, there. Well, the fact that I'd never heard of it until he started to talk about it online and, and suggest to me... Oh, right. I'll, get, I'll get angry letters over this, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Suggest Let's to not me, get I, angry highly tonight. unlikely, in my, in my list of likely and unlikely, it's highly unlikely, just like uh, up there with you, UFOs being aliens, it's highly unlikely. Yep. You, do you have another quick question? Uh, and then uh, Yeah, I'd love to. Um, is it okay if I? No, go ahead. I'm Thank fine so with it as long um, as these people are. Mm -hmm. My my other question is about uh, our speed and traveling through the universe because we're we're going at such a speed around the sun in the first place and then the mm. sun in, around our galaxy mm. and so on and if if multiverses do exist, which I, I do believe also that there's a very very good chance that they do, we're probably moving at a speed against them as well. Mm. So what would happen if we? started going at zero? What if we found a way to go against the speed that we're traveling at and we hit zero? What would happen to well, our relation to time and what would happen to the universe around us? Well, okay, well, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, we're we're like moving thinking. at 200 kilometers per second around, our, our, around the galaxy. And our galaxy, relative to a, a frame, there's no universal rest frame Einstein, but there's a frame in which you can look at all the galaxies and ask, are you moving with respect to the average position of all the galaxies? And we're apparently moving at a velocity of about 600 kilometers per second relative to that background. You can actually measure it by looking at something called the cosmic microwave background. Are we moving with respect to this, this frame determined by the largest structures in the universe? So 600 kilometers per second is big, but it's small compared to the speed of light. Okay, first. So we're not moving at relativistic speeds with respect to that. It's fast, but not. But the effects of relativity at that scale are, 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 are measurable, but not huge. Okay? But you can't say in what sense we're moving with respect to another, another universe. It's, it, it's not well defined if, the space, if, there's no, if, if we're causally separated in space. Okay? Um, and so, um, but, Galileo told us that it doesn't matter if we're moving, that the laws of physics are the same if you're moving or standing still as long as you're moving in uniform motion. So but most people say we're standing still right now, but I'm telling you we move at 30 kilometers per second. If I'm on an airplane and I juggle, and I like to juggle every now and then <laughs> and do magic tricks, I brought some, but um, uh, you know, if, the, if there's no turbulence and the windows are closed, you don't know you're moving. Because there's no, there's no experiment that you can ever do, and Galileo was the first one to show this, that can tell you that you're moving at a uniform speed or standing still. There's no meaning to those two things. And those two frames are identical. And one person saying they're moving and another person saying they're standing still, it's, it's relatively true, but absolutely neither person can prove that. In fact, that was the basis taking Galilean relativity is what Einstein then realized. That claim of Galileo, which is true, we can measure it, is actually inconsistent with the laws of electricity and magnetism of Maxwell, which are also true. So these two pillars of modern physics that were true, but inconsistent with each other. And it was the genius of Einstein to say, I can make them consistent if I make space and time relative. That's what led him to relativity. Not he just said, oh, well, the speed of light should be constant. That it was realizing these two pillars of physics were inconsistent with each other, and he had the, and he realized that it was an assumption that time, that my time is the same as your time, and there was no experiments that proved that. And in fact, if you could say they weren't, then you could make these things consistent. And and general and special relativity is designed to allow us to have Galilean relativity, which is that no experiment, no experiment can tell you that you're moving with respect to me 
and that I'm not moving with respect to you. Both claims are true, and neither is absolutely relevant. Okay? That's good. good. Okay. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. We, okay. have, Thank we have you. time for these two last yeah. questions. Yeah, two last questions. And then Hi, we'll... Lawrence. How are you? Hi. Quick question. Do you, well, I wonder if you know something about new science being discovered at CERN in regards to spinning particles that didn't met I, the, I know, yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know. The 5% certainty. Yeah, I've done some of the calculations that they're measuring against, actually, so I know a lot about it. But um, it, 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 so at CERN, one, one of the things you're doing at CERN and also in an in, in, in accelerator here in, in, in North America, at the Fermi Lab, um, but there's a fundamental prop particles in nature. One is called the muon. It's a heavy cousin of the electron. And, um, it's, and, and, and because these particles are spinning, they act like they have spin. Electrons have spin and muons have the same spin. They have angular momentum. And because they have charge and they're spinning, the laws of electromagnetism say that they should have what's called a magnetic moment. A spinning charged particle has a magnetic moment. Now, these aren't spinning in real space, they're, because they're not really like billiard balls, but they quantum mechanically have angular momentum, and they quantum mechanically have magnetic moments. And the laws, the quantum theory of electromagnetism, called quantum electrodynamics, allows us to calculate with unprecedented accuracy, it's the best tested theory in nature, it allows to, us to predict to 10 decimal places what that magnetic moment of the mu one should be and also other things. And, and by the way, all of that requires there to be virtual particles popping in and out of empty space. We can never see them, but if we don't include their effects, we get the wrong answer. We get the right answer to decimal places, 10 decimal places, only if we include these virtual particles, which is how we know they're there, even though we can never see them directly. But it's a wonderful way to look for new physics, because if there's new physics on very small scales that you haven't included in your calculation, and the tenth decimal place, it'll it'll allow a, it'll produce a different magnetic moment of the muon. And what's interesting is that is that the measurements of the magnetic moment of the muon and the predictions that come from theoretical physics appear to differ at the what's called the two sigma level. That means it's ninety five percent likely that they don't agree. Okay. But that's not good enough in particle physics. 95% it happens all the time, okay? You need to be at the five sigma level for, for us to believe it. That means it's a one in a million or billion chance that it but The problem is the theoretical calculation is difficult. Not because the physics of electrons and, and, and or muons and, and light is not understood. When you do the quantum mechanical calculation, there are lots of virtual particles and some of them are quarks. And it's hard to do the calculation when you have quarks involved, because that's a theory called the strong interaction. And so what, they, what, what people did is say, we can't do that part of the calculation, but we can measure the interactions of quarks at other, other machines, and we can plug in those measurements into the intermediate part of the calculation and get a prediction. When you do that, that you get a result that's two sigma off, and that's what all the newspapers are talking about. At the same time, however, there's another way to do this calculation, which is numerically. We can't do the strong interaction calculations analytically, but we can get big computers to do those calculations. And those big computers have just come up with the results. And when they do it, they get a result that agrees with the data. We don't know yet which is the right thing. It's tantalizing. And the reason to look at these ultra-precise experiments is because in the 10th or 11th decimal place, it's big, you know, one way is to build a, a new accelerator that's 10 or 100 billion dollars, okay? Another way is to do a precise experiment and look in the 10th or 11th decimal place to look for new physics, and it'd be a great way to find it, and I'm, you know, I'm, I've always been interested. That's one of the reasons why I, I, I did calculations years ago on a theory called supersymmetry, and, uh, which would produce new, new changes in the magnetic moment of the moon. So they're, they're really important experiments, but right now it's indecisive. My bet, my bet is, because usually the astounding things are wrong, and since I've been a physicist, almost all the astounding things are wrong, um, is that unfortunately the, the, the new way of doing the calculation which agrees with the data is probably right. I'd love that not to be the case, but, but unfortunately, um, 
It'll require new experiments or, 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 or better computers, and maybe quantum computers can do the calculation better. And, um, and so we'll wait and see. Or we'll have new accelerators, and that may happen. Yeah. Again, unlikely. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, uh, was there someone in the back that wanted to ask a question? All right, let's uh, move this microphone. Up. Okay. We're looking forward to your question. It's still, you know, <laughs> I thought we were going to have a, uh, an intermission, so I, we can go on. It's only 8.30. We can go on a little long. I mean, you may have to pee, but I don't really care. Yes, someone in the back? And then we'll yes. do the question. Was there someone in the back? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, like, for example, scientific community hits a dead end on some concept. Uh, let's say, nowadays we call dark matter dark energy or... Uh, there's a concept of what happens at t equals zero and so on. And uh, uh, so what what uh, do they do after they hit the dead end? Like what keeps them going? Uh, well, like, oh, that's uh, a really good question. What keeps scientists going is so they actually do believe. They believe that what they're doing is maybe right. You have to work for 10 or 20 years if, on a, if you're an experimentalist or a theorist, you have to suspect that, that, what you're, that you're on the right track. When you find out it's a dead end, you do something else. That's what's wonderful about science. The most beautiful, elegant idea in the world, when you find out it disagrees with experiment, gets thrown out like yesterday's newspaper. Elegance doesn't matter. Beauty doesn't matter, no matter what some people say. It just, you change your mind. That is what, that's the lesson that this book is about and, and that we should teach people is that that's the difference between science and dogma. With dogma, you keep, when the evidence goes against your dogma, it doesn't matter. You, the dogma must be true, damn the evidence. In science, we're willing to change our minds. And I've, I've said this before years ago, and I, you know, but I'll say it again, that what I hope for every student at a university is that at some point in their education, some idea that is so central to their existence that it defines them turns out to be wrong. Because that's the liberation that education and science provides. And only then can you realize that, that are you willing to open your mind up to the idea that, that you might be wrong. And so it's a liberating thing. And as a scientist, I've been wrong so many times that, that it's, it's liberating, it's hard to do at the beginning, but it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly liberating thing. So if it's a dead end, the best thing to find out is that it will be a dead end. What's unfortunate right now is that we haven't been able to, we, we don't know. I, I'm willing to bet that dark matter does exist in a new type of elementary particle. I think the evidence is, my own opinion is that that's highly likely. And I've proposed experiments to look for it uh, 40 years ago, and then I thought they'd be done in five years with those experimentalists it's hard, and so they take time, and that's why I like being a theorist. But um, I think that's likely, but, but it could be that we don't, at the level that we, the best level we can do, and in the next generation of experiments will be that, that we don't find evidence for particle dark matter of the type we thought, and then we'll just have to say that we, that's wrong, and, and we'll go in another direction, but that's fine. That's what science is all about, at the edge of knowledge, okay? Right. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it's a good question. Okay, I guess we're having more than, yeah? So speaking of dead ends, I'm a postdoc at the University of Victoria. Ah. Um, and the question is actually related to dogma. So given that uh, university departments are kind of bleeding with I ideology mm -hmm. um, and identity politics, uh, do you have any advice for early career researchers who are looking to get into the academy, uh. but also keep their job? <laughs> it, uh, you know, you're in, uh, like, yeah, that's, my, advice to, my first advice is the same advice I give to all young people, which is don't let the bastards get you down. I mean, literally, just keep plugging away. The likelihood is not great of getting a job necessarily, but you're doing it because you enjoy it. You're not doing it to please someone else. You're doing it because you enjoy it. And the skills you're getting will be ultimately useful no matter what you do. But, Oh, this is going to, well, I said this in public, I guess, in writing, so I guess I'll say it in public and stage. Um, it's very difficult to get a job right now if you're a white male. 
It is. It's just the way it is. And, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, and so my, my, really, you just have to continue to ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I enjoying it? Am I getting some be personal benefit out of it? And realize that the path that you may ultimately take may not be the path you expected to take. But it may be a better path. I mean, I know some very, 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 very ultra-rich failed physicists who, you know, the guy named Nathan Mirvold who wasn't, used to work with Stephen Hawking, he wasn't good enough, but he then went to Microsoft and became a billionaire. Um, you know, uh, uh, Sergey and, and um, what's it, the two, I know the two of them, and found founded Google. You know, I mean, they're not computer scientists now, but they own computer scientists. Um, and, uh, and so, but I really do think that you just have to try and remember often in your career why you're doing what you're doing. It's discouraging, but, there, you know, but it, it's not impossible. And keep plugging away. Just keep plugging away for the sake of plugging away, and you never know what's going to happen. I mean, it's what, I, what governs my life right now. I've had a lot of discouragements. And just, just keep plugging away, because why not? And... and, um, and um, and a, and a friend of mine who's had a lot of other discouragements, and I've done a podcast with Woody Allen, has, has said, to, and it means a lot, just keep working, because it's, it, it provides a distraction from the fact that the universe itself is meaningless. <laughs> okay? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks. Anyway, good luck to you. Really good luck. I, best of luck to you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you for crossing the Great White North, and uh, I thought that uh, you should have some rewards for that. Um, Thank you. And I, I was listening the other day, you were talking to Kurt Jaimungle. Yeah. I don't know when you recorded it, but I only listened to it a couple of days ago. Yeah, it was, no, it was recorded recently in the last month or two. Yeah, and uh, it was very interesting, but I, I'm not sure what, what part of it was that triggered me to think about dark matter, continue on the theme of dark matter. but mm -hmm. I, there was a there's an opportunity in YouTube uh, to put in a query. I'm sure you haven't had a chance to look at it. My no. query was, is it possible to take a bit of dark matter and contain it in some kind of container? And then I realized that that I can go down to the local liquor store and buy some dark matter. There you go. Okay. And so uh, I thought you should have a little reward and have some dark matter. Oh, can I? So there you go. Can I, uh, well, there we go. You can look at that. Wow, this is great. This is absolutely great. I, I won't get a Nobel Prize for this, but this is good. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it, 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 uh, I'll answer the YouTube question. The, the dark matter is dark because it doesn't interact with electromagnetism. It it's really should be called invisible matter rather than dark. Um, and, that's, and, and so, but that's what allows things to be held in containers, is electromagnetism. The reason that we exist is Material bodies is electromagnetism. It's not gravity, right? Just to give you an... I, I've talked about this in, before, but it, I would tell my students this. To give you a sense of how utterly irrelevant gravity is, okay, you take the entire mass of the Earth, all of the mass of the Earth to be pulling me down, but the few atoms in this floor are holding me up against all of that Earth. It's just electromagnetism that stops you falling through. So gravity is just irrelevant compared to electromagnetism. And so if you want to put something in a container, you need a way to, con you need to have a force. And the force of electromagnetism won't work with dark matter. It doesn't mean there isn't some other way to imagine doing it, but, but any the kinds of things, magnetic bottles, all that requires electromagnetism. And so dark matter flows through things, and that's why we can look for it, we think, because if it's elementary particles, it's not just up there. It's in this room going right through your bodies as you nod off right now. And, and, and it goes right through the Earth without knowing the Earth was there. And that's why we can build experiments underground, because most of the particles go right through the Earth, but they don't, they don't have zero interaction, at least the particles we think about. They just have very weak interactions. And every now and then, one of them will collide with an atom. And if we have a big enough detector underground without any radioactivity for long enough, we might... We might witness an event. That's the idea. Um, but, but containing it is, is, is not possible. The, the best example of a dark matter-like particle is my favorite particle in nature, which you probably know is my favorite particle, the neutrino. And neutrinos from the sun, which are going right through you, about a hundred, a thousand billion, 
through every square centimeter of your body, every second of the day, day and night, day from above and at night through the earth and up through your body. They can travel on average through 10,000 light years of lead without a single interaction. And so it's hard to contain neutrinos too. Um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible for us to detect them. It's the beauty of modern science is that if you, is that we can build experiments that are incredibly sensitive to incredibly rare events. And it's so difficult that that's why I'm not an experimentalist uh, because it's, 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 it's hard and I admire tremendously. I propose the experiments and then they have to do them. I was on an experimental collaboration, the large one that I think will be the largest one, but I'm not on it any longer. All right, last question, here we go. Thank you. Um, if you don't remember me, I was the guy who yelled white earlier. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I actually asked you uh, if you could sign my girlfriend's book and you said yes. And uh, funny enough, uh, we forgot to bring the book. So oh. if anybody has uh, a book, Oh, the good, uh, news, the good, the good news is anything. written by. It's good you asked that question because he can give an answer. Yes, uh, we do have some books here tonight that I have backstage. We only have 15. Um, so, uh, yeah, it. we'll. Um, She's but, but they are available online. Amazon can get it to you in like. I would like you to sign my seconds. online book. I believe that's somehow possible. Your online book? Yeah, I have signed Kindles uh, what, yeah. on the back. <laughs> I, meant, the front. More? I meant through the internet. It's, oh, oh, it's okay. a joke. Yeah, I'm trying to be less uh, serious. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Bam Margera really turned himself around tonight, you guys. <laughs> and uh, Lawrence, you remind me of an old me. And mathematically, an old you. Thank that you is very a much correct that. Joint, uh, joke. Um, <laughs> okay. But uh, I started writing stuff down once you started talking about a closed universe. And... Um, I just wondered what's at the end of that closed universe. And then I started thinking the more about the some of the, the stuff that I've read that you said, maybe that we are inside of a black hole. And you said that the cosmic background radiation is what we use as a reference to judge our speed. Yeah. So could that be even thought of as perhaps the event horizon? We're looking at it from the inside. Um, yeah, it's a good question. The answer is yeah. no, but, but it's a but good question. But <laughs> it's is a, that true? Uh, the answer is no, because we know, we know what surface that cosmic microwave background comes from. It's not, it's not Hawking radiation from the event horizon. We, we, it, we know that. If there were an event horizon in our universe, and if we, our universe was a large black hole, the temperature of that radiation, so the temperature of the microwave background we can measure, it's about 3 degrees, 2.735 degrees Kelvin. That's 2.735 degrees above absolute zero. The, Thank temperature you. in northern Canada or something. But, um, <laughs> but um, if, if there were uh, an event horizon and, and Hawking radiation, do the universe observe universe being a black hole, the temperature of that radiation would be about 10 to the minus 42 degrees Kelvin. So it's so, I mean, it's orders and orders of magnitude below what the cosmic microwave background radiation is, and we know where that comes from. But we could be living in a, in a black hole, which is, which is a fascinating thing. A closed universe dominated by matter is, is essentially a black hole. Um, a closed universe dominated by en energy is, is not, because it'll expand forever if it's dominated by the energy of empty space. But it allows me to make a segue about black holes, which may be, inter may be interesting to others if, if my answer to your question isn't. Black holes are very exotic, and there's lots of movies about them and all sorts of stuff. But they're, they're, they're exotic, but they're not that exotic, okay? Namely, if you took a small black, if I took a, the mass of the sun to make it into a black hole, you'd have to squeeze it to be the size of, of, of the metropolitan Vancouver area, okay? Be very dense. Each teaspoon of material would weigh hundreds and hundreds of billions of tons, okay? So that's pretty exotic, okay? But if I took a black hole, the mass of our galaxy, and squeezed it, if I took all the matter in the galaxy and squeezed it, at what point would it become a black hole? The average density of that material would be the density of water. And if I took the mass of our observable universe and asked what would be the average density of that material if it were actually a black hole, it would be within a factor of two of the observed density of the universe. Hmm. So it's not so bad if you're living inside a black hole, if we live inside one. It's we're just not in the latter stages of it. Um, so 
so the nature of black holes is very different depending upon the mass of black holes. And, uh, but they're all equally interesting because ultimately in their final collapse they d defy the known laws of physics. And, and in my book I talk about strange things. Time becomes space and space becomes time. But, um, but, but anyway, but your question, which is, an, which is a good one, can be answered with a definitive no. The cosmic microwave background is not the Hawking radiation from the event horizon, because we can actually calculate what that be, would be, and it's 42 orders of magnitude different than what we measure, which is pretty definitive. So if you think it's so definitive, well, like, you believe it is, right? I don't believe in anything. <laughs> almost. Yeah, almost. No, not <laughs> but, even close. Um, Let's just think, for example, that we made up all these numbers to make things make sense. We made up uh, dark energy and, and, uh, and uh, dark matter just to make our math that's, make sense, yeah, right? Yeah, that's, that's what So you think. can't prove that those exist. So no, that, that's let's not just ignore we all that. Oh, sorry. We were, let's we ignore were, all that. Uh, and, just, and I'm going to ask you a completely different question. But let me just say, oh, we were sorry. drag kick. No one invented this stuff because we wanted it to be there. Physicists were dragged. Because it it's easy. Physicists were dragged kicking and screaming to the realization that it might be likely. And in fact, the real candidates for dark matter, the only kosher candidates, and I'm happy to use that word today, the only kosher candidates for dark matter are the ones that were predicted from particle physics to exist before it was realized they could be dark matter. And those include the supersymmetric particles of the, of the supersymmetric standard model, particles called axions. All of these were designed to solve problems in particle physics. And it was only after the fact that it was realized that in the early universe, they would naturally be created with an abundance that could be dark matter. So they weren't designed to, f to, to, to fill the holes or to mimic or, you know, it, it, they weren't done any of the things you say. They, they were there for a good reason. And then after the fact, we discovered this fact. So, so often people say these things, but they, they're wrong, like just like you were. Yeah, no, you totally proved me wrong yeah, there. And you. I've been saying it the other way. Do you think that if we, if we ever met another species that our numbers oh. would, align, would line up? It's a fascinating question. The answer, of course, is okay, I don't why, know. But, um, but I suspect that, the, yeah, I think any intelligent species, mathematics appears to be the language of the universe. And it would be very hard for me to imagine, uh, but I could be wrong, that, it, that, that any intelligent species would not discover mathematics. Because mathematics, Mathematics describes the universe that we live in incredibly accurately in any advanced civilization since we can actually measure that the laws of physics are the same throughout the universe and very, to high accuracy. Let me emphasize that. We can measure that to, to, in some cases in many decimal places of accuracy that the laws of physics are the same there, there, here, and uh, there, and there because uh, we can test it. Um, then I think any sufficiently intelligent civilization will and that's, we'll understand mathematics, and that's why Carl Sagan, when he wrote Contact, it's a, you know, what will you, what will you broadcast if you want to prove you're intelligent? And, and, and a, one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek, first 10 prime numbers, first 20 prime numbers, because it indicates you know mathematics and therefore you have intelligence. Yeah, and so. One of my alarms is set to a prime number. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, there we go. Thank you very much, and well, thank yes, you all. Thank you, everyone. Big round of applause for Lawrence Krauss. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to one day live in a world where art and science become the key sources of inspiration in people's lives, which, when applied, will allow them to drop anti-scientific beliefs. The human race, as I'm sure a lot of us, we all know, is plagued with anti-science all around the world, like believing that the Earth is 6,000 years old, climate change denial, anti-vaxxers, all that fun stuff. Um, virgin births. I know, we're still talking about this. It is my goal to promote science worldwide and to stand in opposition to negative sources of inspiration. One of my heroes and sources of inspiration is here tonight. Professor Krauss makes big ideas accessible, from early universe to general relativity, even though these subjects can sometimes leave us perplexed. He communicates in a way that's accessible. He also really knows how to piss off creationists. Please welcome to the Danforth Musical, Lawrence Kraft.
Thank you. Well, that's the show. Thank you very much. Um, so what I what we what I thought we'd do since since I'm going to be with Matt later is, is give a short talk on part of the new book, and and because uh, I don't have time to do the whole thing here, and I was just up north and, uh, near the airport to, at a meeting where I did. So I thought I'd I'd give you a taste of the greatest story ever told so far, and then we'll we'll get to cover more of it. Um, and, and maybe that, and I don't know what Matt has in mind. And then one thing, one thing Travis didn't point out is that we want to give a lot of time for questions from you all, so that you can ask about anything you want, about the book, about science, about your sex life, or whatever. <laughs> but um, so, but I want to start with this quote, which <laughs> is in the lights. I was going to say the hardest thing of all to see is what's on the screen, but, um, <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, which is. Uh, which, uh, filmmaker friend of mine, Werner Herzog, told me about. It's a, a naturalist book uh, called The Peregrine, and it's about a peregrine. Um, and, uh, and, and this thing, the hardest thing of all to see is what is really there, is really captures the perspective of modern physics, but the pr- perspective of science in general, that the world we see is an illusion. And what science has been able to do in the last 400 years is uncover many aspects of that illusion. And it is truly remarkable that we've been able to do it, that we've been able to overcome our own biases and prejudices and do that, and I want, that's what I want to talk about. Now, um, let's go, yeah, so let's, let's, yeah, I want to tell a story, so I thought I'd begin by, by copying, because I'll be doing that a lot. Um, a good storyteller, so the, it's the best of times today, and by that I mean that the Large Hadron Collider is operating, as I'll, as I'll talk about it, and it hasn't created a black hole that's going to destroy the world. <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. At the same time, it's, it's the worst of times. And, um, uh, no, not real. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but, um, anyway, and we'll come back to this guy, or at least it was, uh, what I want to talk about is how science can overcome not just the illusion of reality at the forefront of physics, but the illusion of reality that, unfortunately, permeates our political process. And we have to use the same tools. And it's been so successful in one area that we need to use it in others. But, uh, uh, but this too shall pass, which is the other thing I want to emphasize to you. This too shall pass. Okay. So this is a, uh, a window in the winter, which in Toronto you will recognize. Um, I, I, when, I, when I gave this, a talk about the subject in Phoenix, um, I, they didn't know what it was, so I had to explain it to them. But, uh, so these are icicles on a windowsill. And so what I want you to do to begin with is imagine what it would be like to live on one of these icicles. So for your civilization to, to have formed on one of these ice crystals, say that one right there. And if your, if your civilization formed and eventually had scientists and everything else, the physicist would explain that there's not something very special about that direction. The forces on that crystal would be very different in that direction than perpendicular to that direction. And, Physicists would come up with uh, with models that, that explain how the forces change, and theologians would explain why that direction was was meant by God, and and then and then there'd be wars fought in the name of God. Well, actually, people would argue whether it was that direction or that direction that was the most important one, and um, and uh, but we can see with the benefit of the fact that we're not on the windowsill that or in this ice crystal that 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 direction is just an accident. There's nothing significant about it. And the really amazing thing that science in the last 50 years has demonstrated is that's our universe. In a, in a, in not just in a sort of a vague way, but in almost an exact way. And I want to and I want to talk about that. And I want to pick up the story fairly late because I want to have time for, for for our discussion. So I want to start with this guy here, which is fairly late to story. He's out there. You know him. Good. The, Richard Feynman, one of the greatest physicists of the the second half of the 20th century. I wrote a book about him, and he's an amazing scientist. And he was faced with, with, with solving a problem, which, which was this. Uh, as I talk about in the book at great length, the science at that point had, had made great strides. We discovered amazing things. And one of the hallmarks of amazing things in science is when, is when things that look different on the surface are shown to be the same. When things that seem very different are seen to be different aspects of the same thing, that makes means of progress, at least in physics. And Maxwell and Faraday have shown that electricity and magnetism, which seem very different on the surface, are really the, exactly the same thing. And that led Einstein to show, or, or people following Einstein, really, that space and time 
which seem very different on the surface, are really the same thing. That means one person's space is another person's time. And all of these things are highly not intuitive because on our, on our scale, electricity and magnetism look different. Space and time certainly seem different. I can go from London, where I just flew in, to, and back again, but I can't go around such a time as far as I know. And, but all of that has eventually been resolved, relativity and electromagnetism, and it was great. But then came along quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics screwed everything up. Makes quantum mechanics makes relativity seem faint. It really makes it seem simple. Because the quantum universe is absolutely crazy. At fundamental scales, the universe behaves in a way which is literally not understandable and certainly seems absurd. But the basic principle behind quantum mechanics, which is important for what Feynman did, is that it, it, quantum mechanics is like, as I like to say, like uh, Washington or corporate America, which are the same now. And, uh, and, and that is that if you can't see it, anything goes. Okay? And we're going to learn more about that with investigations, I hope, in the next few months in, uh, in the United States. Uh, but that means that's all due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says if you measure a system for a little while, then there's certain things you can't tell about that system. No matter how good an apparatus you have, there's certain things you can't measure. If you measure a system for a short time, then you can't know exactly what its energy is. So what, what, what Feynman set out to do, and several others, and Feynman ultimately won the Nobel Prize for this, was to try and take this beautiful theory of electromagnetism that, that Maxwell and Faraday had developed and others, and make it consistent in the quantum world. Have a quantum theory of electromagnetism and utilize the aspects of quantum mechanics. And Feynman did this, and he, and he did it pictorially as well as mathematically. And this is the, the modern quantum understanding of why two electrons repel each other, something that had been understood classically 100 years earlier. So this electron, think of this as time. This electron repels that electron, so that it comes in by and it repels that electron. But in the quantum world, this is how it does it. The electron emits a particle called a photon. A photon is the quantum of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves come in little particles called photons. Even though they're waves, they come in little particles and they're called photons. So the electron emits a, emits a photon. Fine. The problem is an electron can't emit a photon. An electron sitting there can't emit a photon because if it did, well, if, if the photon goes away and carries energy, where did the energy come from? Because the electron's still there. So there's no way an electron just sitting there can emit a photon. It violates energy conservation. But this is the quantum one. If you measure a system for just a little while, then you don't know the energy of that system exactly. And that means you can violate energy conservation. As long as it disappears in a time frame so short, you can't measure that violation. So if you emit this photon, it violates energy conservation. But as long as that photon disappears in a time scale so short, you can't measure it, Okay, it's, it's just like embezzlement. <laughs> it, it's literally right. You take the money out of the bank, you do whatever you want with it, as long as you get it back in in the morning before anyone can see it, then you're fine. So we think of so the way to think of, of electromagnetism is the electromag the electron emits this photon, which you call a virtual photon, because you can't see it. If you could see it, you'd know there was energy violated. So it's there, but it's not there. Okay, you can't see it. It's a virtual photon. That virtual photon then gets absorbed by another electron before you can measure it, causing that other electron to be repelled. Great. That's the quantum theory of electromagnetism. But there's one other important aspect, and that is this photon has zero mass. Now, that's important because electromagnetism is a long-range force. An electron here will repel an electron in Alpha Centauri or at the other end of the universe. Electric magnetism works across the universe. And that's only possible in the quantum world because the photon is massless. Why? Well, because the photon is massless, E equals mc squared, and that means the photon can carry an arbitrarily small amount of energy. If it can carry an arbitrarily small amount of energy, then, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it can exist for a really long time before you would measure the violation of energy conservation. So it can travel from here all the way to Alpha Centauri and be absorbed by an electron there. So in the modern way of thinking, the reason electromagnetism is a long-range force is identical to the fact that the photon is massive. Now you know the whole theory. Okay, that's it. And it is the best theory in science. There's no theory that's better. 
With this theory, we can try, and that's the reason I won the Nobel Prize, but with this theory, we can calculate things from first principles and compare them with observations to 14 decimal places. And there's nowhere else in science you can do that. Nowhere. So this is as good as it gets. Okay? So everyone's thrilled. The world is understandable, and it's all going well, except nature, of course, throws in a little screw. And that is that the neutron is radioactive. Now, that should upset many of you. Um, I remember it upset me when I first learned about it in high school, but it should upset you because you're made up of neutrons. Most of the particles in your body are neutrons. There are more neutrons than protons. The atomic nuclei of the atoms in your body are made of protons and neutrons, but most, many of the heavy atoms have more neutrons than they have protons. So they're the dominant particle in your body. But they're radioactive. If I took a neutron and held it out here, it would last 10 minutes. Okay? Boom. Now, some of you will notice painfully that you were listening to that music go over and over and over again for more than, for more than 10 minutes. And, and you were hoping that your neutrons would decay just so you wouldn't have to hear it again. But, but, uh, but what gives? How come you're here? How come you're still here if your neutrons last 10 minutes? A remarkable accident of our existence. So let me draw a picture. So this is neutron decay. A neutron decays into three particles. A proton, and this is just a fancy way of writing an electron, and a neutrino. Now, the important thing is, and the remarkable accident is, that a neutron and a proton weigh almost exactly the same amount. A neutron is just a little bit heavier than a proton. One part in a thousand heavier than a proton. It, that means, it turns out, the neutron has just its mass is just barely enough to be greater than the mass of the proton plus the electron plus the neutrino. If it wasn't, it could decay into them. So it can barely do that. That's why this lasts 10 minutes. 10 minutes may sound short, but in the particle physics world, that's a really long time. And that's why we call this a weak, weak decay. It's a weak interaction because it takes a long time to happen. But it's only weak in that sense because these masses are very close. So why are we here? Well, I now drop a neutron in the nucleus, and it gets bound. What does it mean to be bound? Some of you know. But what it really means is it takes energy to get unbound, right? If, I, if, I, if we're bound to the Earth here by gravity, if I jump down off the stage, it takes energy to get back up, and it takes more energy to get higher up. So you lose energy when you get bound. So the, the neutron, when it falls in a nucleus, loses energy. But E equals mc squared. So when it loses energy, it loses mass. And it would, when it loses ma mass, because the mass difference is so close, when it's inside the nucleus, it no longer has enough mass to decay into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. So it's just that accident of nature that the neutron and proton mass is so small that when you drop it in a nucleus, it can't decay. And that's why you're here. And so the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the materials that make you up, none of that would exist if neutrons decayed. But they're here and you're here just because of this remarkable accident. Okay, well, that's great. But that means this, this is an important thing. And maybe this decay is interesting. It also is the same process that powers the sun. So it's also the other reason you're here. Because all of life on Earth is possible only because of the process, nuclear process that we've run. So we want to understand this. But the big thing is that this means there has to be a new force in nature. Because electromagnetism can't cause this decay. And gravity can't. So there suddenly had to be a new force in nature. And if there's a new force, we need to understand it. And the first person to write down a theory to understand it is one of my favorite physicists in the 20th century also, Enrico Fermi. Uh, Enrico Fermi um, was a brilliant Italian physicist who was the last one who was equally adept at theory and experiment in particle physics and nuclear physics. Now, both of those fields have become so complicated, there's so much baggage that you, people do one or the other. I'm a theorist, and other people are experimental. He could do both. And he, in fact, was assigned during the Manhattan Project to create the first nuclear reactor, the first stable chain reaction, so that they could make an unstable chain reaction, a bomb. And so he built the reactor in the University of Chicago, actually, during the war. It was underneath the football field, which is brilliant, I always thought, because then, if anything went wrong, you just kill football players. There's no law. <laughs> So it's, it's, uh, so it's good. But, uh, but Fermi, Fermi, before that, had written down the first theory of how this might work. And he sent the minute to, to the journal Nature. And it got rejected. 
which is great because it gives people like me solace when we get rejected by nature too. And uh, but Fermi didn't take it very well. And he said, "That's it. I'm not doing theory anymore." And he went on and did experiment, which was good for him because the next experiment he did won him the Nobel Prize in physics, so it worked for him. But nevertheless, his theory then was taken up by others. And they tried to make a theory of this new force. Now, the really important thing to know about physics, there's a few things I want to tell you, but one of them is that physics is like Hollywood. If it works, you copy it. And you keep copying it until it doesn't work, like Halloween 23. It's just, you know. It, and so physics is a thing. So if you got a good thing, let's, let's copy it. So we have the best theory in nature. The very best theory we have, quantum electrodynamics. doesn't get better than this. So if you want to make a force look like this, you want to make it look like this. So let's make that decay look like this. So we draw a diagram, a final diagram, try and make it look the same. It's a little more complicated. The neutron decays into a proton, it's made of these particles called quarks, but it looks like that. And then the electron neutrino come out of this at the end. And we can think of a particle being exchanged in that process, mediating that force, the same way as the proton mediates the electromagnetic force. But this force is very different than this force. This force is long range. This force is short range. It only works inside the nucleus. This one, you can measure easily. We do it all the time. This one is very weak. Okay. Well, but if this one's short range and this one's long range, how can they look the same? Well, if I give this particle, this new hypothetical particle, a mass, then maybe I can explain it. Because if this particle is very, very massive, then let's think what that implies. When I emit it, it's very massive and E equals mc squared. That means when I emit it, it carries a lot of energy. That means it massively violates energy conservation, and that means it can't live very long. It can only travel a very short distance before it has to disappear. So if I have a massive particle mediating this force, then the force becomes very short range. It, it's great. And I can explain the weak interaction working only over the nucleus and this working over the whole universe. Sounds great. The problem is this is a beautiful theory. This one's nonsense. It's nonsense because when you do the calculations for this, for this we're assuming this is a massive particle, here you get predictions that agree with experiments at 14 decimal places. Here you get infinity. And it's infinite answers. And physicists don't like getting infinite answers because we can't do anything with them. Math mathematicians love them, but physicists hate them. And this was a problem that physicists confronted in the 1960s. And it's amazing to me that this was such a severe problem that the physicists actually were willing to give up this beautiful theory, that this beautiful idea of quantum mechanics and relativity that it led to this on the atomic scale and said maybe on the nuclear scale we have to throw out all of conventional ideas. Maybe none of it works. Because this is such a severe problem that they've given up. And, and one of the things that makes this story great is first, <laughs> Trump is but secondly, um, one of the things that makes the story great is that it shows human foibles. A real other secret about science is that scientists are human. And that means that scientists have biases and prejudices and they're pig-headed and they, and, they, and they can go off in the wrong direction. But the science, the process of science overcomes that personal bias of the scientist and drags them in the right direction. And in the story, when I was writing it, maybe if you read it, those of you read the book, I wanted to just shake these guys in the 1960s and say, don't give up the theory, because the right answer is right here. You have it. It's right here. But they couldn't see it, because they were so fixated on things, and it took a while before the physics, the experiments eventually forced them in that direction. And the thing they couldn't see was physics from another area of science, superconductivity. In 1911, the Dutch physicist Cameron Onnes discovered something remarkable. If he took mercury and cooled it down to four degrees above absolute zero, then something really amazing happened. The electrical resistance would drop to zero. It wouldn't just become small. It would drop to zero. Now, that may not seem amazing, but, let's, but it is. If I take a, a wire of mercury, and I cool it down, I can make a wire out of it, and I attach a battery to it so I get a current flowing in that wire, and then I cool it to below four degrees, I take the battery away, the current continues to flow. And it doesn't flow for just an hour, or a day, or a year. It flows forever. It never, ever stops. It'll flow for all eternity. And that just seems impossible. It seems magical and, and 
Justice Chamberlain called it super conductivity. He had a flair for words. He could have been an ad writer. But, but it was really an amazing phenomenon. It took 50 years for physicists to understand this from the complicated interactions of electrons in these media of superconductors to, for that to understand that. And what's this got to do with anything? Well, now we can make superconductors that aren't just at 4 degrees, but actually are superconducting at dry ice temperatures. And then we can do neat experiments in high school physics classes. So here's one the high school physics teachers like to do now, I think. We take a block of dry ice and we have a superconductor in it, of the material that's superconducting at that temperature. And then you put a magnet up on it and it floats. The magnet will float above the superconductor. Why is that? Well, it turns out magnetic fields cannot permeate the superconductor. They try and get into the superconductor and they die off very quickly at its surface. The same would be true for an electric charge, by the way, it would float as well, because electric fields can't permeate the surface of the superconductor. Great, it's a nice little experiment to do. What that means, by the way, is the magnetic field lines get repelled and it floats. It causes the thing to levitate. What's this got to do with anything? Well, now I want you to ask yourself, what would it be like if you lived in that superconductor? What would the world look like to you? Well, if you lived in that superconductor, you develop physics and, and you say, What's electromagnetism? And you say electromagnetism is a short range force because you put a magnetic field in that superconductor and it dies off. You put an electric field in that superconductor and it dies off. So you find electromagnetism is a short range force. And then when you discovered quantum mechanics and tried to make a theory of electromagnetism, a quantum theory, you say, well, the particle that mediates that force is massive. And in fact, it's true. When you put photons, when you put light in a superconductor, light gets massive. The photon is massive inside of the superconductor. Massive tells us. Now this is the key that they didn't see, but now in hindsight it kind of becomes clear. We can imagine solving that problem that we had, and I like to liken it to swimming. So, so when you're swimming in a swimming pool, you zoom along. But let's say I filled the swimming pool with molasses. Well, you wouldn't want to swim. But if, you, if I force you, and you try to swim, it'd be a lot harder to swim. You'd experience a lot more resistance because of the background. So now let's imagine that everywhere in the universe, there's an invisible field everywhere throughout all of space. And some particles, as they're traveling along, interact with that field and experience a resistance. And they may be massless to begin with, but when that field is there, they experience a resistance and it slows them down and they act like they have mass. So now, in that case, if that's true, we can draw a picture similar to the one I drew before, but I turn sideways now. Here's electromagnetism, the exchange of a photon, this is, between two particles. And here are those other, here's that other interaction. It turns out there are three particles in the weak force. doesn't really matter. But this is sort of decaying and producing electrons and neutrinos. And here's the particle that's conveyed. And now they look very similar. Because now I can imagine, let's imagine that these W particles are not massive. But they're massless. But they interact with this background field everywhere in nature, and they behave as if they're massive. And then, when we look, try and look at the force that they convey, that force is short range. But now everything can be solved, because if these are massless at some fundamental level, then when we actually do the mathematical calculation of this force, it's identical to the mathematical calculation of what happens with that force. And instead of getting infinity, we get numbers we can, that agree with experiments, and we can calculate the arbitrary precision, 14 decimal places if you want. Everything works out. But not even better than that, if the mathematics looks the same, maybe they are the same. Maybe all these are basically represent exactly the same force. And maybe electromagnetism, which seems so different than the weak force, is not so different. At a fundamental scale, they're identical, something we now call the electroweak force and two fundamental forces in nature that seem so different on our scale are really the same thing. And we live in a cosmic superconductor. That's remarkable. It would be the greatest unification of the 20th century. But at this point, it's still religious. Okay? Think of what I just said. There's an invisible field everywhere in nature <laughs> you can't see. And it would be religion, but it's not, it's physics. So, in physics, if there's an invisible field, you can't just talk about it and pray to it. Okay? 
you got to find it. So how, if there's an invisible field, how can you find it? Very simple. Cosmic sadomasochism. You spank the vacuum. You spank it hard. Really hard. What do I mean by that? Well, in the quantum universe, for every field, there's a associated with a particle. The electromagnetic field has a photon. So if there's this invisible field everywhere in space, if I dump enough energy into a single point, then maybe I can seek out real particles. So let me call that field the Higgs field. Then maybe I can seek out real particles called the Higgs particles. So where can I, how can I build something to dump enough energy into a single point? I've built the com- most complicated machine humans have ever built, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Now, if you go to Geneva, and you won't be able to see it in this, but, that, but there, there's Lake Geneva's over here and the airport's over here. And if you get out of the airport, which I did recently in Geneva, you look out and you see beautiful farmland, but 100 meters under that farmland is a tunnel that's 26 kilometers around. And we take photons and we accelerate them around here to 99.999998% of the speed of light going in that direction. Then we take protons and we accelerate them to 99.999998% of the speed of light in that direction. And then we try and collide them together at a few places in these rings. These protons are going around thousands of times every second. Here's the French Swiss border. They cross that border thousands of times every second without passports or anything. Mr. Trump learns that, we'll be in trouble. But, but we, so we built this thing and we tried to do these collisions. And then there's a, there's a holiday that's an anachronistic holiday in the United States, July 4th, which means nothing cosmically. But it does now. Because on July 4th, 2012, the Large Hadron Collider reported 50 events, 50 discovery of 50 new particles that walked like Higgses and quacked like Higgses and looked like they were Higgses. And then in the intervening five years, every experiment that's been performed, these particles have exactly the properties of Higgs particles. So what we have discovered is that there really is an invisible field everywhere in nature that affects the properties that determines the universe that we live in. And that these two different forces really are the same. And this story, to me, is a not only a great story, but it's, the reason it's a great story is it represents what's best about humanity. This represents humanity as best because we were willing to go into the unknown, to go in a direction we didn't want to go in, where nature dragged us, be willing to speculate and be wrong, and then be willing to build the most complicated machine humans have ever built just to test this idea. Just to test the idea, how do we get here? Not to make a better car or a coaster. And, and this, is, it, this is important because often when I talk about science, this kind of science, people say, well, what, you know, what good is this? Does it make a better car? Does it, does it you know, is it going to do something? And, and it's one of the sort of unfortunate things, but at the same time it's fortunate, that science creates technology. So we wouldn't be here if it weren't for that, and most of us wouldn't be alive if it weren't for that technology. But, it, it, but science isn't just technology. And the really important thing about science, to me, is the same thing that's so important about art and music and literature. It's nice to give this in a music hall. Because all those things at their best change our perspective of our place in the cosmos. Reading a good play, a book, a novel, listening to music, all forces us to think about ourselves differently. And that's exactly what science does. Science is a cultural activity. Just like those things. And to me, that's the real importance of science, is that it represents what's best about being human. Because those aspects, that's what makes humans worth being human, is discovering new things about the world and being surprised and enjoying it. And in this case, we didn't just discuss those things, but we were willing to build this most complicated machine. And in that sense, the Large Hadron Collider is just like the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century. Gothic cathedrals are beautiful. And they were built over centuries by thousands of artisans from many different countries, all working together in that case for the, the glory of God. But, and they used this most complex technology at the time. It took a long so many of these cathedrals fell down because people didn't know how to build these roofs right until they figured it out. Now, the Large Hadron Collider was built by 10,000 physicists. 
from over a hundred different countries speaking dozens of different languages, many different religions, all working together just to answer this question, just to do this, spending their lives. Working together in, in, in that with those religions and cultures and languages don't get in the way because science brings people together. Religion brings people apart. But science brings people together to do something like this, to, to find out about ourselves. And, and you know, when you go there, this isn't, this isn't the collider itself. This is just one detector. It's a large detector. There's a smaller detector called the compact muon solenoid. There's some people here. It's not very compact. There's an equal amount. In this detector alone, there's as much uh, iron as there is in the Eiffel Tower. And, and you really feel like Gulliver when you're there because everything is a big scale. You really can't sense unless you're there. But I do have a picture that's better because I'm in it. But uh, uh, it, it is just immense to visit. And if you get a chance to do that when you see the chance, you should. But the, the Large Hadron Collider is amazing in every, in every sense. You can't have enough hyperbole. I know there's a whole chapter in my book about it. For example, every second at the Large Hadron Collider, enough da data is generated to fill more than 1,001 terabyte hard drives. That's more than the information in all the world's libraries. Every second, more information is being generated than in all the world's libraries, all the books that humans have ever written. And we have to amass and understand that data. And then there's the tunnel itself, 26 kilometers around, superconducting magnets. But moreover, the tunnel has to be evacuated, so the vacuum in the tunnel is sparser than the vacuum outside the International Space Station. It's just, it's just amazing that we've been able to do this. And as amazing as that is, the best part about it is we're not done. The best part of the title is the greatest story ever told so far. Because unlike that other great, greatest story ever told, which I learned this weekend, it can also be called the Goat Herder's Guide to the Universe. Um, <laughs> I love that. That story hasn't changed. It's just as boring and wrong now as it was then. But this story changes every day. It'll be better tomorrow than it is today. Because there are young people, and there may be young people in this audience who tomorrow they'll discover things that change the story. And it gets better. And I kind of like it. It's a, I love art, and I love impressionist art. It's my favorite kind of art. And I love it for a lot of reasons. But one of them is that far away, it, lo it, looks, it looks great. But you get close up, and it really looks crappy. Okay? <laughs> and that's science, okay? Because we now have developed this theory, this standard model of physics, that explains every experiment we can see, that it unified these forces that on the surface seem so different. But every time we make new discoveries, we raise new questions. Sure, we, have, we now know that there's an invisible heat field. We live in this cosmic superconductor, unbeknownst to us. But why do we? Why did the heat field freeze in the early universe in a certain way so that the W particles get mass and the photons don't? Why did that happen? Why did it happen at the scale it did? We don't know. That's why we're continuing to run the Large Hadron Collider. And we'll do so for the next 20 years, looking for the possible answer to that. And if we do, it'll raise more questions. The story continues, and it gets better, and it gets better not because we, our minds, come up with this. I mean, it's amazing that we were right about the Higgs field. I, I personally bet that we weren't worse. I actually had three papers in my desk that I wrote, waiting for them not to discover the Higgs field. Because I was going to explain that, and nature, you know, this decided, which just seems a little slimy to me to have this Higgs field everywhere, but it, well, it is. And, and I was wrong, and that's fine. It's a good thing to be. We don't know where we'll go next, not because of the human imagination, but the imagination of nature, which is greater. But the, but the key thing that science has done, and as I said, is change our perspective of our place in the universe. And really, the fact that there's a Higgs field has told us that we are really a cosmic accident in a way that, to turn back to my picture before, is identical. For these people, that direction was very, very special. For us, the world seems like it's designed for us. We are able to survive this world because electromagnetism is long range, the weak interaction, powers of the sun. It all seems to be there for us. But at a fundamental scale, it's not like that at all. At a fundamental scale, the universe is inconsistent with our existence. It's only because this field froze in a certain direction, at least some mathematical space, and if it froze in a different direction, then, the, then electromagnetism wouldn't be long range and we wouldn't be here. Now, these people, there may be these physicists here, might. They discover, ultimately, you know what? This direction isn't so special. It's an accident. And, and you can have bicycles that point in any direction. And say they discover that at 4 in the morning. And then, and then at 6 in the morning, the sun rises. And it all melts. 
Well, that could be our universe. Because it turns out we've measured the Higgs field, and given what we can do, that field is tantalizingly close to melting. And if it does, then everything we see in the universe goes away. Every particle that has mass is massless. All the massive objects in the, uh, in the universe, from people to planets to stars to galaxies to aliens to everything, disappear like that. And that could happen. Now, don't get scared. Because, first of all, it's probably stable. We don't know for sure. But even if it isn't, if you do the math, that it won't decay in, in a year or a hundred years or a million years or a billion years or a billion billion years or a billion 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 years. It's gonna, it's always gonna, it's a, keep your drawing in. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it could happen. And, and the universe could return to that beautiful mathematical state, but not very exciting for it to live in. That's a good one. And that's okay too, because that's another misconception people have about the universe and nature, is that somehow it's evolved in some way and we're the pinnacle of the universe and it's going to be this way forever. It's not. This too shall pass. And, and everything we see could disappear. And the future, for us, could be completely miserable. But it isn't it amazing that we have discovered it before it's melted. Now, this idea that this, that this universe we see, which seems so beautifully designed for us, is not designed for us, is not new. It goes back in science, of, in, in a lot of ways, especially to biology. This design, issue of design, is something I want to spend a few minutes on, because it'll, it'll segue nicely, I think, into, into the discussion that, that Matt and I will have next. We look for design, we humans. We see beautiful things, and they're designed. These, these Christmas ornaments are designed, clearly intelligent. But of course, they're not Christmas ornaments. They're snowflakes. You just take polar molecules, and you freeze them, and, and crystals form, and you form these beautiful patterns. No design. So you say, okay, well, that's different, but, but I can tell human things are designed. I can take architecture. Take Buckminster Fuller Dome. Okay, I remember when I was growing up, everyone had a Buckminster Fuller Dome in the backyard. The cathedral, they, they did new things in the Buckminster Fuller Dome and, and, um, and all that. And that's right, it's great. But now take soot. In, when, in soot, there's a molecule carbon 60, Buckminster Fullerene. It's naturally occurring. And nothing could be less designed than soot. Okay? And so we have to be very careful when we look for design. And this, is, this has been a problem for science for a long time. And of course it is for cosmology now. But the person who first demonstrated that that problem could be resolved without design was, in my opinion, one of the greatest scientists who ever lived, Charles Darwin. I, I put him above Einstein. Charles Darwin discovered that, in fact, the apparent design of life, that, that, that life appeared to be designed so beautifully for the Earth, was an accident. And in what I think is one of the most beautiful paragraphs in any book about science ever written is the last paragraph of The Origin of Species. It says, There is grandeur in this view of life, which is several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, the most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. It's a beautiful statement. It was true for biology. Natural selection produces this incredible diversity of life on Earth that seems so designed. But it's true for, for physics. The incredible diversity of structures we see from people to galaxies that have all evolved, evolved from a simple beginning. So simple, in fact, they couldn't have been there at the beginning. In this case, if there hadn't have been this accident of nature of this field freezing in certain directions. And that's, so this, this, this idea that uh, the apparent design of the universe is an illusion is really important, and science has, science has uncovered it, and it really has discovered that the universe we see is an illusion. But scientists are also myopic, and it's worthwhile realizing science is a product of its times as well. And in 1863, in the letter to Joseph Hooker, Darwin said, it's mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. I get paid to think of the origin of matter. It was a ridiculous, it was rubbish to think about it in 1863, but it's not now. That's because the story's gotten better. And there are questions that seem like rubbish now. I get told all the time, science is never going to explain love or whatever you want to explain. And, and how do we know? We don't know until we try. And what may seem absolutely unfathomable today, a hundred years from now, will seem obvious. 
only if we continue to do it, though. And that's my concern that I want to sort of end with, because I'm particularly concerned about the present time, obviously in the United States and other countries. But this cultural pursuit of which science is a part is essential, but it's unvalued by government. And for example, in the United States, in the current budget that has been proposed, the, the science that is always is about particle physics is part of a field that's going to be cut by 20%. But that's the, the department that funds that is called the Department of Energy, that funds energy, energy research. But, but it also is the, dump, the chief funding source for all physical science in the country. All the science that's going to produce the eco economics 50 years from now being cut. But it's worse. The National Endowment for the Arts being cut to zero. The National Endowment for Humanity cut to zero. Corporation for Public Broadcasting cut to zero. Institute of, of Libraries and Museums cut to zero. All of that. You add that up, it's $1.82 billion that's being saved in this reported budget. At the same time, there's a line item, $2 billion, the first installment on a wall with Mexico. So to save us from these imaginary hordes at one border, <laughs> we're willing to give up all the things that really matter, the things that really make America great. The things that will make America great are not the walls we create, but the ideas that change the way we think about ourselves, the cultural ideas we present. And the best discussion, the best comeback to that I've ever known was, was from this guy, Robert Wilson, who was director of the first big accelerator in the United States, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, the largest one in the world before, before one in Geneva. And in the 1960s, he was asked by Congress, will it aid in the defense of the nation? And here is what he said. No, sir, I don't believe so. It has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? I mean, all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending our country, except to make it worth defending. And that's the point. These are the things that make us human. These are the things that make life worth living. And if we give them up, the future the greatest story ever told will end. The future is not going to be better than the present. And so, I'll end with two quotes. The one I begin my book with, which is a, which is a quote from Virgil, uh, the beginning of Dynamic, which I learned in Latin because I grew up in Canada and I was educated. Um, <laughs> these, yeah, you can, you can read the these are the tears of things and the stuff of our mortality cuts us to the heart. One, but the next line, which I had not remembered, a friend of mine reminded me of later, which I end the book with, is more interesting. Release your fears. And that's what we have to do. We have to fight the fear that's being generated by politicians and others, the fear that science will destroy faith, the fear of the unknown, the fear of aliens, not up there, but around us. We have to realize that the universe is terrifying and wonderful, and we should go into it with our eyes open, wherever it takes us. Because that's the human journey that's worth continuing. And wherever it takes us, even if the future is miserable, we should enjoy that journey. And we should enjoy our moment in the sun. Thank you very much. How you doing? Good. It's nice to have you up here, man. I'm thrilled to be up here. I'm always amazed. I'm just, I have to say, I'm just always amazed when the intermission's over and someone's still here, so it's pretty nice. <laughs> so I, this is actually the second time I've seen this portion of the talk. Yeah. And I, I like the fact, I understand a little bit more about it now than I did yesterday. Good. And I understood a little bit more yesterday than I did before that. Uh, but one of the things is that it always reminds me, as I learn more and understand more, I also learned that there's a whole lot more that I don't know. And if this keeps up until I die, I will eventually <laughs> realize that I pretty much know nothing, even though I know something, and that's really frustrating. Uh, because I've improved. My, my understanding's improved, and yet somehow got worse. But that's great. That's called learning. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's, yeah, the less, you know, the more you, you know, that's the difference between you and Donald Trump. Okay. 
that's the difference. No, well, there's at least one. There's one. There's one. I was trying to think of them. No, there's a, but that's at least one because it's because he doesn't know that he doesn't know, and that's the scariest thing. It is. I, I called in the Dunning Kruger president. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. It's very much that. For those of you who don't know, look it up. You'll like, love it. Uh, I kind of wanted to start with uh, talking about the first shrimp we ever met, because in hindsight, for me, it was probably a little more obnoxious for him than it was for me. We were. It was Imagine Religion Two conference in Kamloops, British Columbia, and our flights were supposed to arrive at about the same time, and so they had a limo there waiting. <laughs> And then my flight just kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And they made him sit in the airport waiting for this guy who he doesn't know who he's supposed to share a limo with that he doesn't get. And I, I, someday you'll have to tell me exactly what's going through your mind. But I finally show up. We get in the car. And so now you have one of the world's eminent scientists and a guy who's probably better versed in philosophy than certainly physics. And what did I do? I'd like to ask you some questions about this idea about a universe from nothing, <laughs> yeah. which I'm sure you've never heard before yeah, never, by some yeah. jackass that doesn't know what he's talking about. And luckily, it didn't make him hate me, and so here we are. Yeah, no, I, but waiting for you hate me, me hate you. <laughs> oh no! When when uh, when they when I finally did show up uh, and we got in the car. I was sure that he was going to hate me for the rest of our lives. Yeah, just for the, you know, for the I think I'd flown from Australia, so I was a little tired. And, 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 <laughs> but I used to do that a lot. So. so I thought we'd actually start with that. Tell us about a universe of nothing in uh, 20 seconds. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Fix us all. Well, um, well, I'll tell you. It's it, there. I'll, I'll tell you one thing that is interesting, at least maybe one thing that. In the, when I wrote A Universe from Nothing, there were speculations I made about the universe that, based on what we thought we knew, that are now much more firmly grounded, which is really neat. And the Higgs discovery of the Higgs field, which occurred after that book was written, is an example. Because the fact that empty space can have this field everywhere in it, it demonstrates that empty space is much more interesting than you'd imagine otherwise. And in fact, that kind of field is intimately related to the kind of field that, that explains the, the very beginning of the universe. So, the, the supposition that there could be any kind of field in empty space was something we thought might be the case, but we didn't know at that time. So it's nice to know that, that the book is even more right than it was. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's less speculative, let, let's put it that way. And, and the other thing that's probably, because I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm going to be a politician, I'm going to avoid the answer to your specific question, because I'm not going to talk about a universe from nothing a lot, because uh, that would take a lecture, except to say that the universe can come from nothing without any supernatural shenanigans, and that's amazing, and we should love that fact that science has shown us that you don't need God to make a universe, and that's amazing. But one of the other things that was in the book, which which, which is some things that I've done with debates with some people that you, you I know you'd like to debate or would, li would like to debate. I honestly what, don't care if I'm uh, Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, he is beneath you, well beneath you. Um, that... They say, a number of theologians often say that we, we created the multiverse because, you know, we don't like God, but it's, it really is just an excuse for God. And I always say the difference is the multiverse is well-motivated. But um, God isn't. But, uh, and the, God, oh, the multiverse might explain something, and God doesn't. But it, but it still sounded metaphysical. But what's really kind of neat is in the interim, because of another great discovery, which I've talked about in other lectures at various times, the discovery of gravitational waves. Uh, that we just made, gives us a hope of discovering gravitational waves from the Big Bang itself, which would allow us to look back in time, back to a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, really see the very beginning of the universe, and test our ideas and basically be able to indirectly test to see if there are other universes. At the same level as we indirectly knew atoms existed well before we could ever see them. We can basically test all the ideas that make 55 predictions and, and, and test them. And the 56th prediction is, if all these things are true, there must be other universes. And so we, it's really, for me, it's amazing because we'll take this really metaphysical idea and, and, and make it physics. And, I, and that's all happened in the last five years. The, the story gets better. And I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit Good. Uh, from the standpoint of lay people. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> There's this perception from people who don't understand this stuff that what a number of physicists are doing is magic or BS. For example, when you talk about 
the quotes on it, is being yeah. asked that it's roughly the same as embezzlement. Yeah. And when you talk about the universe for nothing and you talk about quantum fluctuations, mm -hmm. as soon as you put something there, it's not the same nothing that like philosophers yeah. have talked about, even though in some sense it may well be. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, as you know, philosophers got mad at me because, and still are, oh, yeah, uh, right. because I, I made a joke about them in that book where I said that, you know, I talked about this and I said philosophers and theologians would get, would, you know, would, would get mad because they're experts at nothing. But, uh, <laughs> and see, you know, I, have I just thought it was a good excuse for joke. Because, uh, when it comes to philosophy and science, I go both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not touching. There's, there's this. Well, I, I don't want to skip ahead to the question no, I wanted to do no. after this. But on, on this idea, when there is something so incredibly foreign to the people who haven't bothered to sure. study that it almost sounds indistinguishable from, from the, the magical metaphysical stuff that... Yeah, and you know, about. I think Arthur C. Clarke said that once, that a sufficiently advanced civilization would, everything they do would seem like magic. Be careful, because now you're putting yourself in an impressively advanced civilization and me not in that civilization, what, what, so... No, but, you know, and, it, and one of the things that, that I didn't talk about here, although you've heard me talk about it, and it's in the book, is this notion from Plato that, that I taught, begin the book with, that, that Plato imagined us being in a cave that looked at this wall can only see the shadows of reality. I'm not going to go into the whole thing here. Right. But he did say that if you were dragged out and saw the light and saw the real world and tried to come back and explain it, people would think you're crazy. And it is a fundamental problem that the realm of the universe that, that, that I deal with on a, in my research, at least on a daily basis, is so far removed from human experience as to seem unintelligible and also impenetrable. And I think that's one of the reasons I try... Well, that's one of the reasons I write books, but that's one of the reasons I told this story. And it's a longer story than my, my publishers wanted me to tell. Because I think if you can show how we did it in baby steps, to get, you know, start with the, the things we measure, electricity and magnetism, and show by a series of steps how we get so far, then it seems less like magic. Because it was really human activity with a lot of little baby steps, which is what the other thing that science is normally not portrayed to be. It's all these scientific revolutions, but it's not. It's little baby steps done by individuals, often wrong, and 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 you can you can get imperceptibly from here to there. It's like you, you and I were just with Richard this week, Richard Dawkins this weekend, and and it's like as he often says about about evolution, you know, there there's speciation, species change, but every every animal is the same species as its parent, but but by imperceptible changes, you go you go from one species to another, but at every instant. It, it, you don't see the change, but eventually you make such a change that that, a, that, a, that one species is unrecognizable to the other. At least they don't want to have sex with it anymore. Uh, so <laughs> let me see if I can actually uh, sit the bow up. Sure. Someone Are objected to some, yeah. <laughs> Someone's objecting to interspecies sex. I think. So, okay. I'm fine with it if you can actually find a way to get consensus. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. uh, so let me see if I can put a bow on this because while I, I frequently said I don't claim to have any expertise in anything, and if I'm good at anything, it's taking complex ideas and distilling them down so everybody can understand, because that's what I have to do for me to understand it. There are things that you say mm -hmm. that I do not believe, not because I am convinced you're wrong, but because I don't understand them sufficiently to say that I believe them. Well, here's your first problem. You should never use the word believe. Ah, but no, so never use the word believe. Oh, no, 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 no. So at least a scientist should never use the word believe because things are either likely or unlikely. And that's it. We don't believe anything. I certainly don't believe anything. Are you convinced that something's likely? No, I have to be convinced that something's likely by right. the evidence. By belief, I be belief is the state of being convinced that something is likely. Well, if you want to call that, but I think, and, but the, and I think you're right in a general sense, but I have a problem with using words that have a lot of emotional baggage associated with them. Me too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I'm okay with belief because I think we can make a good case for using it, that there's a distinction between I am convinced this is the case, which is a fine okay. way to say you don't have to say belief. But if you're consistent about using the word okay. belief... I'll yeah, buy that. I, I just think it's fine. As I long as another as debate. I'm yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, actually, I was going to point out it's okay as long as scientists don't use the word. Yeah. I mean, I you know, heathens, you. like you, you can, no, I mean, I mean. <laughs> philosophy heathens. Like yeah, philosophy heathens. heathens. No, but I think it's important. And scientists can use the word in a popular context, but never in the context of science. Uh, and it's taken me a long time. I still sometimes do it, you know. Uh, but, but it's really important that we point out the belief, at least in science, 
that religious sense of belief, the faith in things unseen and unmeasured, is is not really there. Now, even that, of course, is not 100% true, because if you're a theoretical physicist or an experimental physicist working 25 years on an idea, you have some faith that it might be true, or you wouldn't be able to spend it. But hold on. But, but there's a fundamental difference in that sense that the faith is eminently shakable. That's the great thing about science, is because the minute you have that idea and you've worked on it for 20 years and you find out it's not true, you just throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. You don't hang on to it and cut heads off or anything like that. So, faith is a word that I actually don't use. Ah, excellent. Well, I don't either, but I wanted to point out that, that in some sense you need to have some, you, you can call it intuition. Oh, but, I can go, I, okay. Yeah. So, faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason, you just give a good reason. Well, yeah, but the problem, and, yeah. and okay. so, what, what, we is, rationalize our reasons. So reason is a slave of passion. And so, we all rationalize things we do. And we say, boy, you know, we have a good reason for doing that. And then afterwards, we realize we're wrong. Oh, yeah, I, I and, absolutely and, agree. And, and, and so, but, the, but what I mean is, even in science, we do that. I don't want to pretend that science isn't a human activity. That's why I said it. So some of those scientists were driven by their, the passion the in the wrong way. direction. So what he is trying to do is pretend that we all have faith. Scientists have faith, and they have faith. Because what they're saying is we are convinced of things in the absence of absolute certainty, and that's what they want faith yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah. The problem is the things they are convinced of in the absence of absolute certainty, they have no good reason for. And the things that scientists are convinced of in the absence of absolute certainty, they have very good reasons to. And so what I instead, I say I don't have faith in anything. I have reasonable confidence in things based on previous experience and evidence. So I, in the same way that Likely you know, or unlikely? Right? Yes. I don't use the faith word. Yes. I fight against it. I'm okay with the belief word as long as we define it specifically as I'm convinced of something. Okay, so that's a great semantic discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call it a tie. <laughs> but that, that leads to another question. I'm constantly asked from skeptics and people who are concerned about how to do critical thinking and skepticism, I can't possibly have the time to become an expert in everything, which experts do I trust, which journals do I trust, all these other things. And for me, a lot of it comes down to the fundamentals of education. How do you think we can go about, best go about, the people in this room and outside of it, begin to fix the fear of scientific education, the, the lack of respect for it, getting people to recognize that the fact that scientific findings change as we learn more is a good thing and not a bad thing. Yes, yes. How, how do we... Start working towards fixing that. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 there's a lot we need to do. And what first we can do, the way we fix it, is by not teaching science badly. Uh, and I mean by that that I, that that I think science certainly is taught incorrectly, at least it was when I, I, I was going to school, and I think still too much. In the same sense that all, I think all of our schools are, are outdated in the way we teach things. We teach things as if the information that a teacher is telling you matters. And it doesn't. You know, you get, you, get, you get the information, more information from this. What you need is the process, but you get more interesting misinformation. Okay? And you need the process to distinguish between the two. And what you do is you take, the reason people are afraid of science is because, first of all, it's called like, you know, Einstein saith, you know, and it's just like the Bible. But instead, we need to teach it as a process of discovery. Instead of teaching facts, we ask questions. And everyone loves the process of discovery. So teachers say, you know, let, how, how, how does this work? Let's figure it out. It becomes a puzzle-solving process. It becomes something that everyone naturally enjoys. And we see that the scientific enterprise is not a set of facts, but it's a process for deriving facts. And it's that process that matters, not the facts. And then once you, have, once you learn that process, there are no alternative facts anymore. Because, because the process is there. And I think... I think uh, that's really an essential part, and you need to have people be comfortable enough to teach that process, and part of that means it, being able to say, I don't know, which is, we, I know we talked well, about there's, there's this fear of I don't know. How many people were in school and you were terrified of being called to the blackboard or given an answer yeah. because you don't know? And one of the things I think we need to change is, is getting rid of that fear in children of the I don't know answer, because quite often it's, it's the correct one. And we should applaud that and encourage this spirit of discovery and acknowledgement that I don't have an answer. And, and you know who's more afraid than children of the I don't know? Teachers and parents. Mm -hmm. 
Because how many parents, when your kid asks you a question, you, you'll want to give an answer. You know, I like that Calvin, I'm off the same word, follow me, give a crazy answer. But, but uh, I, 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 it's fun to do sometimes. But now, uh, to someone else's kids. But, um, uh, but, but uh, uh, it's re- I think most, a teacher, when a student asks a question, doesn't want to say, you know, I don't know. But that's the best thing a teacher can say. And then follow it up with, hey, let's figure out maybe how we can find the answer together. And it'll be a process of joint discovery. And parents, again, I don't know. Be, be, be comfortable with saying, I don't know, because you don't. And that's a one, and not knowing is one of the, one of the most exciting things about being human because it means there's something left to learn. And I, I have often said that, it, that as a theoretical physicist, um, the two most exciting states to be in are either wrong or confused. Because, <laughs> really, because that means there's something, that there's something interesting going on. This is especially intriguing for me because I mean, we've interacted a few mm-hmm. times with Brian. I haven't spent as much time together as we have in the last day or so. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I'm, I know that he doesn't have time to watch all of Probably any of my stuff. And when I'm on, no. You say when I'm on it, but I've no idea what's going on. The same is true in reverse. But pe- I don't have kids, but people will call into the atheist experience and say, "Oh, what should I do about kids and my friendship and everything else?" And I, what I encourage them to do is, when your kids ask you something you don't know, say, "I don't know, but let's go find out." Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. Encourage that spirit of discovery. To kind of leverage something in your talk, when I said before that you know I, I don't believe you or I'm not convinced because I don't have I don't have the sufficient understanding. I liken that to the fact that uh, Maxwell's work was required to give Einstein the tools, mm-hmm. to give Feynman the tools. Mm-hmm. And if somebody had to try to go back to Maxwell with this idea, the things that you're talking about, it would have been indistinguishable from religion from, from, almost. From religion, probably, or certainly from magic. Yeah, magic. Um, which I know you do, and I've seen you do very well. Um, but uh, he's a good magician, I mean, we just did some card tricks for him this morning. I'm sure we could just forget this and you could come out with some magic. <laughs> But, um, if somebody wants to see something but it works both ways. I think it's really important to realize how there's that building process. That that uh, you know I, that no knowledge has ever come from revelation. Not one iota of knowledge about it in human history has ever come from revelation. Einstein didn't have revelations. Einstein, you know, required the results of Faraday and Maxwell and then other experiments. And it, it, it always happens. There's no there's no one. If you locked physicists in a room. For 50 years, and, and asked them to come up with the theory of the universe, what they kept come up with would be totally would be first of all far more boring than the real universe, but most certainly wrong. And it, it, because revelation doesn't reveal anything. Now you can re- reflection reveals things. You can take knowledge, reflect upon it, maybe get wisdom, but or something like it, or get insights about yourself. But just thinking, pure thought, just sitting there and going on. Oh, does not yield revelation. And sorry, Sam and Harris and other, and other Buddhists, but anyway. <laughs> Here's another area where we echoed each other, and some of you have heard me say this, and I heard you say something very similar yesterday, and that's, uh, that's this idea that people who claim that they've got a revelation from God, or let's say they didn't even get a direct revelation from God, but they think that their holy book revealed something. It provides no substance until it's verified. Which means, even if there was a God who was revealing things to you, you would have no way of knowing. It doesn't become knowledge. It doesn't become accurate until you actually put it to the test. So, uh, and this is where I'm in agreement with what Gary Coyne said yesterday, which is science may, in fact, be the only way of knowing. Oh, it's, I get rid of the may. I, uh, uh, I, I'm slightly more nuanced than hedging my but I think, I think it is accurate that it is. Well, and by science, and it's really important to point out what science, and Gary and I have the same definition of science, which is, for me, science is just empirical investigation combined with reason. That's science. Basic, investigating things based on testing, empirical evidence, retesting, and using logical analysis to, to analyze those results. That's science. So, so for me, science is very broad. And, and for some people, that might encompass other areas. But that's the process by which we learn, we learn things about the universe, which I, which I call knowing. And, and, it's a, and even this learning about yourself is still doing that same thing, right? You're, you're still asking questions and testing when you try and learn about yourself. You're not just closing your eyes. You're asking, well, you know, why did I do that yesterday? Am I really, do I really crave that kind of attention all the time? And, <laughs> and anyway, yeah. I haven't got a to the, we were joking earlier because uh, yesterday at the Imagine Revolution 7 conference, uh, we decided we didn't want to 
do anything repeat. I was up directly before him, so I did an ad intro instead, and there were a number of issues and comments, and now I've completely forgotten where I was going with that story. It's good, though. I was enjoying it. If you want, like, a 50-cent refund for that, talk to Lauren. So I've heard you say before, or I think I've heard you say before, in response to questions that are posed, particularly some that fall into the realm of philosophy, that you find some of them uninteresting. Well, look, you know, I always get a... Look, philosophy is useful. Philosophy is not... Philosophy is useful. Philosophy is reflection. Critical... It's questioning, reflecting, and it's reflecting on knowledge, usually, and then coming up with good questions. So philosophy is useful in those areas of human activity where the questions aren't yet well-defined, because philosophy provides us a good tool to come up with good questions. And therefore, there's... My friend Dan Dennett is a philosopher who deals with the brain, and the brain consciousness is an area where, really, we don't understand anything very much. The proof... Well, you can tell how much we understand in a scientific field by how many books are written about it. If there are a lot of books, that means we don't understand much. And, um... Because, you know, you only need one book on quantum mechanics, and that's it. But, um... But, but, uh... But anyway, so in brain science, there's a lot of questions, and you can actually drive forward research in neuroscience and psychology with philosophical questions. And that was true when natural philosophy was natural philosophy and physics. But physics has gotten to the point where the real questions aren't asked by philosophers because it's so much down the road that the real questions require an intimate knowledge of the physics to be able to ask the kind of right questions. And philosophers of physics, of which there are some, and I know I'll get in trouble if I do this one day, they ask the interesting questions themselves, but it has no impact on the physics. Zero. Because most physicists can't spell philosophy. Okay? And I have to say, in certain areas of the philosophy of science, it has very little impact on the other philosophers. It's a field where they talk to each other. Now, they do interesting... They're very interesting sets of reasoning and thinking, but I can tell you as a fact that there's nothing that's come out of the philosophy of science in the last... certainly since I've been a physicist that's impacted on physicists. And that... You know, and that... That's not a... That's not a judgment. That's not a value judgment. It's just a fact. The physicists don't read the philosophical literature. And... I don't read it. How do you know nothing's come out? No, no, no. I'm not saying... By coming out of it, I mean... I mean influencing... By what I mean by that is influencing the work that's being done. And, and, and even my, my learning, what I know about philosophy of science, of course I read Kuhn and other people, but, but more, I learned much more about the philosophy of science by my mentors who are scientists, from Feynman and other people. I learned much more about the way science is done, how questioning is done, and the kind of questions that might be fruitful. I've learned by the people, by the scientists who taught me, not by, by the philosophers. And, and, you know, if we start to merge this, we can get to things like Karl Popper and the idea yeah. of falsification. But that doesn't exist without him, in the same way that Einstein doesn't exist without Maxwell. Yeah, no, look, look, there's a... Look, I don't want... And that's the point. There's a rich human intellectual history, and, and, and it's all part of the wonderful uh, tapestry of being human, and that's what I was saying earlier. So I don't think that, that philosophy is un, un, interesting to read. I, I read... I read you know, I read the Bible too. I mean, it's all part of. It's all part of. No, and I don't want to put them in the same sense that way. But I mean, <laughs> but, but but you know, it's true that science has grown out of philosophy, but science has also grown out of religion. And so, some people just mean to say, "Well, how can? How dare you talk the way you were?" Because the early scientists were all religious. Newton was religious, and and and, and the first thing is that well, that's because. The church was the National Science Foundation in the 16th century. I mean, you could there's no universities except church-supported universities, so it's not too surprising there was that religious connection. But more importantly, big deal. Yeah. I mean, children grow up, so science grew out of out of religion and to some extent philosophy, but it's grown up. And sadly, children cast aside the things their parents taught taught them and, or made them think about, and they become adults. And so. It's absolutely true that science owes religion, in some sense, uh, a debt, a historical debt, but it's an ancient one, and we just just throw, you know, it's just buried there. This isn't the path that I, I intended to take. Good, but I, but I, I love it. it. Yeah, good. Uh, That's when it's best. I remember a call to the show one time where I said something, and, and 
somebody asked, well, Isaac Newton believes in God. Do you think you're smarter than Isaac Newton? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of God and perhaps alchemy, I now know more about the we, we know a lot more than we, have, we know a lot more than Newton, absolutely. I am smarter because of Newton. Yeah. That doesn't mean I'm more brilliant or more insightful or I'm likely to change the world in the way he did, but colloquially speaking, yeah, I'm smarter than Newton on God. What, what kind of statement would it be about the world if we hadn't gotten any smarter yeah. in the intervening years? And Newton, by the way, and I talk about Newton in the book, but Newton was crazy. So was, he, would, he would not, he would be hospitalized now. There's no doubt about it. He was really a crazy man. But he also was a basically full-time, not just alchemist, he spent much more time on the Bible than he did on physics. I mean, he, he was convinced that there were secret messages in the Bible that only he understood. He was really a full-time theologian and a, and a part-time physicist, and I've often said if he spent more time as a physicist, he might have made a name for himself. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'm somebody who actually does, I'm a huge fan of Dan Dennett, hopefully I'll be on stage with him one day, because we communicated by email, oh, specifically yeah. about this free will issue, which I'm not going to go into. Yeah. Uh, there was a big... I You're free not to. I was the lone compatibilist at INR5 standing up having an argument against... Uh, Chris DiCarlo and Jerry Coyne and Richard Dawkins. I'm like, oh, how does that happen? How weird is my life that I end up defending that? Uh, but I, I do find some of the questions um, interesting. I had Dennis talk about intuition pumps, and everybody loves various thought experiments. Uh, I was talking to actually my friend Lee the other day about the problem with the ship of Theseus and how it relates to identity. You know, how many parts on the ship can be changed before it's different? The Star Trek transporters, which my wife, when we go to the happy hour, if the I, if the concept of identity comes up, she knows there's going to be a discussion about whether or not you step in a transporter, are you committing suicide? <laughs> this is why we, she doesn't go to happy hour with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a conversation, I kid you not, that came up week after week. It's like the only thing that geeky atheists want to talk about. <laughs> so I can understand why people are like, Where did you first start thinking about that? What's that? When did you first think about the Star Trek transporter? Um, so, <laughs> no, it's all right. My friend gave me this book called <laughs> Physics of Star Trek. <laughs> and uh, I had no I, I knew nothing about the author. I would have never imagined reading the book that he'd be sitting up here with me today. Um, but throughout some, some philosophical discussions, I find it interesting because primarily when I, when I do philosophy, I'm a I'm more focused on the thought experiments, the, th the things that make people think. I love to make people think. I love to confound expectations. It's one of the reasons why I love doing magic. It's one of the reasons I do things like this. I mean, we agree on a lot. We're not going to agree on everything. If I talked to people who I agree with on everything, I would never learn anything. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be able to learn that they're wrong or how I can understand that they're wrong without engaging. Now, I'm not in it by any stretch saying that you should spend your time engaging with people who you think are wrong over and over and over again, because I like my show and I don't want to even say the secret. <laughs> you get to decide what conversations you, you want to have and how you have them. And the advice that I gave yesterday, uh, briefly, was listen charitably, as charitably as possible. That doesn't mean you should be a doormat mm -hmm. for people to walk on. Um, try not to pretend like you can read minds, like you can tell what their motivation is. Oh, you're only saying this because, in the same way that if somebody tells you, oh, you're an atheist because you, you were mad at God. No, I'm not. I wasn't any more mad at God than I was at Voldemort. <laughs> so don't pretend like you can read motivation. Ask lots of questions. And the one thing is, you don't owe anybody an explanation or an argument. And so if people are pushing at you and you're no longer comfortable with it, you get to stop it. And you also get to say something that I love to say, which is, that's an interesting point. Let me think about it and get back to you. And then think about it and get back to them because you need to do what you're saying to them. Yeah. Yeah. For me, philosophy is primarily about my, my fundamental love of philosophy comes from issues surrounding epistemology. How do we know what we know? How do we, what, are, what are the foundations of logical reasoning and, and what can we learn from those? The, the most recent video I put up, I don't know how many people are familiar, I do the Atheist Debates Patreon Project, which I post in my debates, reviews in my debates. I talk about the argument for the existence of God. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I try, to, I try to go into things in pretty good detail. So it's not just, here's the teleological arguments in short form. 
Now, for example, the video on Pascal's wager is like 35 minutes long, and I go into great detail to talk about what Pascal actually said and how modern theists and Christians get it wrong. And the, one of the most recent videos that I posted uh, in the last week, I think, uh, it's called the, the Beautiful and Ugly Truth, in quotes, about logical syllogisms. Because we get so focused on this idea of truth, which within philosophy there's a disagreement about whether we have access to truth at all, when really, if you have a syllogism that's constructed in such a way that it's valid, we know that two premises lead to, to a true conclusion. But the truth is irrelevant in, the, in, in, the, in argumentation. If you are convinced that the premises are true and you reject the conclusion, you are by definition irrational, even if they weren't true, because you're now in conflict with yourself and you're in conflict with reason. Trying to establish a reasonable world is in part about internal consistency, so your worldview doesn't fall apart. But the goal, which is why I ended up on a teacher, and I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible, is for my internal model of the world to match the external model as best it can. And I think science is the only way of knowing that you have that model. And philosophy is the background tools that allows us to make use of science and reason about it such that we can confirm the reliability of what we're finding from science. Yeah, I mean, it's one way. I think that's, but I, I mean, and then, you know, scientists are doing philosophy, which I keep getting reminded about, it's fine. But that's what scientists are doing. They're confirming the reliability. They're using the tools of philosophy, if you wish, as practicing scientists, because they're continuing to, to do that. To, and, and the point is, which I wrote about in one of my books, but it, it's, it's that there is no such thing as scientific truth. Right. It, 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 science is an approximation of reality, and it's always an approximation, and it describes the, all of scientific theories, even quantum electrodynamics, that greatest theory we have, only works over a certain region. And so we have to realize that, that whenever we're saying things, we are, we are, we, we don't capture the whole truth, and that's fine. And it's and, and what we progress is a little bit at a time. And as Feynman said, you know, maybe the universe is like an onion. You know, you peel back. There's may, there, there might never be a theory of everything. In fact, I'm quite skeptical of that. That's okay because we'll learn a little bit more tomorrow than we did today, and we'll be a little less falsehood on your T-shirt and a little more things that are not false, which is what really science could tell. Not that it's true, we but just that it's not false. And, and, and I do, I want to, when you were talking, I wanted to comment about one thing, because I really like your, the three ways of sort of discussing that you described. And, and what I want to relate to people who may not know this is, is they were epitomized by one of my favorite people who's passed away, Christopher Hitchens, who was a friend of mine. And, 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 yeah, he's he a great boss, to be honest. But what people don't realize, because Christopher seemed like a bulldog on stage, was that, and he was, um, is that he was one of the most tolerant people of listening to others uh, in life that I, I know. I mean, he would regular have, regularly have dinner parties with people that I would have a hard time being in the same room with. I mean, you know, Scalia was a regular, a regular guest of Christopher's at his house. And you can you imagine? Could you have a, in any way? And, and, but he would love to, he loved to be able to be, you know, be, not have an echo chamber, be able to talk to people about things that, that, and, and he and I had many debates about Iraq, for example, where we, we disagreed. It's one, of, one, of, one of the few things that I disagree with him about, that and the wisdom of drinking scotch while debating, but he was far, far better at it than I was. I want to tell you, um, can I say this? Yeah, I can. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to give the, when he had his memorial service, so they asked, his wife asked me to give the, the speech, and, and, and then there was a lot of other minor figures like Salman Rushdie and Tom Stoppard and, <laughs> and Sean Penn. And, and now um, I'm going to talk about you like yeah, 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 no, no. Anyway, so I was, I, I turned to Salman Rushdie who was sitting next to me and I said, we were going to let this program and say, who the hell is Lord Scrubs? But anyway, but, but what's interesting is that the old, the, my favorite speech was by another friend of mine who, who I just was with in England, Stephen Fry, who's wonderful. You know, Stephen Fry. And, and, yeah, he's great. <laughs> but Stephen said what he disagreed with. <laughs> Who's Christopher about? He said, Christopher once wrote that there are the four most overrated things in the world, and I, I think I have them right, were, were picnics, <laughs> champagne, strawberries, and anal sex. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what Stephen said is, I, I agree with him about three of those. <laughs> anyway. So, we want to make sure we get to your questions, which is always the thing that's 
most interesting for you, usually? Always, always, usually? Always, usually. I need to stop that. Is that a philosophical question? Exact question. Watch your ass up with the microphone. Is there microphones? Yeah. There's a microphone at the end of each aisle. If we can have the house lights up a little so we can see people's faces. Um, I, well, I'm not even going to add anything. I don't want to take any time out of your questions. We'll, we'll sum up at the end, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Oh, you need to actually like get right up next to the mic. I think. It's a tone. Oh, I hear it. I hear it here anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, waves. So we can see waves at different scales: sound waves, mm -hmm. uh, water waves, electromagnetic waves, uh -huh. gravitational waves. Um, <clears throat> to what extent is that just a superficial? Are they superficially analogous, or is this some? Is this a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a really good question. Waves are, are natural because, um, in physics, because the, really what I said about copying really works. The great thing about physics is very few ideas are needed to describe many different things. And basically, every time you have what's called a restoring force, so things are in equilibrium, like that. Um, happily, that was restored. But, but uh, uh, every time you have a restoring force, so the situation is such that when you depart from it, there's something that wants to bring it back. We produce oscillations. And, and those oscillations, so the same equation, which is called the wave equation, works ubiquitously throughout the, world, the universe for many different phenomena. You, you pluck space a little bit in general relativity, which means I wave my hands, because my, my hands bend space. So when I move them around, I'm bending space in a disturbing way. It creates a ripple that is like a pond, like a ripple on a pond. And so, and similarly, I shake an electric charge, and I, and I, and I, and that changing, that changing magnetic field creates a disturbance that ripples out. And it's the same, the wave equation is ubiquitous simply because in nature there's a restoring force, basically. So that's why it applies over so many different neat ranges of human activity. Good. That was a good question. Good. Yeah. I have a question about uh, ethics and science. Um, Lawrence, you talked about yeah. How the scientific method mitigates against scientists' own prejudices and biases. Yeah. But how does it work with you know guys who who, who love the physics so much that they created the the atom bomb? Um, oh. How do how do we how does science uh, sort yeah. itself out when it comes to you know just because we can do something should we and, and how does the scientific method deal with, you know, un unethical science things like animals, or like treatment of animals, or creation yeah. of terrible things? I'll, I'll start, and you probably have some uh, comments as well from, from a, maybe a slightly different perspective. But the, the, the science, what determines what should be done in some sense, scientists will pursue it three questions. And the, but, but, Every, everything we do as humans can have good and bad consequences. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve Pinker, uh, another friend of mine, said, uh, said very beautifully, I think, you know, people always say, oh yeah, people, scientists are going to be an atom bomb. Um, but of course, atomic energy is incredibly also useful. Um, and and we, have, we can have nuclear reactors which don't produce carbon in the atmosphere uh, if they're designed correctly and don't, and don't do bad things, um, which they can be. Uh, but, but they don't point out that that's true about everything. Architects can create beautiful buildings, but they can design gas chambers. Um, and so what, ne what we need to do is realize that, that those are societal questions that society has to decide at some level, but only an informed society, only people who are informed of the issues <coughs> and the perspective of science can then make a judgment. But, it, but scientists should not be ultimately making the decisions about how society uses the products of science. In a democracy, that should be people and our elected representatives, but those people and elected representatives need to have some scientific literacy at some level to make sensible decisions. But I don't think, but the, sci you know, but the scientists are gonna discover principles that can produce wonderful things and awful things. And it's just the way it is, and it's the way it's always gonna be. And to, and to, and to put your head in the sand and not think in advance about the awful possible things that can happen. Be it, take CRISPR technology, which is an amazing technology that's used now to manipulate DNA in a way that would have been impossible 10 years ago, which, is, which could do wonderful things for solving, curing diseases. 
but it also makes hacking incredibly easy. And it makes the possibility of creating smallpox viruses, for example, in simple laboratories, possible. And so it, we need to recognize those, those, we need to, as Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. So I think we need, scientists owe it to the public to explain what's happening and the possible implications of what might happen. And it's up to, in, in my opinion, the public to decide then how to create institutions and encourage the scientists to create institutions that help ensure that the, 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 the products that come out of science have the best possible effect for humanity. But, but to pretend that these things aren't going to happen just because we don't like them, um, or pretend that they don't exist because we don't like them. As a Catholic church, I mean, to bring it back to them, in vitro fertilization, which you know was condemned because the, 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 the babies that would come out wouldn't have a soul. Right? And so they came out and they were the same as everyone else, and then that, that stopped. But all those things are going to happen. Cloning people is going to happen, in my opinion, at some point. These things are going to happen because they're possible, but it's the scientific community. The, where scientific ethics comes in is honesty, and full disclosure, transparency, non-authoritarianism. Those are the ethics of science. That's what makes good science. So when, when scientists are unethical, it's, it's we're violating one of those things. But if they're if they're honestly doing work, they're disclosing it, they're communicating with others, and, and, they're, and they're willing to not <coughs> censor information, then at some level, that's, that's healthy science, and ultimately it's society that's got to decide, decide what, which areas of science to fund and not. I don't know if you want to add to that. I, I'm largely in agreement with this. Maybe it's a slightly different way of phrasing the same thing, because they don't put the foundation of morality on societal opinion. But I do think that we... We evaluate the consequences of our actions. And you're not even the person to ask yet. I'm going to look at you. I know. <laughs> we evaluate the consequences of our actions with respect to some goal. You can't know what the consequences of some scientific discoveries are going to be. And so when you talk about ethics in science and scientific uh, investigation, and there are two things to consider. Is the process demonstrably immoral? Are we chopping up people left and right in order to understand things better? We already know that that's wrong. So if there's no demonstration that the fundamentals of the process are immoral, we won't, the, the next thing is to evaluate the consequences of what we discover. And you can't really know what the consequences are until you actually discover it. We could clone a person tomorrow, and we could find out that this is a really big deal, and we, we develop a better understanding of what is or isn't immoral about it, and stop it. Or we can clone somebody tomorrow and find out that the things that we were afraid of aren't real. I don't know that there, if, as long as the process isn't immoral, I don't know that you could possibly say that any sort of discovery of a truth about the universe is itself immoral or so dangerous. You have to be able to, to fund that discovery to know what the danger is going to be. Yeah, I think, and, and, I, and that's why, I mean, that's why one of the reasons I'm happy I'm a physicist, and my lovely mother, who's in the audience, wanted me to be a doctor. Um, and and uh, she got over it eventually, but it took a long time. Um, but, but, uh, um, but happily, there are, I and mean, when it comes to biology, there are many more immediate, more sort of ethical or moral questions. And the obvious ones, experimentation on human patients is universally uh, agreed to be, you know, immoral. You know, and but the good deal about that's why I love what I do as a scientist is what I do has no practical significance whatsoever. <laughs> This won't be nearly as deep. This is going back to high school of physics. Good. It was getting a little deep. Bugged in for 30 years now. Oh. Why is the universe right handed? With torque? It's actually left handed. Is it left handed? Why is the universe left handed? When you apply <laughs> torque in an XY plane force in the third oh, direction. Oh, oh, well, that's when you oh, apply oh, that part. Field oh. in an electric oh. field that goes. Um, plane, oh, plane. oh, I see. Oh, okay. I, you have to ask a different question I thought you were asking. Oh, that's just. An, that's just Semantics. No, 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 no. I mean, because we we have what's called the left-handed rule, right-handed rule in right. electromagnetism. The magnetic field goes around here, and you, uh, the electron, uh, you know, the current goes like this, the magnetic field goes like that. Why is it that way? That's just because we I'm define it to be that way. If we change the sign of the charge, it'd be that way. So we just, it's just an well, arbitrary... Why is it particular at all? If it's X, oh. why is it in that... Why is it... What 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 kicks it out the other that's, that is just the way it works. 
I mean, no, that's for sure. That's, that's funny. That, 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 the fact that, that, that a magnetic, that, 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 a, that a magnetic field causes a force on a moving electron that's perpendicular to its motion is an amazing discovery. An Actually, amazing discovery. It's, it's because of the Higgs field that we won't yeah. be able to know that and prove me right for another time. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, but what I, but I thought the question you're asking, which is even deeper. So, so that is just, that's just convention. If you're on Mars, and you call the electron positive instead of negative, they'd be using the left-handed rule instead of the right-handed rule. So that's just convention of naming. There's nothing fundamental about it. It's just the way we define directions. It's just words. But more significant is the fact that there are particles of nature, like the neutrino, that spin. And we call them left-handed if they're moving and they're spinning that way. And we call them right-handed if they're moving and they're spinning that way. Well, it turns out in nature, they're only left-handed neutrinos. Yeah, and, the answer, I mean. and, you know the, and you know the answer to that? <laughs> and, and that's what I'm asking. I know. I wanted to know the answer to that because we share that. Because no one knows. And that's the exciting thing. We don't have the slightest idea why neutrinos are only left handed. We think we've got a lot of ideas of why, and it may be related to why the universe is made of matter, not antimatter. But, it, but, but we don't know yet, and we're going to try and find out. So it's budget for 30 years, and nobody else knows either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you can go. Okay, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. On behalf of everyone in this room. Oh, thank you. Uh, I guess couched in my question is an assumption you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Bob Duco is a Christian apologist out of Detroit. He is like, you know, sort of like, oh gosh, I sat down with those you know, most brilliant people like Lawrence Krauss, Dr. Krauss, is that true? Number one. Number two, uh, Matt, did you, I know Aaron has had a discussion with um, that apologist. Uh, would you do the same? Uh, the first oh. question, have, have you, in fact, sat down with Bob Duco or no, I generally chat with him. He, and, he and knows we, all he, the time that he has chat, chat with you in the brilliant minds and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, he's chatted with me, but he's never chatted with me directly, and he won't. Um, because uh, I don't, I, and it'd be interesting because we have different views about that. Because, well, Matt is, fulfills an important role, but I don't, I generally, I have debated, as in fact in Toronto, I recently was snookered into a debate with an idiot from the Discovery Institute a year ago. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, um, but I generally don't do it because I don't, first of all, I find debates to be, formal debates to be rhetorical devices, not devices for education. So generally, I don't like, I, I'll do dialogues, I'll do discussions. But most often, there are people who want to appear on stage. It's the same reason I won't debate UFO uh, apologists on stage. Because they want to be on stage, so, because then it gives them validity. It makes it seem like I take them seriously. And more importantly, you know, it, it, the audience assumes that two people are honest and they both sound reasonable, and therefore it's he said, she said, or whatever. And what it does is it gives the illusion of equality when it doesn't, that's why I won't ever debate evolution versus intelligent design, because it makes it sound like there's a debate to be had. There's no debate to be had. I mean, there's no debate. So I have no idea who you're talking about, because despite what people think, I don't follow every apologist on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if he's not a, he's not a free official apologist, like your best friend Ty. Well, he's off to a good start. <laughs> uh, not a really good start, but a, a, a better start than some people have made. Um, we're, we're not far apart in our view of the beast, yes. but, but we're a little bit. Um, well, Aaron Ross was interviewed, and they had an hour conversation. I'm surprised you, maybe you should, it was very interesting. I'll ask Aaron. Yeah, yeah, um, it, it, it was. On, on the debate thing, though, I'm largely happy to debate almost anybody. There are exceptions. There are people I've debated before who I won't debate again. Uh, mostly because they, some of them are terrible people, not because they're, they're terrible debaters. <laughs> also, there are, are people who, who I don't like the idea of, of, of peers, but if you get somebody who doesn't know anything, yeah. now all of a sudden in a debate, I have to backpedal so that it looks like I'm not being a dick. <laughs> and I don't 
prosecuted debates, I understand why he would do debates with primarily rhetorical devices, and I've talked about debate as primarily theater. Yeah. Because it's not necessarily that's the best argument. It's about presentation. It's about making the connection. Sure. It's one of the reasons why, and I don't think I'm telling tales, and if I am, Richard, you'll tell me. If you want to do a debate in a Baptist church, you don't want Richard Dawkins. You want me. Because I have credibility with those people that he doesn't. Yes. In the same way that if you were talking science, you don't want me. You want Lawrence or Richard. I'm trying to fundamentally change the way debates are done, and I'm having some success at it. Because people are there. He who shall not be named. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Is a skilled debater, probably one of the best debaters Christianity has. But he's formulaic, predictable, and he wants only PhDs to debate. Because, and I'm sorry to all those people who are credentialed. I'm not just picking on you because I'm not. You can be overly educated in something, but you forget the basics. And so there's a strategy to the debate where you get up and you say, in order for my opponent to win, they must do this, this, and this. It is the collegiate score debating format, and I couldn't give a rat's ass about that format because I want to have the conversation. And if you get people to break out of that format, where you have dialogues, where you have discussions, where you have debates that instead of 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, that are like joint press conferences, instead you say, here's my position, here's my position, now let's go at it. That's a discussion. In cross-examination. Yeah. Those are the debates that I want to have. Because guess what? A lot of those guys who are debating are basically thinking from a script. And I get to push back on that script and expose, are they just, it's like Ted Bruckenkamp just parroting what Greg Bonson said. Does he actually understand it at all? So I get to ask the questions that confound them. You know, when I was on a radio station in Minneapolis-St. Paul, they invited me back because they wanted me to debate Ray Cumford. Good friend, Ray. I said, yes. Yeah, sure. He's a nice guy. He's a real nice guy. I really like him. Saluted, but really nice guy. Las Vegas. Las Vegas. I saw him at Kevin. We all saw him. Washington, where I was with him. Yeah, with Washington, D.C. But he showed up and he wouldn't debate. And he basically just said, I'm not interested in demonstrating the existence of God. I'm just here because I love Matt and I don't want him to go to hell. Yeah. Now, one of my biggest pet peeves is when somebody wastes my time. I get to waste as much of my damn time as I want. Nobody else gets to waste any of it. And so people who knew this said, oh, did you feel like this was a complete waste of your time? No. Because I was on drive time Christian radio. Yeah. Christian parents driving their little Christian kids around. And they heard an atheist give all the good reasons why they shouldn't be believing what they believe. And their representative said, oh, I don't want to defend God. I just don't want Matt to go to hell. That was definitely not a waste of my time. The radio station was completely irritated that Ray pulled this little bait and switch on debates. Now, I'll never debate him again because he doesn't want to debate. I don't know about that apologist. That was way long ago. But, you know, I think it's also useful that you, I mean, there are a lot, thousand different points of light. Seriously? Yeah. Seriously. No, I'm saying that to Travis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Did you say you were done? We have time for one more question. Okay. Then I won't say what you're saying. Is that all we have? Two more questions is what we have. Okay. Let's be quick. And as a reminder, and I apologize because I didn't know. Why is that? Okay. We're going to wrap up. Maybe the theaters will be here. You're selling books afterwards, right? Well, I'm not selling them, but I'm signing them. You're signing books. We'll be out there. We can visit. I'll stand outside if you want. And by the way, yeah, I should say that because until they kick us out of the theater, out of the front, if we don't answer your questions here, and when I'm signing, I'll stay here until the last person has a question. So, I mean, it's up to you. Have fun. We can come back sometime. Oh, yeah. As long as they don't have to pay again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So, my question is a little bit off of this topic, but it's kind of, it kind of relates to some of the videos that you have on YouTube, Matt. I saw one debate that you had about whether or not humans have souls or not, and I think that you very much won that debate. The only question that I kind of have regarding that would be about near-death experiences, in particular out-of-body experiences, where someone is supposed to be considered like flatlined, their brain dead, their brain is not supposed to be working, yet they report being able to see things after they're on them, and even in other rooms they're able to report conversations and things like that. And researchers have been kind of trying to say that this demonstrates that a soul exists. Yeah, they're wrong. They're wrong. And I can explain why 30 quickly so we can get around.
get on to the next question. When is it that they report yeah. this experience? It's after they've been revived. Now, so you've got a brain that's trying to make sense of what happened when it was not functioning. And you're also adding emphasis to the idea that a malfunctioning brain is going to give you more accurate information than a functioning one. <laughs> and when we put it to the test, for example, you could put a sheet of paper that you could only see from hovering way above the operating table, uh, and they've done these tests, nobody reports what's on the paper. It's, the, the idea of a soul is the single most dead concept in all of theology. And I'm gonna do, I'll do a video in part that goes into this in, in more detail. Uh, but everything we know that, about what contributed to soul is an identifiable, malleable part of the brain yeah. to the point where even split brain patients, uh, Vyas Ramachandran, look him up, he does a great talk yeah. several years ago about split brain patients when they severed the corpus callosum, and you end up with two distinct personalities that communicate independently. One of them's a theist, one of them's an atheist. Go figure that out, soul lad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the physiology of seeing a tunnel, like in, in all these things, as the brain is shutting down, the idea that the, that, that the field of vision gets narrower and narrower. Everything that, that's been discussed is just, yeah. And, 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 and meanwhile, the, the, the just religious people religion that they see tends to coincide with what the religion is. Yeah. And so if there's no. different religions seeing this, they can't all be correct. They can't all be incorrect. Well, you know, and Carl Sagan said this in a beautiful book, which is famous before he died, the uh, candle, what was it, Science of the Candle in the Dark. Mm -hmm. um, he said, you know, it's interesting that people report now seeing angels. And, you know, in the 16th century, they saw fairies. And in the 15th century, and it's interesting that it's always the thing, or aliens. I mean, it's always the thing it's that you can't see. Yeah, because we, because somehow when people see these things, they're exactly what that culture is defined to see, but it's never constant. Anyway, we should, we should go next. Go back to the beginning of the century, and what people described as aliens was very different. And suddenly, around 2001, they all become the almond eyes. And yeah. The, the, the stories get more similar. And so it's more about who we are and how we're influenced than it does about anything in some supernatural way. Yeah, yes, Feynman said it's more likely due to the known irrationality of humans than the unknown rationality of aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you get the last question. Yeah, which is got to be a great question. Um, right. No, no question. <laughs> um, you should remember, we talked briefly about interesting and uninteresting yeah, questions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if it isn't, maybe we'll go to the third. Okay, so... Um, uh, professor Krauss, uh, yeah. sorry, Matt, I rarely have an astrophysicist in my disposal. I can call you next Sunday if I have anything yeah. to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's something that I've always wondered about, and it has to do with the death of the universe. Uh -huh. um, I kind of get it, but I'm totally not a scientist, so I really don't. Um, okay. Does matter ever stop existing because the stuff that makes it up loses its energy? Do electrons deorbit? Does everything fall apart till there's nothing? Because I read the universe from nothing, and I'm wondering if we'll ever get back to that. Well, to where there's a new universe. Well, I, no, I talked about that in that book, but but uh, uh, let me see. Well, clearly not clearly enough. But um, um, <laughs> I apologize. No, no, it's it's, it's 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 a subtle and difficult concept. But um, so the point is that that as far as we know, electrons don't decay. Okay. Um, protons, we think, may decay, although they've decayed in such a long time that, that you keep regarding them, as I said. But, 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 um, but it turns out that there is a process that, that takes matter that we think and turns it into radiation, and it's black holes. And so eventually, it's quite likely that most of the matter in the universe will fall into black holes in the center of galaxies. And what is really weird, for reasons that is really strange, is black holes radiate. Stephen Hawking, that's what made him famous. And, and I mean, the, theoretically, they radiate. We don't know for sure because we've never seen one. Okay, but if when they do, whatever fell in, it becomes irrelevant. If, you know, two Volkswagens or one Cadillac, it doesn't matter. Um, what comes out is exactly the same, and it's radiation. And so, in that that in that way, that sort of processes everything and 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 turns it into radiation. And so, the ultimate state of a universe in which matters all the matters collapse in black holes will ultimately be universe of just pure radiation. But the really neat thing is that it doesn't have to always be that way. Because if the universe is eternal, since, as I de demonstrated, nothing is unstable. And what I mean is, is that nothing is unstable. <laughs> if, if you wait long enough, you'll produce stuff again. And so in, the, in an eternal universe, you'll have quantum fluctuations that will eventually produce a lot of stuff again. And so, um, so in that sense, 
what, everything that was there will have disappeared, but other stuff's going to reappear. And, and so, you know, if that makes you feel better, great. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Well, we live in a random corner in the far edge of the Milky Way galaxy. Fermi's paradox is that, well, look, if life evolved, it would basically colonize the galaxy, and you could calculate it would send out robots or, or parts of its civilization to four other planets that would then send to four and, other planets. And, and if you Everything would grow exponentially. It's not a bad logic, but I don't think it's inevitable. We are electric man. We are about to get in our hands the tools that may help us prove for once and for all that we're not alone. And, and I'm talking specifically about the James Webb Space Telescope and the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope. My point is that the next generation of telescopes, both optical and radio, will, I think, show us a very crowded cosmos. Uh, I, I wrote a piece saying, whatever they are, they're not aliens. I think, is that ours is likely to be the generation that will make that profound, game-changing discovery that it's not just us. Lawrence and Nick are going to have about a 60-minute discussion up here, maybe shorter, and we're going to open it up. We want to make this kind of like a group conversation tonight. We have a mic here for uh, uh, Q&A. And we hope you guys partake in, in it. And um, feel free to get up, even if you don't have the exact idea of your question formed. It's OK to get up and stumble a little bit. That's what Pangburn's all about. If you want to learn more about Pangburn and get involved, we are a global online community that is grounded in the laws of good faith, helpful discourse. Good faith meaning sincerity of intentions, so being sincere, and helpfulness, um, giving each other a helping hand, whether it's through the dialectic or in other ways. So you can uh, join us on our Discord server if you want to engage in our daily conversations. Just search Pangburn Discord, and we talk about things like this every day. And uh, please do join us on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash pangburn, and you can view all of the events that we've produced, live discussions. And hello to everyone on YouTube, by the way, because we are live streaming this event. Without further ado, please welcome to the stage Lawrence Krauss and Nick Pope. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for pra braving the weather. <laughs> And also Google Maps, figuring out how to get in this building, <laughs> which I had trouble with. Um, I'm just going to start off a little bit, because I've, I've done some events with Travis before. And um, for the, I'm, a, I'm a theoretical physicist who does not study UFOs um, for, for good reason, uh, I'll try and argue. Um, 
but there's a lot of interest in the, in the media lately. And I, long ago, before Travis was born, I used to debate people who call themselves UFOologists or something. And I just, they, you know, they, they made their living with that. And, and I quickly learned, obviously, that they made their living with that and, they, and the discussions were not particularly worthwhile. Um, so I, I didn't do it again. And then when Travis asked me to do this, and, and he said it was with Nick, and I, I learned a little about Nick, I thought, okay, well, this can be a rational discussion. So, so um, I, I still hope to disabuse him and you of any false ideas you have. But, <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to begin by reading one of my favorite quotes about this. One of the reasons, so what, I think the title is What's Going On Up There? And my apologies to at least the two people I could see from the side is that whatever's going up, uh, on up there, it's not aliens. I want to make that clear, okay? Now that sounds closed-minded. So I wanted to start with a, just a quote from one of my heroes, Richard Feynman, who talked about this, and some of you may have seen Richard quote this. But he also makes some useful things about science, which is really important. He said, it's not unscientific to make a guess, although many people who are not in science think, to, think it is. Some years ago, I had a conversation with a layman about flying saucers, because I'm scientific, I know about flying saucers, I said. I don't think they're flying saucers. So my antagonist said, is it impossible that they're flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible? No, I said, I can't prove it's impossible, it's just very unlikely. And he said, you are very unscientific, which, which I've got accused of when I tweeted about this event. You are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then how can you say it's unlikely? But that's the way it is. That's, that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's likely and what's less likely, and not to be proving all the time what's possible and impossible. We don't do that in science. In fact, we talk, when I talk in a different context to people who believe in supernatural deities, I, I also indicate that belief is not a word that we should use in science. It's either things are likely or not likely. To define what I mean, I might have said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think it's much more likely that reports of flying saucers are the results of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence than of the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. And I think that's the key point. In, 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 as, I will, as we may get to, I will argue that while there's no doubt things, people see things that they can't explain and that maybe other people can't explain, that any explanation you can come up with, regardless of how absurd it is, is more likely, much more likely, than the possibility that we're being visited by extraterrestrials. So that's where I'm coming from, and maybe during our, our dialogue back and forth, I'll explain why I have that argument and why I don't think it's unscientific to, to argue that it's unlikely enough that I don't want to spend my time studying it. But let me turn it over to Nick and, and ask him to talk about his background and where, how he came to this. I think it'll give the right perspective. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Travis, for having us both here. And I think it's very important to, as, as Travis articulated in his introduction, to have a good faith conversation about this subject, because wherever one stands on, on the topic of UFOs, or UAP, as they're now called, yeah, and yeah. we can get into some, some interesting talk about the name change, wh wherever people stand, if, if you go on to social media in particular, and, and I think we've both experienced yeah. this, you'll see, and, and you could say this applies to a whole range of issues, but it certainly applies to this one, this massive polarization where you just get this, this skeptic versus believer split and this absolute chasm where there's no attempt to, to reach out the hand and, and shake the hand and have a dialogue. It's just either on the one side, uh, you're a complete fruitcake believing this, it's all just nut jobbery. And on the other side, you're an evil government debunker for suggesting. And, and that really doesn't help anyone because those sorts of people aren't suddenly going to change their minds. Mm -hmm. But there are, I think, people in the middle mm -hmm. on this issue, on a lot of issues, who would, I hope, benefit from a discussion like this. And now, just very briefly, um, my, my own background for those that don't know, I am not a scientist. I am a, a former UK government 
employee. I was a civilian employee of the UK Ministry of Defense, which is the equivalent of, of the DOD here. And I had a 21-year career there doing a lot of different jobs. And one of those jobs in the early 90s was I had responsibility for the UFO issue. I had to investigate the cases and assess whether or not there were any defense, national security, or safety of flight issues posed by this. And we, we essentially concluded that there were, self-evidently because there were things in our airspace that we couldn't explain, and from time to time they did come dangerously close to both commercial and military aircraft, uh, to the point where literally people had to on occasion take evasive action. Now, our position, we tried not to be conclusion-led in any of this. So we didn't go in thinking it's extraterrestrial. Neither did we go in thinking it can't be extraterrestrial. We, we just tried to say, well, what could it be? And, of course, going back through the archive of files, going back decades, because governments have been doing this for, for many, many years, most of the sightings fell into the following, I, I would say, four categories. Misidentifications, uh, deliberate fabrications like hoaxes, psychological delusions, and, and, and this is more recent perhaps, but sensor errors on, on a whole range of military systems. But, but we felt that there was something over and above that, and you know, before I throw it back to Lawrence, I mean, I think one of the reasons we're here is that in the last six years, there has been a fringe to mainstream transition of this subject. One could say, I think, that it started on December 16th, 2017, when the New York Times broke actually two related stories um, and, and put them on the front page. The first was the existence of three US Navy videos of UAP, which are still characterized on the DOD website as being unidentified. And the second related was the existence of a Pentagon unit called ATIP, which stood for Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And, and of course, for years, the US government had said we're no longer interested in UFOs, and nobody's been investigating this since the end of 1969, when the old US Air Force program, Project Blue Book, was closed down. Now, that turned out to be not correct. And what we've seen from then until now is, is more and more revelations and engagement on this. So after years of saying they're not interested uh, and, and they don't study it, NASA is now in the game and actively looking at this. The Pentagon now has a unit called ARROW, which stands for All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. God, they love this word salad mm. stuff. Um, uh, Congress is engaged both in the Senate and the House, uh, the Armed Services Committees, the Intelligence Committees, the Oversight Committees, and there are multiple UAP provisions in the current defense bill and currently being debated and negotiated for next year's bill, so the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2024. I'm not this evening going to tell you that aliens definitely exist because I have no smoking gun. But what I want to put out there is the, the, the possibility, the two interrelated but separate questions. Is there life out there in the universe? I, I think a lot of, pr pretty much most people are coming around to the view that almost certainly yes. Mm -hmm. Are we being visited? That is a separate question for all sorts of scientific impediments to interstellar travel on a viable basis, which Lawrence knows far more about than I and will espouse in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, but, but I want to say that even if something is not likely and has a low order of possibility. Governments and the military and the intelligence community does take this sort of thing seriously. And 
We sometimes call it in government, low probability, high impact scenario. E even if it has a comparatively small chance of being actually true, the societal implications, if any of this does turn out to be true, are such that we should be in the game and studying it. So I am very glad that we're having this discussion. I'm very glad that NASA, that the DOD, um, that Congress are having these discussions, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and I hope more scientists and academics will come on board because, again, as Travis, I think, said in his intro, these questions are some of the biggest and profound questions that we can ask ourselves, and why wouldn't we want to try and get an answer? Okay, that's, that's a great sort of intro to... Uh, um, the, one, of the, one of the reasons that this, be, as you pointed out, has become so, such a great interest is because of the ridiculous... When the government is doing something and, and, they, and they don't say they're doing it, inevitably it gets discovered, and that gives the illusion that there's something to hide. Which is So it's always much better to say, I think they were embarrassed about saying that they were actually considering this, and they figured it'd be better to say they weren't. And the concern of embarrassment over, overrode the, the recognition that it, would, that it would inevitably come out, which is one of, uh, let me say, I have to say, when you were saying that Congress is investigating it, that did make me laugh, of course, because it's probably one of the... Looking for UFOs is probably one of the more realistic things that the Republican Party is doing right now in this country. But um, the, the notion that one of... The, for me, besides the physics problems, and you're involved in the UK government, which tried to be transparent about this, I think, and, and transparently report what was, what was reported to them, um, and, I've, and, I, and I think being transparent is very, very important. But uh, um, one of the things about it, besides the physics aspects, and we can get into why it's so unlikely that, that it's so difficult, if not impossible, to imagine people or beings coming here. Um, but for me, one of the biggest arguments against it is exactly this secrecy notion, that somehow... And I've been to Roswell, and I've been, I, and, and uh, I'll tell you that story sometime. But uh, the notion that the government could keep a secret of something of this immense potential significance effectively, to me, is much more, much harder to believe than the physics aspects of, 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 of getting here, especially when you consider that if anyone actually had real evidence, if any individual who is a party to that amazing conspiracy that some people think exists, it, it, there is so much money to be made in coming forward with that evidence that I find it absolutely impossible to imagine that, th that, that the government could keep a secret, as it obviously can't. It couldn't even keep a secret about the fact of whether they were investigating it. Uh, so I find that sort of sociological fact almost more difficult to believe, the, the conspiracy theory almost di more difficult to believe than the, than, than, the UF, than the alien theory. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, no, that's an interesting point. On, on secrecy, I would say this. Um, obviously, self-evidently, when we talk about this, we can only talk about secrets which have been disclosed, yeah. wh whether legally or, or through, through illegal leaks. Mm -hmm. But I know, as see, governments do successfully keep secrets all the time. And, and I mean, I know, thinking back historically, um, I've personally been involved with, with things way back then that have not leaked. And one could say that um, you know, the, the likelihood of something leaking depends on a number of factors. It depends on the, the number of people uh, obviously working on it, but also the loyalty of those people, the, the um, penalties in terms of the criminal justice system that they would, would face if they leaked something illegally, and, and indeed the penalties in terms of national damage that would result. I mean, take, for example, historically, the people working on, on uh, the Manhattan Project. Um, no one would have wanted to have gone to the, the media and, and tell people about that. And I know that part of that was compartmentalized, but there were, there were plenty of people who, who knew what it was all about. And of course, for, for reasons of patriotism and, and such like, didn't say that. And, and 
The, the breaking of the German codes during the Second World War is another example of a, a secret that was kept for a long time. And people have this sort of false memory that that secret emerged in 1945 at the end of the war. And, and there was a sort of, ha-ha, we were reading your codes. A absolutely not true. It was um, late 60s, early 70s before that was disclosed. So, I mean, governments can keep secrets. And, and on, specifically on the UAP issue, if, if you go now to the Arrow website, which is aaro.mil, and, and see they are now, as a result of provisions in the 2023 defense bill, saying, because they are legally, congressionally mandated to, to report to Congress on any historical programs that do relate to technologies that might be extraterrestrial, they, they are saying, um, if you have information about these programs, please you know, contact us in confidence. But it's, it's a little bit of a mess, because at the moment, Arrow is investigating some of these claims. Congress is, both in the Senate and the House, and as I mentioned, in a range of those committees. And, and so is the Intelligence Community Inspector General, because there have been some whistleblower complaints. So it's a little bit of a mess, but literally this week, there have been negotiations in Congress on this issue. Yeah, the... the, the um The, it, it is interesting that, that I think that whether, how effectively secrets are kept are probably inversely proportional to the, to the um, payoff that someone who reports on them can get. National offense issues, strictly national offense issues, are the areas which are mostly kept secret. And, 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 um, but of course... The, the Manhattan Project was not only, you gotta remember, Roswell was 1947. So we all, we all saw Matt Oppenheimer. We all, and, and, but well before that, in fact, well before the Manhattan Project was completed, the Russians already knew about it, okay? Because, it, because there were spies, and actually a British spy, as you probably know. Wait but, a but, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, um, <laughs> and, and uh, um, uh, what was your other example? That was the? Uh, the Enigma Codes. Yeah, the, the, the Enigma Codes, the... once again. The Emucos were around the same time as, as the first reportings of UFOs, but we also know about, it's not a secret anymore. And both of these things have a much smaller payoff, much less incentive. A whistleblower could go to jail for reporting on a national defense issue, but a, but a whistleblower who said, here is an arm or a tentacle from an alien, and here it is, it's non-biological. Here is a piece of structure that actually, you know absolutely that there's zero chance that they would go to jail. So, but there's a huge chance that they would then get a $5 million book contract. Yeah. And, and, and those are the kind of things that make me suspicious. But more than that is the fact that you're right, there are all these mandates to report on investigations. And what's great is that the reports have come out that in fact, after all this time and all these investigations, there is zero evidence. The NASA committee, which is actually run by a an uh, old colleague and, and a friend of mine, David Spurgle, who's now the president of the Simons Foundation here in New York City, um, and, and you know, I've known him since he was a graduate student, um, d came out and, and definitively said after all of this that we've done this investigation and sure there are things we, we can't identify. There are things we don't, and we don't know what they are, but there is zero evidence that anything is extraterrestrial. So yes, it's great that these places are investigating it, although one doesn't want to waste too much time and money on it when there's other things that could be done. But, but the fact, that, the fact that, that there are investigations going on is not the same as saying there's any credible evidence. And, and so I think the idea of a smoking gun from the fact that things are being investigated, especially in the current time, is, is in the public has gotten this this, given the public this sense that there's something there to be investigated. And clearly there is, in the sense that scientists and more particularly defense people would like to be able to better analyze any data that comes in to try and infer what the, what the identity is of things that we can't quite identify right now. And one of the, one of the recommendations of that NASA committee was, was a whole bunch of things that can be done using AI and other things to better analyze uh, 
data. Uh, and, and, but the, 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 the notion, one of the reasons I don't think many scientists, other than engineers, many detailed scientists uh, get involved in this, it, it relates to what you said in, in a way, and I had this discussion with someone just yesterday. The notion of considering the possibility of extraterrestrial life in the universe is fascinating. I spend time thinking about it, a lot of people do, because because that would be a remarkable discovery of incredible importance, not just about the universe, but of great significance for, for humanity. Discovering what the cause of someone inferring that something that looks like a race graph might be a balloon, or that you, the speed that's inferred from a certain piece of data is not right. Those are interesting questions, they're engineering questions. But what you learn from that, it's not going to be fundamental at all. And I think that's why you don't see many scientists getting interested in it, because the payoff of trying to figure out why these unidentified objects are, are unidentified is of interest for defense purposes and of interest for engineering purposes, but it's not a fundamental science question. The question that you did refer to, which is, the existence of life elsewhere in the universe, which is a, is a very interesting question, and one in which I think we can talk about, and mm -hmm. which I, I think there are huge developments going on, and um, a much greater likelihood of being able to, to, I think in my lifetime, in fact, maybe within the next decade, we'll have clear evidence that life exists, life exists elsewhere, even potentially in the solar system. I would be very, I would be surprised if we didn't get evidence, not, not Mars is more ambiguous, because Mars is not a decoupled system, but from the oceans in, under Europa or Enceladus, um, but, but we're also with the James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes able to look at planets and image them and image their atmospheres and potentially, so life I suspect is ubiquitous, intelligent life is a much bigger problem and, and a much harder, much harder to imagine that there's a particularly intelligent life near enough to detect it, even though it's worth at least private money looking for, and there's a lot of private money looking for it. Do you want to? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point, and, and I totally agree that it, it is very likely, I think, sooner rather than later, that we will find scientific proof of life elsewhere in the universe. Maybe, yeah, maybe in the solar system. Uh, I'm obviously more excited by the, the chances that we might find intelligent life or evidence of intelligent life and that might come about for example through through the SETI program mm -hmm. through through detecting a, a, a signal or a message uh, of obviously of artificial origin or it might come around through through the detection of a, a techno signature um, say you know scientists have speculated about the theoretical possibility of, of things like Dyson spheres that might be detectable. And that would, and I, I was thinking about this actually earlier today. I thought, is there a way, is there a way to kind of encapsulate very simply the arguments about life in the universe? And I thought, and this may be a little simplistic, but I'll, I'll try it out. And I thought, the, the way to come at this is to say, either it is impossible for intelligent life to exist in the universe, or it's possible. And we are the proof mm -hmm. that it is possible. So, all, all, in a sense, all we can say is it is possible that intelligent life can emerge. We know that it can because it has. And, and so, I'm very excited by what that means. And I think, again, I was thinking about this discussion, and I thought, you know, the whole ethos of, of these events is maybe to try and find some common ground. And where mm. I think we might find some common ground is, is the intellectual stimulation of thinking about what I call the, the next order of questions. In other words, if we do discover, <laughs> if, if we do discover um, extraterrestrial life, sorry, we're hearing some strange things. You want to close in, that door maybe? That might help. In our, um, Headsets you, you were here. planning a chorus, <laughs> were you, Travis? <laughs> no. oh, okay. um, I think the thing that excites me is the societal implications of discovering extraterrestrial yeah. life. And, yeah, intelligent life, obviously, at, at the high end of the spectrum, but even microbial life would profoundly affect, I think, our worldview 
And, and we could have, and perhaps should have, a discussion about the ramifications of this, because I think particularly intelligent life would, would have implications for politics, religion, science, well, technology, uh, philosophy, and well, everything. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, obviously, if the discovery of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe would be unbelievably important scientifically. I used to believe many years ago that it would have a big effect on religion. I don't think so anymore. Religion really is independent of evidence. And so um, I think that there, that I used to think if you came across another civilization that either didn't have a deity or different kinds of deities, it would impact it. But religion can always t mold itself to use any bit of evidence as kind of support. So I don't think, but it would have a tremendous impact. But it's not, it's far less likely than discovering the existence of life. And I, you know, I've written about both subjects a lot. But let me just say a few things before maybe I get into the physics of why it's so unlikely to imagine we're being visited. But even if, um, you know, I wrote a book called The Physics of Star Trek a long time ago, and, and, uh, uh, and I pointed out, um, you know, I, was, I had friends who were involved in SETI, and I was involved in a little, little bit of that, and that even, so the galaxy is pretty big. There are 100 billion stars. We now know there are probably 100 billion solar systems. Almost every star is a solar system. So that increases the possibility of life of one sort or another. Um, th th there's two things, like two scientific things I want to say. Uh, um, one is that even if intelligent life exists, and it's probably extremely rare, but because you have to think of all the factors. The Earth is, it took four billion years almost for the, well, um, about four billion years for intelligent life. By intelligent life, I mean technologically intelligent. I mean, dolphins may be intelligent, but they're not emitting signals that can be detected outside uh, our solar system. And it took almost four billion years in a, in a very special environment. So it's probably rare, but rare doesn't matter. When there are 100 billion solar systems in our galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the universe, rare can still mean lots of stuff. But it's a big galaxy, and, it's, and things are very far apart. And even if you... I like to point out the, 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 the daunting task. So let's say you were on another star system, which had, has to be less than about 100 light years away, if, if, you, if you want to have any evidence that we're around because we've been emitting radio signals for maybe 100 years. But before that, there's no evidence of intelligent life on Earth particularly because um, we're not emitting signals. But even if someone told you to look at that star over there and then look at the third rock from that star, and you'll find life, even then, if you think about it, it would be, over the history of our galaxy, the probability of doing so, of finding our existence, even then, less than 1 in 50 million. Why? Because the galaxy is t about 12 billion years old. Our Earth is 4.5 billion years old. You could imagine an advanced civilization that watched the Earth from its formation 4.5 billion years ago. And when, during that time interval, if they were monitoring us, and knew, and knew exactly what to look for. There's only a hundred year period in which they would have been able to find anything. So even if they knew where to look at a random time in the history of the Earth, the probability of finding life on Earth by that kind of signal is small. But that's if they knew what to listen for. I, I remember I gave up watching TV when, when cable came on and, and there were like 200 channels and I, and I could never find the program I was looking for. Right? <laughs> in, in the real world, you've got to wonder, okay, so there's frequencies, but there are an infinite number of frequencies to, to use. So you can guess, are they using the hydrogen lines? Or, you know, people, SETI people, try and think of what would an intelligent civilization do if they knew other civilizations were intelligent, where would they look for? But if with an infinite number of frequencies, you have to scan a huge number of frequencies looking for a signal, and SETI tried to do that with the limits of the computer technology that was available. Now computers are evolving dramatically. But so that's even... You don't, we don't know what to look for. We don't know what to listen for. We don't know where to look. It makes the task of even without worrying about visitation, of finding evidence for intelligent, extremely small. Now, it's so important. It's so important from a cultural perspective and also a scientific one that it's worth doing. I don't think it's worth government money on, but I'm very happy that billionaires are spending their money on it, and I was involved in, in such things. Because it's great that private money is intrigued enough, and Yuri Milner, and more recently, another, another uh, rich guy gave about $200 million to a project to look for 
extraterrestrial intelligence. But we should see, we should realize that even if it exists, it's extremely unlikely that we'll find it. And Carl Sagan knew that too. It's, 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 a, it's a remote possibility. And, and if we don't find it, as he said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The most likely thing is if intelligence exists in the universe, and I do think it is, does, that we will probably never know about it, which is tr sad for me personally, because obviously I'd like to, to know about it. And, and um, anyway, I'll start with that. We can talk about the Fermi paradox. We can talk about a whole bunch of other stuff if you want. But sure. No, I, I, I think one of the most interesting ideas, and I think it was Timothy Ferris who coined mm. the idea of a galactic internet, mm -hmm. the idea that civilizations, even if they never meet, might essentially put the sum total of their, their knowledge, their history, everything, out there, and that any civilizations with sufficiently advanced radio telescopes might essentially be able to find that, and therefore, even if they never encounter each other, learn about the existence of, of these other civilizations, and, and uh, hopefully learn things that they didn't know. So I think that's one exciting thing. The other, the other thing that I think, picking up on some of your, your remarks there, is, is um, yes, there are obviously immense challenges if intelligent extraterrestrials wanted to find us, but without wanting to kind of do a Star Trek on you and yeah. say, well, but what about warp drive and what about wormholes? Well, let's, I'm very but happy we, if you no, do a Star Trek thing on me. We can, yeah, 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 I'm not going to try and out yeah, Star yeah. Trek you. But yeah. what, I, what I will say is this. I mean, I, I, I think... Uh, History shows us that the rapid advances in technologies that, that we've, we've seen in certain areas. So, for example, um, faster than, uh, sorry, heavier than, heavier than air flight is comparatively recent in human history. But we've basically come from, you know, the, the Orville and, and, you know, the Wright brothers, the Wright flyer, to stealth fighters and such like in, in less than 100 years, and, and arguably space probes as well. In, in terms of seeing the universe, we've gone from just being able to look with the naked eye to being able to look through instruments like James Webb back to almost the dawn of, of time and, and see quasars and, and things that, that, you know, a few hundred years ago before the telescope, I mean, you know, all you could see was those little pinpricks in the sky. So I don't know, I mean, I don't know theoretically, we can get into this perhaps, how we far can. ahead, given, given star formation and heavy elements, yeah. theoretically how far ahead of us another civilization could be, a billion years? Well, the first question is, how long does intelligent civilizations survive? And if we're the only example we know of, you wouldn't give good odds for a billion-year survival period but uh, for an intelligent civilization, well, if, if we're an example. But, but let me, you hit on something um, with this, what you hit on is, is the hope of everyone. And, and, I was, and Travis demonstrated that misconception beautifully. When he talked about, we don't, the known, we don't know there's known laws of physics and, and we don't know. And, and I'm a big proponent of that. My, my last book called The Edge of Knowledge is saying we don't know is the three most important words you can, you can say in science. But the biggest misconception people have about science is because there's a lot we don't know about the universe, we don't know anything. In particular, what we do know with, it, with absolute certainty is that the, the unknown physics cannot contradict the known physics. Whatever I learn about quantum gravity a billion years from now, if, there, if that's how long it takes to show that string theory, say, has anything to do with reality, which it probably doesn't. But anyway, um, it, it, a billion years from now, whatever I know about quantum gravity, if I take a ball and let it go at the surface of the Earth, it's going to fall. Whatever fundamental theories we have cannot contradict the theories that have survived the test of experiment. So it's... so. Anything is fine when it comes to unknown physics, but when it comes to known physics, the unknown physics cannot contradict it. So when something appears to violate the known laws of physics, there's good reason to believe that it's not there. And because, and, and you know, there are lots of examples of that. People, it would amaze me, and I just read a book 
I was looking today at a book I wrote 30 years ago called Beyond Star Trek. And, and I pointed out there, which I think is people, one of the identifications of UFOs is that they don't behave like normal aircraft or spacecraft. They do things like t right angle turns and, and, and you know, going twice the speed of sound and all that. I would argue the characteristic of any real alien spacecraft or aircraft would be that it would do exactly what, what normal aircraft and spacecraft do. Because that's the way anyone who was reasonable would be designing things. If you wanted to make one of these, and I love how most of these uh, reports do have these great right angle turns instantly, which you'd never see. Well, let's just take some basic physics from Newton, which ha wasn't contradicted by Einstein, which isn't quanti contradicted by quantum mechanics, and certainly won't be contradicted by quantum gravity or whatever is learned about the universe that we don't understand. If you, let's say you're going twice the speed of sound, you make a right angle turn, what seems instantaneously, I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt, the eye keeps an image for maybe a tenth of a second. So let's say it makes you a tenth of a second to do a right angle turn from the twice the speed of sound. Well, when you do that, you're gonna experience incredible g-forces. About at least 700 g's, which is equivalent to the force you'd feel in an aircraft if you, if you lost power and you fell to the ground from a, maybe a thousand feet, the instant of impact on the ground, you'd experience g-forces around that. Aircraft don't look good after that. Like, they don't. Now, you might say, well, they're made of advanced materials that we don't have. Okay. But the materials might survive, but the aliens wouldn't. Now, whatever we learn about, as I say, about gravity, about anything else, is not going to change that basic physics that you have to overcome to do that. Now, it's true that I suspect, and I was saying with a friend over dinner, that Quite likely, if you were really going to send spacecraft, and why would you, when in fact you can build a James Webb Space Telescope, you can scan the universe without traveling through it so much more effectively, so much more cheaply, and scan the whole galaxy instead of devoting to take a spacecraft to travel near the, the speed of light from a nearby star to here, a spacecraft that could hold a mass of you or me, would require something like the power output of a star, okay, if, you, if it had its fuel on board. Why would they spend all of that incredible amount of energy, even if an advanced civilization could harness it, just to come all the way here and abduct psychiatric patients of some Harvard psychiatrist and do kinky experiments? It just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem worth it. So, uh, uh, but the point is, you can't, even if you could harness it, you can't overcome the fact that that's the amount of energy that's required because it's basic physics that, that is tested. And that means, as I say, whatever we don't understand can't contradict that. So I do worry when people say, well, you know, these civilizations are really advanced. If they're really advanced, they probably, if they exist, would do what we're doing now, which is learn that the best way to, instead of taking the resources and going to one object, for which, again, if you're more than 100 light years away, you never even know has civilization in it, when you can scan the whole galaxy and look for life, or listen for signs of intelligent life, it's much more effective. And, and finally, the, I think the most likely thing, if a civilization did live a billion years long, you know, if, if, an intelligent civilization that was so much more advanced than us, it's, to me it's quite likely that they would, what they would precisely do is not have any interest whatsoever in our existence, or particularly in revealing their own existence. They would probably you know, be staring at their navels and going, um, it's it, because they would already, there's absolutely nothing to be learned from our existence and, and be of no interest then. But, so psychologically, I'm going to understand it, from the laws of physics, there's, there's no good likelihood that you could ever have a spacecraft that would travel at near light speed that's large enough to embody significant aliens. And moreover, the final thing I just want to say, I want to throw out all these tidbits, what always amuses me is flying saucers. Why would you, if you're traveling from a, even a nearby star, 99.999% of the time of your voyage is traveling in space. Why would you build an object that's precisely designed to be aerodynamic in the atmosphere of, an, of, a, of a planet that you don't even know about? You design a flying saucer because it's nice, you know, we all have frisbees and they work on our atmosphere, but it wouldn't be at all useful for, for traveling in, for, for the bulk of your travel. And so, thinking about why things would behave aerodynamically for an object, look at the, look at the lunar excursion module if you're as old as you and me. Um, 
for young people. We went to the moon. We really did go to the moon. And, um, and there was nothing less aerodynamic than the lunar excursion module. It was the ugliest thing in the world. Why? Because you didn't need it to be aerodynamic because it, it was working in space. And so one has to think about some of those things. And I just want to throw out a few. Sure. No, I think there were some really interesting points there. And I, I, I want to pick up on a few and make a, mm. a, a, a few of my own. I guess one of the interesting philosophical questions about this is, is relates to um, the nature of altruism and, and whether altruism, true altruism exists or whether there's always a hope of a quid pro quo. Because I think in considering the extraterrestrial question, in as the power dynamic would be if we're interacting with more advanced civilizations, the question would become, would they be altruistic in terms of doing the heavy lifting for us? And, and so that's something I'd like to, to throw out. I, mean, I do think, I, I do actually think that even a, a civilization way more advanced than us would still be interested in us for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I think that to, to really advanced civilizations newly emerging civilizations might be quite interesting. They might be wondering, are they going to make the same mistakes that we made? Oh, Star Trek. Are they going to kind of find a new, different path? Are they going to surprise us? Um, and, and so I, I think that's one thing. I think we, as hopefully quite intelligent life, are interested in arguably less intelligent life, i.e. we're fascinated by nature. And, and so... You know, intelligent, advanced extraterrestrials might might be very interested in in us from that perspective, and and also, of course, let's not be too human centric about this. Extraterrestrials might value biodiversity and might be fascinated by all sorts of things about life on Earth, not necessarily just intelligence, but beauty and and you know utilitarian design. And, and such like. So I think there you are... See, the problem with that argument... I have to interrupt for a second. I, lo I buy all of what you're saying. But the problem with the argument is it's like having your cake and eat it too. You say there's a civilization that's a billion years more advanced. That's a billion years is a long time, okay? And that means if there is such a civilization and if they really do have capabilities of knowing about our existence, and that means... And, and what, that really implies if, that we're not special. There aren't just two forms of life. That means the galaxy is kind of teeming with life. And that means that th such a civilization is aware of lots of different life in, in the galaxy. And there's absolutely nothing, and presumably, unless we are, unless you violate the suggestion that we're typical, if we're, unless we're incredibly atypical for some reason that's hard to believe since life evolved on Earth about as soon as the laws of physics allowed it to, so it doesn't seem like it's, it's that. So th the point is that there's a galaxy teeming with life. Why in such a galaxy would this particular planet, which may be hard to get to, it's in a remote corner of the galaxy, be particularly interesting compared to all the other thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of other civilizations that such a supposedly advanced civilization would be aware of? Uh, and so, once again, I think it's, it's very um, solipsistic for us to assume that not that they wouldn't be interested in studying us in the same way that we were, aren't, wouldn't be interested in studying biosignatures on other planets, but to devote the remarkably, unbelievably expensive resources and time, because you're not traveling faster than light, no matter what, even with warp drive, and we can talk about that, even warp drive doesn't get you faster than light. Um, why would that, those kind of resources be devoted to come here and then to hide and crash in Roswell, New Mexico, or do kinky experiments, or do nothing of interest? Uh, it, 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 you know, it just doesn't add up. I'm, I'm, less, I'm less wedded to the idea of uh, extraterrestrials coming here and abducting oh. people and probing them than I am to the idea of sending out fleets of, of probes mm -hmm. and, and having those probes effectively gather, gather data yeah. on, on planets. And I think if, if we were looking for signs of intelligent life in our solar system, that's what I would be looking for, probes. And, um, you know, I, I would use the analogy of, I suppose, our 
pioneer and Voyager probes and, and say, look, I, I know that we have not directly aimed them at, say, Proxima Centauri, mm. and if we had, they would take about, what, 75,000 years to get there? Yeah. I, I think, at, at, and at, assuming, at assuming we can never go any faster than say, Pioneer or Voyager speed. Now, I think we can do better well, than that. Let me, I was involved in such a project well, called Star, Breakthrough Starship, funded by a Russian billionaire named Yuri, Yuri Milner. Yuri Milner, right, Stephen right. Stephen Hawking and I and a bunch of other people were involved in it. And, um, and, the, and I agree with you that if you were going to do more than just take in information, you would send out probes, not beings, okay? Mm -hmm. But... The project we wanted to do, because it was the only, even then, and actually after years of studying it, I became more and more convinced it's, impla it's implausible rather than plausible. But when we started to do it, the idea was that what you could imagine plausibly sending at 20% the speed of light to Proxima Centauri, so it would take 20 years to get there instead of five, which is in human life, it was a little, and it could transmit back, so it's another you know, five years to get back. So in 25 years from the time we launch one or many of these things, you might actually get a picture of, 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 of planets from it. Okay. But the problem is, what we, sh what we did was consider a one gram probe, because that was the largest object you could imagine sending with, at any reasonable fraction of the speed of light, but an instrument, and potentially get a signal for. It turns out to be incredibly implausible to even do that. So there may be probes but the se only sensible probes would be microscopic inside because mass is the enemy of, sp of space travel. Mass, mass is literally the en enemy, and the, m the more advanced you are, the smaller you can, you, can, you can produce things. So if there were probes, they'd be traveling through space, and they wouldn't be in, in flying saucer-sized things. They'd be microscopic in size. Because you Why? Because you could do it, and the cost of doing it would be infinitely less than the cost of sending a big, heavy thing. And if you're really smart, you can do a lot with the smaller thing. So why build the bigger thing? I, I just want to go back to my uh, Voyager and okay. Pioneer okay. example for a moment. And I, I just want to hypothesize and, and throw this out as a scenario. Imagine that we had uh, pretty much pointed Voyager and, um, and, and Pioneer at Proxima Centauri. And imagine, just bear with me on this, imagine there's a civilization on a planet um, orbiting that star. And 75,000 years from now, Voyager mm -hmm. comes into the atmosphere and crashes. And the government at Proxima Centauri, the military intelligence community, gather it up, as, as is quite likely, and they say, what the heck's this? And some locals saw it come down, and um, the government spirits it away to a, a place, and they start doing some experiments on it, and, and then all the locals say, hey, we saw, we saw a strange object come down and crash. I think it came from another star system. And then the scientists on Proxima Centauri say, no, no, that's crazy, that would never happen. But actually, it did. I'm well, just throwing well, okay. that scenario a, out there. It, let, let, okay, let's take your scenario and explain why, um, why it's, it's not going to happen. It because, might. No, no, because it's really interesting to realize that what it's hard to imagine is how big and how empty our galaxy is. Let me give you, let me give you the likelihood that Voyager or any random probe that's sent out randomly would hit anything is essentially zero. And to, give, to put that in perspective, the Andromeda galaxy is heading right towards us at 100 kilometers per second. Pretty big object. There's 100 billion stars in that galaxy. And so it'll hit the Milky Way galaxy, or it'll collide with the Milky Way galaxy in about 5 billion years, okay? When that happens, the likelihood that any two objects will hit from that galaxy will hit another, a anything in our galaxy, except that the very center of our galaxy is almost zero. You've got 100 billion stars aiming at our galaxy. The likelihood that anything hits anything else is almost zero because most of our galaxy is empty space. So it's true. That possibility is a wonderful thought. Mm. But if you ask what's the likelihood of it, mm. the likelihood is so small that to be essentially zero. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it means 
it may be fun to think about, but it isn't happening. Well, in my scenario, I was saying we deliberately aimed it. Okay, there. okay, okay. That's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. But if we, that, that that was that was what I meant. Okay, but then you'd know you need to know, of course, where to deliberately aim it. And what we're going to do, and what we try to do, is we're going to deliberately aim at something. We'll probably aim it at the nearest star system that might have a habitable planet, unless we find a biosignature. And as you say, if we don't find biosignatures in, in the nearest 100 light years, then you're not talking about 75,000 years, you're talking about a few million years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so nothing's impossible, but the likelihood of doing that, rather than, for example, sending a signal, which is mm -hmm. much more effective, travels at the speed of light, it's cheap, it's, it's almost free. We could detect a light bulb on Jupiter, uh, on, on Pluto, if, it, if there was one. And so why, why do that if you're, really, if, you're, if, if you're convinced there's intelligent life and you're not just pro interested in probing a potential biosystem? The first thing you'd probably do is, is send a signal. Mm. And, and so I think sending objects is the last alternative and it's... And, in a, in a universe that lasts a long enough time, it could happen eventually. But you're right, it has to be patient, and you have to say, the results of this experiment are going to yeah. come in after our civilization is long gone, perhaps. Um, so anyway, the point is that I'm not saying any of it's impossible, but you have to think about how plausible it is. And I think sure. if you do that honestly, you say it's less likely than other alternatives. Yeah, I, I mean, I come back to the scenario that what I said about low probability, high impact. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, Michael Shermer, yeah. I, I think, uh, gave, gave an example. I'm sure it's an old saying. I, I can't remember whether he coined it mm -hmm. or somebody else, but he said, if you, you, you know the one, if, if you hear hoof prints, uh, hoof, hoofs outside your, your door, mm -hmm. think horses, not zebras. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, that's fine. And, and 99.9 percent of the time it will be horses, but occasionally you read story about zoo animals escaping, mm -hmm. and so it can be a zebra. And, and so my, my point with all this is, is that even if it is low probability, the, the high impact, the high consequence makes it worth doing. And I mean, I, I am very pleased that we're having this discussion. I wish more scientists like you would come on board and, and at least talk about it. And I am glad, I should say, a shout out to Professor Avi Loeb, um, and the Galileo project. And Avi was on the Starshot project with me too. Right, and, uh, and what I like about Galileo project, and I think that one of the problems with UFOs and scientists was for, for years, people in the UFO community would say, I want more scientists to get involved with this. But the question back, was, which was a good question, is, well, what kind of scientists? What field? Yeah. I, I mean, who do you want? Do you want aeronautical engineers? Do yeah. you want theoretical physicists? Do you want cosmologists? Do you, who do you want? Galileo Project, by having a multidisciplinary approach, is, is trying to cover all the bases. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, and get a lot of publicity. And, but happily, just using private money. Because no peer-reviewed government scientific agency would devote money to that because it's not worth spending public funds on. Moreover, as you know, Avi has achieved a lot of notoriety by... And I've known Avi for many years and is a very good scientist who... who throws a lot of darts out, and, uh, and, 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 and anyway, I won't go there. But, um, but the point is, as you probably know, the first notoriety was claiming that an object was an extraterrestrial, was, a, was evidence of an extraterrestrial civilization, which is just not the case, as other scientists have shown pretty conclusively. But, you know, asking the question, could it be, is different than making the claim that it is. And I do worry about... Um, making such claims. They get a lot of notoriety, they allow you to write best-selling books and all the rest, but it's not science. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to come back on the government money point yeah. because that's quite important. Yeah. Um, after I did the UAP job at the Ministry yeah. of Defense, I actually did a, a financial policy mm -hmm. job. And one of the good things about UAP research in government is that a lot of stuff can be done pretty much at no additional cost. Uh -huh. Because, of course, a lot of the things you need to research and investigate UAP from within government 
already exist and already funded. So you are, you're not necessarily having to spend much new money because what you're doing is piggybacking all the things you need, like, for example, your military radar mm -hmm. systems, uh, space fence, um, the, the intelligence community imagery analysis, mm -hmm. uh, resources and capabilities. All that exists and is funded. So I, I, I hope that Congress doesn't say, hey, this is a waste of no, money because I it's not it, too much money being spent. Yeah, but the point, yeah, but what I want to, you're absolutely right. Because, I mean, the military has an infinite budget that spends a lot of money on things that are much less interesting and much less useful. <laughs> So I have no problem with the military spending or the government spending that kind of money. But you said, why don't more scientists come on board? The point is, the, the, the Defense Department has resources to investigate things and use the technology. If you want scientists who are currently doing other projects, take, take government money to do other things that is much more likely to have positive results, and say, let's take the money from those things and devote it to this, that's a very different thing. That's why you're not seeing many people from outside, from the outside scientific community coming in, because they're all do something that is much more likely to produce something. But the military can devote resources, and, I'm, and I perfectly think should, because not because for many reasons, but, but as your department pointed out, for defense reasons. The UAPs may not, are, are, are not likely to be extraterrestrial, but it's important from a defensive purpose for an advanced civilization or advanced, you know, a, a, a technological society like ours to be able to know what, what is happening in our, in our airspace, to know it better. And I think what, what, the, what the NASA report said and other reports are saying is we need to do a better job instead of having these anecdotal reports from people, you know, with their, with their iPhones. And it is kind of amazing with, a, with five billion people having iPhones on the planet that not a single one has ever taken a picture of a real UFO. Uh, so, but, but the government has the resources to do that much more systematically and should do it, and to the extent that it doesn't infringe on national security, should be public about it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the former uh, director of national intelligence uh, did, did say that there is satellite data on UAP, and, yeah. and but now, how much of that is ever gonna be declassified for everyone else to, to evaluate, I don't know. I mean, I, th I, think, I think we have, we have obviously some differences mm -hmm. here, but we have found some common ground. Oh, I yeah, don't sure. know how we are it's for time. It's always good to investigate things. What, what time do you think we should well, throw to the audience? Well, I was just going to suggest that after you said whatever you're going to say, that we should go to the audience. Yeah, should Travis, we do that? Travis said an hour, and I, I want to go much less, but we're all, we've been pretty well an hour. Take off his 40-minute introduction, and we've went, we're <laughs> done. And, and, uh, and uh, we're there. So, yeah, I was, yeah. was going to suggest we go to the audience because the questions will be much more interesting. Yeah, let's do that. How do you want to do that? It's a small group. Do you have a microphone? Or? The audience mic is just there, guys. Okay. So, uh, feel free to use it. So, let, let's do that. But thanks. I mean, I think, yeah, I think the idea was to raise the issues in different ways instead of resolving them. And let's I think give them have. a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great. Now, who has a pressing question? Have we. I don't now. I don't want to scare anyone off. Wait, the New Hampshire person in the very back, um, and uh, there's a very. Uh, I don't know if that's a latecomer Great. who's just come in who, who likes to make a special entrance, and I see her. But anyway, uh, okay. Hello. Come on down, as they, as Monty by Hall used to say. I think. Okay. Hello, Ethan. And I know uh, you brought your. Now I know you're a scientist because you're wearing a white coat. Uh, it's actually. I actually <laughs> okay. am. I'm, I'm an okay. experimental scientist. Okay. Uh, we have a research lab in Hawthorne, New Jersey, called sure. Falcon Space. We're looking uh -huh. into uh, p potential propulsion systems to how these craft work. Mm -hmm. And you asked a couple very legitimate questions. Thank you. Why aren't scientists involved? Well, uh, there's actually an organization that's been going on three years now called APEC, the Alternative Propulsion Engineering Conference. Mm -hmm. And we have PhDs, scientists from all walks of life, mo a lot of theoretical physicists, uh, many I think I spoke at the first one, by the way, probably when you were a little baby. But anyway, I, I, I actually created it. Yeah, so okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you I did, mean, it was NASA on NASA did have an advanced propulsion program, and uh, and and for alternative propulsion, and I got I was involved in in Richard in Eskridge that, and uh, in, out Brandenburg. of Cleveland, actually, believe it or not. So oh, uh, they had one down in Huntsville, Alabama, yeah, yeah. too. Okay, anyway, sorry. and uh, some of that stuff never got published, but I, yeah. I went down there and checked that out. Um, so some of your questions uh, about why are they uh, saucer shape? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, or how can they do a 90 degree turn mm. without turning everyone into uh, salsa? Into salsa on the yeah. side. Well, have you ever given any thought of where inertial mass comes from? Yeah, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And you don't really have an answer yet, right? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean universal mass? Uh, no, not universal, uh, inertial mass. Inertial mass? Yes. Okay. Well, what inertial mass inertial? is the reason why they'll get turned into salsa. Well, you mean in the sense that, that, I don't want to have a physics debate here, but in the sense that, you know, inertial mass being the thing that responds to gravitational force? Um, and also... As opposed to, you know, there's rest mass, there's, there's rest energy, there's, and it is a remarkable fact that, the, that, that there are different ways of considering the mass of an object, but inertial mass is what responds to gravity. Okay, and so, so we do understand that in the context of general relativity. What is its origin? Well, it turns out, if you want to think of the Higgs field as giving inertial mass to elementary particles, then it comes from the Higgs field. Okay, maybe there's a way to get rid of that. Have you, have you heard there of that? There is, there is. All you'd have to do is heat a system up to a temperature of roughly a billion, billion, billion degrees, what if you did and the opposite? locally, which would require more energy than is available probably from, from the sun in its lifetime to do that locally. And, you, and in a small region, you might be able to make the Higgs field go to zero. Yeah. But what if you did the opposite? What if you oriented the subatomic particle spins? What, what was that? Uh, there's a process called dynamic nuclear orientation where you can orient subatomic particle spins and make uh, matter weightless. There, well, I, okay. that's, that, that's something that we're working on. We don't on. have to have the discussion. We, you, you don't, and we haven't. Okay, but anyway, we can debate about that later. I know of, uh, of these wonderful experiments where people tried to rotate something and claimed that they reduced the inertial mass, which weren't reproducible and were, in fact, shown not to be reproducible. I, I'm quite aware of that community. And uh, look, I, I, I think it's... Here's, here's the problem, and it's what I told NASA. This is not an engineering problem. It's not as if engineers are going to design some, new, design some new propulsion system. It's fundamental physics. And it's fundamental physics at the level that we, that we, we don't have the capability of, that, that's at the level of, of what people like me are doing, at the edge of theoretical physics. And so it's not as if we're going to put a bunch of engineers in a laboratory and make an advanced propulsion system that involves physics that we don't yet understand. It's just way beyond, it's like, it's like asking, it's like asking a, a, a dolphin and saying, okay, we need to make a new radio transmission system. I mean, they don't know yet about electromagnetic waves. So it's not an engineering problem. At this point, trying to understand things like warp drive, which I can argue is impractical anyway and won't work. Um, it's already been achieved in Omaha, Nebraska. They got like it, five pounds. Of it, 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 anyway, okay, it's good. You keep working on it. That's all I can say. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude, but we, you know, no sense probably in this, in this group. But let me say that as a lot of people, when I have debates with people about evolution, they say scientists are closed minded. They don't want to, you know, and, and what people don't realize is that every scientist goes into the work each day wanting to prove their colleagues wrong. Because that's how you get well known. So it's not to say, we, let's have a little, little handshake. We'll, we'll never open our, our minds to anything new. Or if there is, we won't let anyone know. It's the exact opposite. So what I'm saying to you is that the, the reason I'm poo-pooing what you've talked about is that people like me have looked at this stuff and would love it to be true. Just like I'd love there to be evidence of... I mean, it would be amazing if there really were some divine creator who did something. It would be wonderful to have evidence of that. There isn't. Okay, and, and so, but if the stars aligned tonight and I looked up and I saw an Aramaic, if I could read it, I am here, uh, hey, I'd be the first one to can. buy, that'd be great. If I had evidence of some, of, or I knew of anyone who had evidence of something like that, I'd be the first person to be working on it. Well, but you're welcome no, but to come to the lab, it's a half stuff, an hour from here. I know, but when, half you, an look hour at, drive. But when you look at the peer-reviewed stuff, what you see is that there's nothing there. So I encourage there's, you there's to There's lots of stuff there, okay. and we have lots of peer-reviewed okay. papers that we would love to okay. share with you. Great. Don't, don't share with me, but, but publish <laughs> it. 
Uh, also, okay. your, your, uh, your friend Richard Feynman famously said, it doesn't matter how great your theory is or yeah. how, how smart you are. If it disagrees with experiment, it's, it's wrong. wrong. Absolutely. Right. And we do experiments. Good. Keep doing experiments. I encourage you to keep doing it. And I hope, I sincerely hope you prove me wrong. I really, really do. I earnestly hope you prove me wrong because that would be fascinating. So okay. keep, keep it up. Thank Don't you. spend public money on it, but keep it up. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. And I, thanks for having the brave reader. I'm sorry, do you want to? I, I kind of took over. Hi, right, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, you know what? The Earth has been through so many traumatic things. I mean, we had, uh, you know, a number of times we get, uh, uh, we get struck by something from outer mm -hmm. space and dust goes in the air mm -hmm. and it kills everything. And well, that could happen again, right? And mm -hmm. we can send out all these signals. And by the time somebody actually reads it, the Earth could be. De everybody on it could be dead again. And it seems like we're four, million years, uh, four billion years old. Within that time, we've been through a number of these. What are the chances are, because we continue to go through this, that now we're going to do it to ourselves between pollution and bombs <laughs> that we can, you know, like, What's will intelligent like life ever last long enough to talk to each other? Knows? I guess that's my but, question. Yeah. But, you know, but, and I'll, I'll say one thing, and then I think you, because you've been involved in the government of this too, but. I think the point is that we can at least try and anticipate what the problems are, and as a presumably intelligent technological situation, as Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. So one of the projects that the government, that's somewhat related to looking for UAPs in a different sort of way, that is really worth funding and is really important, is a project that was just involved with, which is looking for near-Earth or, or, or objects that are going to collide with the Earth. That we need to do, because it's going to happen. Now, the probability of a life-destroying asteroid hitting us is about once every 100 million years, but you don't need that. And as you probably know, NASA sent a mission called DART yep. to intersect an asteroid to see if you could deflect it. And that's the kind of thing that an intelligent civilization should be doing in developing the tools so that we can get a good idea within, within maybe a 10-year advance notice of any large object, kilometer size or more, that might impact on the Earth. But, there, but, but your point is well taken. The universe in every way is trying to kill us. We're not doing a very good job of not trying to kill ourselves. And so the likelihood that we'll be around in a long time is not great, especially when you consider that 99.9% .9 of the species that have existed on Earth are already extinct. And, and, and Richard Gott, who's at, at, at Princeton, has a, a, a neat prediction, which is basically things survive on average for about as long as they've existed. So, you know, you could ask how long will, will hominids survive? And it's, you know, it's not, there's no perfect, it's, it's just a rough statistical argument. But you're right, we're not going to be around. But, we, but at least we have the potential to have foresight enough to try and be around. And if we look at the right problems and think about them correctly and devote resources, we have a greater probability. Will we do that? Well, look at climate change. I mean, it's a, anyway, I don't know if you want to say anything uh, else. Yeah, yeah, I do, because I, it's, it's an interesting question because it speaks to one of the elements in the Drake equation, um, i.e. the longevity of civilizations. How long, how long is a civilization on the air, so to speak? And, and absolutely, we face a number of existential threats, um, the, the catastrophic impact of a, a comet or or asteroid, and I was actually one of the first members of a UK lobby group, group called Space Guard UK, which, which existed to lobby uh, and raise awareness on, on the, that very issue. And, and it is extremely important. It's, it's another very good example of when I use that phrase, low probability, high impact. That's the best I mean, example, yeah. low probability, high impact. Literally and, and, and metaphorically. And literally, literally, yeah, yeah, literally impact. Yeah. And, and yes, it is. Uh, the, I did not invent this saying. Uh, I, somebody um, came up with it, and, and you, you probably know it. Maybe it was you. Yeah. I'll uh, take uh, credit for it. Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> you, you can, well, you can at least tell me who it was if you know. Yeah. If, if somebody said, uh, uh, the ultimate tragedy would be if we, as the first generation aware of such a threat and able to do something about it, fell victim to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the longevity of a, a civilization is an important part of the Drake equation, and, and it's important for reasons of human survival. And I, I actually agree with Elon Musk on this. At the moment, we have all our eggs in one basket, and if we can do anything to uh, mitigate that risk by spreading out a bit, uh, let's do it. Because whether it's, whether it's comet or asteroid impact, 
whether it's nuclear war, uh, whether it's uh, some new uh, global pandemic, disease X, uh, but we, we yeah, face a lot. In the long run, I agree with Elon. In the short run, I certainly don't. I mean, it's ridiculous to send a group of people to die on Mars. But, <laughs> but although, you know, people want to do it. But um, uh, um, I, I was saying, I forget if I was saying to Jerry who was here, but early, I, if we're going to go on space missions, one-way missions to Mars are much more, are exponentially cheaper than round trips. Oh, and yeah. I, was, I was amazed when I wrote a piece for the Times maybe 15 years ago on about a one-way mission to Mars that I polled engineers and that I met. Everyone was willing to do it. I think that, that in the long term, it's absolutely right. Human civil, I do think the future of humanity in the long term, in, and I mean long term, is to, is to diversify. But it's right now, if you want to look at places to live, that li living at the bottom of the ocean, which is a lot easier to get to, is, is probably better than, living on, than imagining creating a group of people who are going to live and survive on the surface of Mars. In fact, I was just trying to explain to someone again, I can't remember the next thing to do. In the long term for the survival of humanity, it'd be much easier to move the Earth. And there's simple ways to move the Earth. So when the sun becomes a red giant, I can imagine moving the Earth out to the region of Mars. And, those, and the Earth is already habitable, so Mars isn't. But anyway, I think, I think um, the, hedging our bets, not hedging our bets in the long run is, is a good idea. But I think the idea that right now we have an urgent need to spend, to put people on Mars, other than for adventure. I have no problem with adventure. But humanity doesn't have an urgent need right now to put people on Mars. We have an urgent need to deal with some things like climate change and other things that we do have the technology to address. And sure, send some astronauts to Mars and have, have fun doing it. But it's not something that's going to globally, in the near term, and I mean in this century, affect our civilization in any, in any robust or useful way, except spend a lot of money. What? And, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but it's like, but the idea is like, it's, but moving the earth instead of doing other things is like sending a flying saucer instead of a one gram object. There's much, you can deal with global warming in ways that are much less intense than moving the earth. It's not a technology, the problem with global warming is not technology, it's politics. Okay, so, and that, and that may be a much harder problem to solve than it, it, it Anyway, and just one comment. I just, um, I was thinking. Hopefully, if there is intelligent life that comes visit us, they're not like the worst of us, because yeah, we'll really you know, be in trouble. You know. it, it is worth it, and that's why you know Stephen Hawking used to like to say things that get a lot of attention, but he he did raise the question: Should we let people let beings know of our existence? Because while I absolutely agree with you, you'd think that a civilization that's advanced enough would be more like Star Trek than 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 Terminator or something, and but. If you look at the history of human civilization, every time two cultures have interacted and one is much more advanced than the other, the original didn't last very long. So that may not be a universal rule. And if you're smart enough and a billion years old, and, that maybe, maybe you don't do that. But it is, certainly is worth thinking about. Yeah, and, and just a final postscript on that last comment. Um, yeah, I too hope they don't send the worst of them. But I think, like us, they, they will send people with the right stuff. So mm -hmm. I hope they send the best of them. Yeah, the, and, uh, and yeah, anyway. I'm, the explorers. Yeah. yeah, the explorers who, yeah, The absolutely. adventurers. Yeah. All right, uh, where's the microphone zone? Here it is. Uh, first question, I have two questions. One, what if, like, sound, yeah. what if what we receive, like, communication, like if they send out a communication, what if it's a distress call that we're too late to receive and we have to prepare for a warning? That's just far-fetched, like sci-fi. And the other is, am I not being picked up a microphone or? What do I think of what? Um, there we go. Cool. What do you, what do you think of if we get a, dis a distress call from like extraterrestrials or oh. other societies and we have to react to that? That's one. Like, what if they created a artificial intelligence or a machine that wiped them out that is spreading, like, uh, the Borg or something like that? Yeah, well, the, those are all interesting science fiction questions. Yeah, again, that's And, and, and that's the point, uh, obviously, not... as I think, I think Nick pointed out, but, I mean, if some civilization sent out a distress call, you're absolutely, it's absolutely true that it's already too late by the time mm -hmm. we've heard it, okay? 
Um, but the, the other thing, uh, I mean, like the Borg, I mean, the Borg are, to me, the most interesting alien species of civilization that assimilate other technologies. But, but the, ga the, you, the galaxy is a big place. Let me, let me, you're aware of the Fermi paradox, I assume. Yes. But, so the, one of the big things that Fermi asked when he argued there wasn't intelligent civilizations is if they are there, why haven't, we, why haven't they communicated with us? Because you could work out from the laws of physics that, it is, that if you could develop a reasonable, even, even not light speed, but even just at mere rocket ship rates in a 12 billion year old galaxy, and every time you arrived at a civilization, you sent out two more probes, and you, you could, he could imagine that you could basically more or less almost have probes throughout the galaxy. Why hasn't that happened? I think there are lots of arguments for why that easily would not happen. Yeah, but but the point is that it's just not likely that that it's it's just a big big galaxy, and so um, even something randomly moving around at 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 it's point out it's going to take seventy five thousand years to get to the nearest you know nearest star, and that's just in our neighborhood mm -hmm. of a few light years away, and the galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across, and so. Um, I mean, it's not, those are things that are possible, but I don't think are worth worrying about. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not probable. I, Do you have any? any uh, uh, no, I, I mean, just to reiterate that point, yeah, absolutely. If we got a distress signal from Proxima Centauri, when we got it, um, it's already four and a half years since they sent it. And, and obviously, if it's, if it's from the other side of the galaxy, uh, yeah, that civilization might have mm -hmm. gone extinct. By then, and, and that's that's an interesting point about the SETI program and and the possibility of picking up radio signals. Those might be signals from civilizations that aren't there anymore, and so it's just it's just kind of you know fingerprints in the sky, so to speak. Yeah, I mean that's why Star Trek invented warp drive because it's just it wouldn't make for a good episode for for you know Kirk to call back to Starfleet Command and get. And, and get a response 50,000 years later. It just the dramatic tension would go away. Exa exactly. Yeah. But uh, did you have a second question? Yes, I did. Um, second question is, why would, like, going along your lines of, it, why would they spend resources sending out objects when they could send microscopic probes and figure it out, just like research-wise? Why are we, how do I phrase this? Why are we still looking more so towards what if it's extraterrestrial and not what if it's like an, a remnant that we have that we made in a previous existence? Like let's say there was a intelligent species before us that went extinct from like a mass chaos event or something and they left remnants in the geological findings that we could use to learn from. There's no evidence for that. I know no, there's no evidence for that. I'm, I'm just so, saying. I mean, like, you're, what if is a fine thing to ask. But it, it's again, it's a what if. It's not really. But, but, you know, the you, you, point is, look under every. There's there, there's a famous story. If you're if you're, the scientists often say if you, if you're a, a, a drunk coming out of a bar and you lose your keys, where do you look? You look under the lamp lamppost. Why? Not because it's likely under the lamppost, but it's the only place you're going to find it. Okay. So mm -hmm. what scientists tend to do is always try and look under lampposts. Look at the things that are easiest to find and look for evidence of them. And, um, and uh, that's what we do, in, 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 given the yeah. resources at hand. And, um, but it is worth pointing out, and I've, I've, I don't know if I've written about it, but I certainly thought about it, that in a geological time scale, that almost everything disappears, right? There's subduction. So the, the, the surface continents of the Earth reformulate over, over periods of 100 million years or so. And so every, you know, e even after we destroy ourselves, all remnants of our existence on the surface of the Earth in the long run, even before the sun goes red giant, uh, is, are going to be erased. Yeah, anyway. it's all, all going to be erased. That's yeah. my point. Way erased. I mean, underneath yes. the... Uh, it's going to be underneath uh, yeah. and it's going to be reprocessed so there's and no, brought there's back not, up. There's so there's not going to be any evidence. evidence of that anyway. But bottom line is that... Yeah, no matter, you know, people like to think they're ancient civilizations that predate yeah, ours that have at, technology, at, no but evidence. But at the point, there's not going to be evidence anymore because either it was swallowed up or it's not in our record anymore. 
Anyway, 2001 was a neat idea, but it was yeah. a neat idea. Do you have... Also, no, I don't, I, I don't have yeah. anything on that. Uh, did you also write Physics of Star Wars? No, no. After the Physics of Star Trek, there were 100 books that came out. Okay, that yeah, because well. I have Physics of no, Star, Star Trek, Wars Physics of Star Wars. Star Wars doesn't have any much interesting science in it. Star yeah, Trek did, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Star, I have Physics of Star Trek, and that's why I came here, because I, I saw your name on the poster. I'm like, oh, I know the author. Yeah. Yeah. There's a physics of Doctor Who as well, right? Uh, yeah, there's, after, believe me, there's, there's a yeah. lot, yeah. All right, yeah. that's all. It, someone did want me to write the physics of Baywatch, which I thought would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How are you doing, guys? Um, my question is more geared towards Nick, but you both good, can answer. Good. Ask, ask Nick. I was kind of curious to talk about like, altruism. They would come to the planet. And um, what I find interesting about the way which you categorize aliens, is like, first of all, when we investigate like animals, we try to be incognito, right? We put things that look like them, that become indistinguishable to them from the environment. And I find a civilization that is billions of years old making such a kerfuffle and making us all see these objects that they're sending here just doesn't make any sense. And another thing that's interesting to me is how come every time throughout history, when we look at like these alien spacecrafts, they end up just mirroring the, either the artistic or art deco period of the time, whether it be the crashes at Roswell or War of the, War, War, War of the Worlds, or as we look at the newest alien movies with uh, the ginger lady, I don't remember her name, but it always seems to mirror the aesthetic period of the time, and that just doesn't seem to make sense to me, which is why it's like, it, does, it makes less sense to me that these things are actually alien in nature as opposed to just we see them and we imbue onto them our priors from Hollywood and society. I think that may be part of it. I mean, I think part of that get, gets into psychology and the idea that we can maybe only uh, describe things or that we tend to describe things in terms of things that we're familiar with. So we say, well, it was like an X. Um, if it's something new to us, because in a sense that's all we can say. I, so I think part of it is, is the idea of um, familiarity and, and such like. I, I mean, we can only have these sorts of speculative discussions from an anthropocentric point of view, and I mean, you know, in one sense that's, that's limiting because, because every time one gets into these sorts of discussions, you know, you, you get some people who say, well, if aliens come here, um, they would do this and they would do that, and, and we've only got the model of our own behaviors to go on. And, and the truth of it is, we don't really know what another civilization might think or what their agenda might be. We can make some reasonable is ish assumptions, I guess, but they are just assumptions. I mean, if somebody comes here, you could say, are they an explorer? Uh, they might be, um, but they might be here as a, like, a, you know, to, to mine resources and, and such. I mean, I take your point about the, uh, the animals, though, and I think that's interesting. And, and uh, yeah, without getting all sort of prime directive, mm. Um, on, on you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, obviously, when, you, when we do wildlife documentaries, the best of those documentaries are where the animals aren't aware of our presence and um, you, you see them naturally. However, on occasion, you know, you, you might be interested from a scientific view point in how they respond to a particular stimulus and you might provide that stimulus. I mean, I think you can argue these things round and around, but it takes you to some interesting territory, for sure. Let, let me add one thing about that, because I think you hit a big point about the cultural nature of this. UFOs, now UAPs, are a cultural phenomenon. Carl Sagan talked about this in his, in his last book, the candle and the Science of the Candle in the Dark. I forget the... That was the subtitle. I forget what the main title was. Demon Haunted World? Demon Haunted World? What, what, was it Demon Haunted World? Yeah, Demon Haunted World. Science is a candle dark. But he, what he pointed out in talking about UFOs, which is really interesting, is, what a, is that every epoch has had its own version. In the 19th century, it was fairies. It was, it, it, you know, people would see them in, in flower, little, little fairy, you know, these little things that look like Kinkerbell. And, and every, and, and, and once some people saw it, a lot of people saw it. And it's kind of amazing that no one in the 19th century saw aliens with big heads that happened to be almost look exactly like the things that the first drawings of aliens that always seem to be seen again and again. And, and so it's, 
if, again, if you're an anthropologist, you might argue that there's as much evidence that UFOs are a product of our culture, or as Feynman said, a product of the known irrationality of humans rather than the unknown rationality of aliens. Each different era has had their own version of aliens. But it's kind of weird that, they, that, that, you know, that now all the reports, and there's incredible fascination, well, they're societal fads. And, I'm, and it, all the evidence that I can see is that the current fascination with UFOs is a societal fad. That's Thank you, guys. Anyway. Just time for three quick ones, guys. Three quick ones. Good evening. Hopefully hey. this will be quick. Um, hey, Kevin. I think, Dr. Kraus, you've uh, spoken about this in some of your previous podcasts about uh, the dark force uh, theory. Have either, have, are either of you familiar with that? The dark force theory, you mean dark energy? No, dark force where such that, um, and, and there was a Chinese uh, uh, science fiction writer called uh, Sichin Liu, I think is, that's his name. He created a, a really popular trilogy, I highly encourage everyone to read it, uh, called Supernova Era. One of the books was uh, The Dark Forest, where it talks about um, the philosophy where if, say, our planet sends out a signal for another entity to, to receive, that alien or other galaxy entity, whatever, um, wouldn't want to be discovered. And you talk about altruism where such that other, other species might not want to be discovered for fear that if we, mm -hmm. we might want to annihilate them. Well, so that's what the, so, they, so, they're gonna, so they're going to annihilate yeah. us first. That's the dark forest. He or she, whatever, it who, who discovers the signal is going to strike first. So. How would you, what would you say to that where our signals, maybe they go through some type of alien relay station or something and they get discovered, we would be annihilated because we would be considered a threat to whoever discovered us? Well, I think, you know, it, I can imagine people saying that, but we're not a threat. We can't, we're stuck here. We're essentially infinitely far away from any other civilization. We're, if you list the threats, uh, again, if you're, an, if you're a military assessor and you list the possible threats, the likelihood that Earth is a threat to another alien civilization or vice versa, is so far down the list that you'd better deal with the real threats first. But so their I philosophy think might be strike first and yeah. ask questions later. Let, let, me, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll quote Seth Shostak on, on mm -hmm. this from SETI. I mean, he, he said, look, we've been a communicable civilization uh, a detectable civilization for decades, <laughs> and, and um, he said any civilization capable of threatening us is already aware of us, so this whole idea that we shouldn't be sending signals into space, it's too late anyway. Right. But yeah, we, we both know dark forest theory, and um, it's, it's one of the, I guess it's one of the many solutions to the Fermi paradox. Y yeah, that you don't want to be, it's not, generally I would think not so much not wanting to be discovered, but not feeling it's necessary to communicate. But that does, I wanted to come on the one thing you said. I think it's true that a lot of good nature theories have, series have people, you know, sitting in blinds. But if you actually look at the best science that's been involved in understanding how other species work, it's actually it, 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 interacting with them and, right. and, 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 and actually experimenting and testing. And really, that's how we've learned about how biology, right. not just watching, but actually manipulating and doing experiments rather than just observations. Because experiments are generally better than observation. Right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah. One uh, clarification question on um, that amazing fact about the uh, light bulb on Pluto. Is that a literal light bulb on Pluto with all the background of the reflected sunlight, or is it basically an isolated light bulb at the distance of Pluto? Because I would think one is much easier to see than the other, and then basically related to that, what are the limits um, of distance where we could, with our best radio telescopes, detect um, an Earth-like planet using mid-20th century radio technology? Um, yeah, what is the best distance, provided that they're not sending out any signals in a directed manner, just sort of yeah, so it's prop going, yeah. fall, the intensity is falling off as one yeah, of the, a, a, square. Mm -hmm. a square of the distance. Well, of course, it depends a lot on the intensity of the signals, and people have, have done that. And, and let me talk about the light bulb first. The, of course, as you point out, it's a vague statement. It depends what frequency range 
you're emitting in, if you're emitting 100, what, if you're emitting 100 watts of energy in a limited frequency range on Pluto, we could detect it over, over background easily. We could have with the Arecibo radio telescope when it was existing, no problem. So that's the, and it is amazing to think how sensitive radio telescopes are. The largest one now, now that Arecibo is gone, is one in China. Um, and so detecting electromagnetic signals is unbelievably efficient, right? We can see photons, single photons from the stars at 12 billion light years away, or more, actually more than 12 billion light years away, but light that was emitted 12 billion years ago. Now, when you say what what's the limit of detectability, you have to ask what is the signal you're looking for. Mm -hmm. okay. We can probably detect spectral signatures of, of the atmosphere of planets to look for biosignatures in, in, in a, a region at least maybe a quarter of a, a thousand light years mm -hmm. around us, maybe less, I don't know but the exact number. Give us we could detect extreme less, signals in other galaxies. Yeah, that, that would give us less indication of intelligent life, but detecting sort of radio it, waves, radio it signals. It depends, but the whole thing, it depends. Are you yeah. emitting a signal at a given frequency or not? And that's what I, I meant by that. And if you are, we have to find the frequency. I, I'm saying like imagining it's sort of a, a, an Earth twin with mid-20th century technology, uh, that sort of radio signal. You know, would we detect the Star Trek a, a, a signals from other, a, another system? Mm -hmm. I haven't done the exact calculation, but I would expect that with, with our telescopes now, with that kind of power output, would be of order 100, several hundred light years, is what I bet. And in that region, there may be, there may be 1,000 or 10,000 habitable planets. By habitable, I mean ones that may have liquid water on them. That doesn't guarantee habitability at all. And it's not even clear when we say habitable planets, and people should realize that because there's a lot of talk in the press about habitable planets. It's where people infer that there, there could be liquid water. But the Earth is a habitable planet, and at various times in its history, it's been frozen solid on the surface about 600 million years ago. So even we know so little that when people talk about habitable planets, you should, you should take that with a huge grain of salt. There may be no liquid water on the surface, and they may be uninhabitable for a huge number of reasons, primarily because most stars in our galaxy are much smaller than the sun. So the region, the region of habitability means the planet's much closer to the star. Fine. But the problem is those stars also have frequent outbursts that would likely vaporize water on the, uh, uh, on the planet. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that you have to assume if you're going to assume habitability. But yeah, we could probably accidentally detect, maybe, if we knew exactly what to look for. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard part, maybe, within 100 to 1,000 light years. And just before you take the last question, by how many orders of magnitude is, is the square kilometer array radio telescope going to improve things? Well, again, it depends on what... The, it, many orders of magnitude for the right frequency range, but the square kilometer array is, is looking at millimeter wavelength radiation designed to look at, at, at signals from the very early universe. Um, but um, once again, if, if, a, if a civilization were emitting in that range, you'd be able to detect it. Yeah, yeah, just like, um, but it'd have to be doing just right. Right. That's a good, it's a good point. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my main question was, we know that there's like many pressing issues here regarding climate change and global warming, and that is tangible. That is not something that we need to put any more research into knowing there's an issue about. Like we know that's an issue. And I was wondering if, do you believe that um, the environmental impact of space travel, that it, that it um, causes um, ca carbon emissions, do you think that that is worth it considering the benefits that we could get from space travel? Like, do you think that there are diminishing returns that come from um, the dangers of worsening t climate change that we are dealing with right now with space travel? I, I don't think that's the key issue, frankly. And, I mean, I remember back in the, before you were born in the days of Apollo, people saying, how, there's so many problems here on Earth why, why should we be spending billions of dollars going to the moon? Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and people have said that up in my own field, originally particle physics. Yeah. Why spend $10 billion on an accelerator when we have all these other pressing issues? If it was an either-or case, 
I would say it is, but it isn't an either or case. Yeah. $10 billion is probably the, the Xerox costs of the Department of Defense, okay? And, and it, it's just a drop in the bucket. It's not real money. In terms of the, it's true that, that sending rockets up has an environmental cost. Mm -hmm. But I think in the grand scheme of things in terms of climate change, that that, that is not a, that is not having, that stopping the space program would not have a significant effect. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the space program is, is, is imp important for learning about science. The space program not involving humans, most of the space program, pretty well all the important science that we get from NASA doesn't involve human exploration mm -hmm. of space. We haven't learned bupkis from the human exploration of space except how to keep humans alive in space. The important, the, you, can, you could send a, a rover to Mars for the same cost as making a movie about sending Bruce Willis to Mars. Yeah, okay. I, I, like, and so, I completely agree. But, but, you know, it is true that, you know, I just saw an article, maybe you did too, that, that yeah, Elon Musk, you know, hit the, the SpaceX program is, is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of carbon emission there, but yeah. I think, and the comparison of, of the global carbon emissions is not the first thing you, you'd want to attack, in my opinion. Yeah, when it comes to the, um, you know, uh, economic costs of space travel, I completely agree that even entertaining the conversation that it it's too expensive, I think that's that's Nothing. ridiculous. I completely agree. But when it comes to that exact article, I was reading it. Um, that's what you know inspired me to ask my question. Um, plus, I'm a, a really big fan of yours, and I want to be able to tell my chemistry teacher like <laughs> yeah, on but Monday. you know one of the things that can be said uh, that's really important is that anytime you push technology, new technologies, you discover things that are useful in other ways. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not the real reason to justify it. But, the, but when we're talking about, it's, I, would not, I would not be surprised if out of the space program in one way or another, some technologies arise, especially, for example, the space program is important for doing Earth monitoring mm -hmm. to, to, to see what's happening for the weather and everything else. Yeah. And so I, I guess my favorite quote from this involves uh, uh, Robert Wilson, who was the first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, a particle accelerator. And when it was being built, the Congress, he testified before Congress, and they said, asked, will it help in the defense of the nation? And he said, no, but it'll help keep the nation worth defending. Yeah, it's and very inspiring indeed. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for the good question. All right, everyone, let's yeah. give a big round of applause to Lawrence Krauss and Nick Polk. Thank you Thank guys you. so that was much. Good. Was that, did, did yeah. you have fun? No, great. Okay. Yeah, that no, was good. We're gonna have to do this again. Um, uh, thanks to everyone who watched on YouTube. Please hit the like button before you guys head out. Everyone in the audience, we're going to head into the lobby. We do have to be out by uh, 10 p.m. tonight, but we do have posters that you can get signed if you would like to take a signed poster home. They're free of charge. And, uh, yeah, we'll do a bit of signing. We will be back February 16th in this exact venue, the same venue, and the event will be a debate between uh, Dinesh D'Souza and Alex O'Connor, formerly known as Cosmic Skeptic on YouTube, and they're going to be battling it out. The topic is, is the Bible true? And that'll be February 16th. That, that's going to be a hot event. So, yeah. <laughs> Lawrence just solved the debate in one second. No need to have it. Thank you all very much. Professor Krauss makes big ideas accessible. From early universe to general relativity, even though these subjects can sometimes leave us perplexed, he communicates in a way that's accessible. He also really knows how to piss off creationists.
please welcome to the Chan Center stage, Lawrence Krauss. That's, uh, it's been a pleasure, and I hope you all enjoyed the evening. Um, anyway, thank you. It's really nice to be here. It's such a beautiful night. If, if I were you, I'd be outside. But, uh, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, I tried to be, but they brought me back in so I could talk. Um, anyway, I, we'll have a, a fun night tonight, I hope. And I, I put this up for you to have something to read while I was being introduced. And um, it's one of uh, my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books now. A friend of mine, a filmmaker, Werner Herzog, introduced me to this book, and, and um, it's, it's called The Peregrine, and it's about uh, a peregrine, and, um, it, but it's a naturalist book, and you should, it's really a wonderful read, and, but the most important thing I, I got out of it was this quote, which says, the hardest thing of all to see it is, what, is what is really there, and that's really more or less the moral, if you want, of what I'm going to talk about tonight. The universe we, we experience in, in many ways is an illusion. And the story of, of going underneath that illusion, the surface reality, to understand what the universe is really like underneath is, in my opinion, the greatest story ever told so far, as you'll see. Now, if I'm going to tell a story, I should begin with by copying other storytellers. So I begin with, it's the best of times. And, and by that, I mean that the Large Hadron Collider is operating and has not yet created a black hole that's destroyed the world. And, but it's also the worst of times, in many ways, and, uh, well, let's forget him for a second, but, um, <laughs> the, the, where I come from, this is the worst of times, and, um, and, and it is bad, and, and, but the great thing about talking about science, either the universe or at the fundamental scales, is that it takes us away from our petty, myopic concerns, and, uh, and, and that's what I want to talk about, in fact, how myopic we really are to think that this guy matters or that we matter in a sense and, and that this too shall pass and we too shall pass and the universe won't really care either way. Uh, but to, to describe that, this is an image that, that I want to come back to periodically. And, um, it's it's, uh, it's ice, ice crystals on a window in the wintertime. I, I gave a talk on this in, in, uh, in my hometown in, 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 down in Arizona and I had to explain that these were ice crystals, but, uh, but so let's say you're looking at a beautiful winter morning and, and it's early and it's still cold and there are these crystals on the, on, on the window, and, um, but uh, what I want you to do first is imagine what it would be like to live, evolve, and have a civilization that, 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 that emerges on one of these crystals, so pick one, anyone, say this one here, okay? What would, what would happen on the, to that civilization? Well, first of all, there'd be one direction which would be very, very special, that direction there. Because the forces would be different in that direction and in that direction, and physicists would develop laws of physics that would describe the forces in this direction versus that direction and how they were different. Um, religions would emerge and explain why that direction was, was set, ordained by God to be very special. There'd be wars fought over whether it was that direction or that direction. And, and all of that would happen, and of course it would assume some significance that isn't really there. And what I want to explain to you is how the, the universe that we see that seems so, in many ways, finely tuned to our existence, for many people, endows our existence with a significance that, it, that also isn't really there. And uh, um, the, the physicists might, at some point on this, on this uh, crystal, come to the realization that, that this is an accident. This is an accident of their circumstances, and not crystals in other directions conform to. And what's amazing is that we've gotten to that point here, as I'll describe. But it's a long story, although it'll, it'll actually seem extremely long by the time I'm finished, I'm sure. But um, I want to go back to, in fact, the first person who really talked about our universe as an illusion of reality, and that's this guy here. I often ask, who is this guy? And, and, uh, and people say Aristotle, because he had a better press agent than Plato. But that's Plato. And uh, I, I, I actually... Um, I, I, Plato impressed himself upon me. I, I, um, I grew up in Canada, actually, and that's why I was educated. And, uh, and, and, um, and, but, and, I, and I thought I was forced to read Plato in high school, 
and I read The Republic, and one of the parts of The Republic that, that really hit me at the time, and since then I've thought about it a lot more, is the, is the allegory of the cave. Um, Plato likened our existence to people who were chained in a cave to look at the back wall of the cave and see only shadows of reality. This is actually, I got this from my high school textbook, uh, which I found, which shows how old I am because it's no longer copyrighted. But uh, uh, so this is, this, this is the walls of the cave and they imagine people being shaved, chained and only being able to see the walls and see the shadows of real things like people walking on a roadway behind them lit by a fire. And in fact, the real outside was here. The sunlight was up here. And they, they would be changed and looked at the walls of that cave, and that would be their reality, just the shadows of reality. And he said the job of the philosopher, mathematician, whatever you want to call it, was to infer from the shadows the true nature of the reality behind. And that was the job. And he also said, you know, if, if, uh, if, you, if, if that person was, or anyone, was dragged out from behind the, this out to the sunlight here, the first thing would happen would be incredibly painful. And then it would sort of be incomprehensible. But after a while, your eyes would adjust and you'd see the outside. You wouldn't want to go back because you'd see the true nature of reality. And if you did go back and talk to these people about what real, the real world was really like, they, they, you'd sound crazy to them. And as a physicist, a particle physicist, I, I know exactly what that sounds like because we have, we've gone so far away from the reality we experience in our studies right now, that when we talk about it, it sounds r often ridiculous. And to get there is a, long, is a series of steps, and I want to take you through those steps. Um, so this is, uh, one of, by the way, this is, everything is, uh, is cultural in a way, and this, is, this picture is cultural. It, it, it's characteristic of the time. So this book was from the 1950s, clearly, because you notice the people that are chained here are scantily clad women, which is not historically accurate. Um, it had, it, if it had been Plato's time, they would have been little boys. And uh, but it, anyway, that one was cool. Um, but okay, but for these people, the reality would be different than the reality we experience. For example, the concept of length would have no meaning to them. They would see objects change length regularly. For example, they one day they would see, the, say, the shadow of a plastic ruler on their wall look like that, and then later on in the day, it would look like that. And they say, okay, objects change their length regularly. So length has no meaning. But then the philosopher, mathematician, natural scientist might look at that and say, no, 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 no. I actually realize that, that in fact length has a meaning. But we're seeing the two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional world. And, what we're, and these projections are different projections of the same object, which in three dimensions has a well-defined length. So looking at it from above, if you look at, if the ruler is parallel, if I was tall enough, I could stand and do the shadow myself. But if the ruler is parallel, it, it produces a uh, shadow that that's long, but it, that's that long. But if I, if I rotate the ruler in the direction perpendicular to the wall, then the light rays come here, and you see a projection of the ruler, which is smaller. And so the mathematician would say, really, in the underlying three-dimensional world, length has a meaning. But the world is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. And people would have a hard time understanding that because everything in their life would have been an experience of two dimensions. And just talking about three dimensions would have, would have been difficult. And certainly people couldn't visualize it. You could describe it mathematically. But this would have the hallmark of all the great developments in, in physics, at least, and for the most part in science, that when, whenever a great discovery is made, things that on the surface seem very different are then shown to be different manifestations of precisely the same thing. And so this would be an example. This person would show these two different lengths were really different manifestations of a single length. And that would be great progress, great discovery, and these people would discover that the world is three-dimensional. Well, let me jump ahead now by a bunch of centuries to the, to, to the people who first allowed us to see the current shadows of reality. And this is one of my favorite physicists of all time, Michael Faraday the greatest experimental physicist of the 19th century. He, um, he was an amazing guy in many ways. He, he had no formal education. He was trained as a bookbinder's apprentice. And, uh, and he, um, he created a precedent that I try and tell all my students about, in fact, he, um, which is to, to suck up to your professors. Um, so he, he went to the lectures of Humphrey Davy, who was the director of the Royal Institution at the time, 
and he attended the lectures and wrote down beautiful lecture notes and then bound them in a beautiful volume which he then presented to Humphrey Davy and, and then said, can I be your assistant? And he, and he knew about academic ego even then. And, and, and Humphrey Davy made him his assistant and eventually Faraday rose to become director of the Royal Institution and indeed the greatest experimental physicist of his time and he changed everything. He created the modern world we live in in many ways by his experimental discoveries. Discoveries associated with electricity and magnetism. And it was forefront science at the time. It didn't seem to be useful in any way. And there's a many apocryphal stories about that. One of my favorites, which is probably apocryphal, is involves Gladstone, say, coming in with the prime minister, coming into the laboratory and seeing jumping frogs and wheels and other things, and saying, what use is any of this? Something, again, that I hear a lot. And, and, he, and he's reputed to have said several things, but my favorite response was he said, what use is this? Why, one day you'll tax us for it. And, and, if, and he was right. So he discovered the laws of electricity and magnetism that make modern civilization possible, that make basically everything that's going to happen tonight possible. Now, Faraday had no formal education and certainly no mathematical training, and he said he only wrote down one equation in his entire life. And so he, he thought in pictures as a mental crutch to himself. And he tried to understand, he tried to actually answer a question that Newton had tried to th had thought about in the context of gravity and never answered. But the idea was when two, elect two electric charges are here and they repel each other, how does this charge know where this charge is to be repelled by? How, how do you know that? And, and Faraday came up with a, with a mental picture that helped him think about that. He said, Let's, around every charge, let me imagine these things, these lines going out to infinity. I'll call them electric field lines. And then the number of field lines will be proportional to the magnitude of the charge. And I can know where, what will happen when I put a charge here because it will be pushed in the direction of the field line. So if I, if I put a charge here, it will be propelled in that direction. If I put it there, it will be propelled in that direction. And the magnitude of the force will be proportional to how many field lines are in the vicinity. So here there are a lot more field lines than there are here, so the force will be a lot greater. And it turns out this not only was a good analogy, it was an exact mathematical analogy. It exactly reproduces the electric force between two charges, just this mental crutch. And it's even better if you have many charges, two charges, and just the fact that field lines can't cross, so they kind of get repelled by each other. You can imagine something that looks like this. And then, again, here, if I put a positive charge here, it'd be repelled. If I put one there, it'd be repelled that direction. If I put it right here, it'd be repelled, but with twice the magnitude of here, because there are twice as many field lines. And again, it's exact. It reproduces the algebra exactly, allowing him to get a picture of that electric force. And that was great. Now, that's not what, what Faraday is known for. He's known instead for a discovery he made by accident. Up to that point, it was known that electricity and magnetism, two different forces, had some connection between them, clearly. And it had been discovered earlier in the century by uh, physicists in France that if I had an electric charge and I moved it in a current, then it would produce a magnet. And many of you have played with electromagnets. You have a current loop in it, and it creates a magnetic field. You make a magnet. So clearly, a moving charge could create a magnetic field. The question was, could a magnetic field produce a force in any way on a charge that's just sitting there? Could, could it produce an electric force? Could magnets in any way produce an electric force? If clearly, electric charges can produce a magnetic force, could magnets produce an electric force? And people tried, and Faraday tried. They put magnets near charges, and nothing happened. But one day, he was in his laboratory, and he had two current loops ready. And he had a, what is essentially a battery connected to one, and he closed the circuit, and a current started flowing in that current loop. And when that current started to flow, he noticed a current flowing in this loop. Spontaneously, just started, and then stopped. And then when he turned the current off here, a current flowed again. And what he discovered by accident was that a changing magnetic field, because when the current starts to form here, the magnetic field starts at zero and gets bigger, a changing magnetic field produces an electric field, a, f a force on a charge. And that changed everything. It created modern civilization. It's the reason we have electric power now, because what you do nowadays, in, in where I grew up in that part of Canada, where Niagara Falls, uh, the, the, you have a little current loop and you put it in a, around a turbine that rotates and there are magnets there and a rotating current loop sees a changing magnetic field so a current 
goes in the loop, and that produces the power that lights up the cities around it. And it's the same thing here, whether you're powered by coal or nuclear or whatever, or tar sands. Ick. Anyway, uh, so indeed, we get taxed for it, because it was his Matt Faraday's law of induction that produced, made possible all of modern civilization. Okay, great. And he discovered this new relationship between electricity and magnetism. But the first person to really explain that relationship was not Faraday. It was the greatest theoretical physicist of the 19th century, James Clerk Maxwell, who was also who was an amazing guy in his own way. He was brilliant, a, pro a child prodigy, in fact. And uh, his story is kind of interesting, too, because um, he's Scottish. And he, um, he had already explained things even as a young man, like, in fact, the, the rings of Saturn, why they might be stable. And um, he had a professorship in, in Glasgow. And there was a university, the university was in, merged with another university. And they could only have one professor of physics, so who did they get rid of? Well, they got rid of Maxwell and kept the guy we don't know anymore. And, um, and that's typical of academic administration. And, um, and then the same thing happened to him in Edinburgh. And he eventually got sort of exiled down to Cambridge, where he developed he codified mathematically and extended the results of Faraday to demonstrate something absolutely remarkable. That in fact, electricity and magnetism were the same thing. That one person's electricity is another person's magnetism. And by fixing up the mathematics that Faraday had discovered, he generated four equations, which physics students proudly wear on their t-shirts. It's the four Maxwell's equations, and underneath it says, let there be light. Because Unlike the Bible, that really explains why there's light. And, and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and four Maxwell's equations not only said let there be light, but made this beautiful connection between electricity and magnetism and showed that they're really the same thing. That's what's interesting. Now, the implication of that is to say is let there be light. And why is that? Well, the, most, the best calculation you can do as an undergraduate in physics, in my opinion, is the calculation that Maxwell did. What he showed with his four equations, when you write them down properly, is that if you take in a laboratory and measure the strength of the electric force between two charges in the laboratory, and you come over here, and you measure the strength of the magnetic force between two magnets, and those two numbers, and you plug them into Maxwell's equations, you will demonstrate something interesting. He demonstrated that if I take a charge and start shaking it, what happens? Well, I, I have a current, that, okay, and that current will produce a magnetic field here. But if I move it back and forth, the current, the magnetic field will be changing. But that changing magnetic field will produce an electric field here. But that electric field here will be changing, so that'll produce a magnetic field. The magnetic field will be changing, that'll produce an electric field, magnetic field. And what I'll do when I shake a charge is I'll produce a disturbance in those electric and magnetic fields. And if I measure the strength of the force between two electric charges and the strength of the force between two magnets, and I plug them in the equations, I can actually calculate the speed of that disturbance from fundamental principles. And what did he discover when he calculated the speed of that disturbance? It was the speed that light had been measured to have. And he discovered that light was an electromagnetic wave, a wave of disturbance in electric and magnetic fields. So that unification, which was the greatest unification of the 19th century, showing that two distinct forces in nature, electricity and magnetism, were really the same force, which we now call electromagnetism, had an implication, and the implication was light is an electromagnetic wave. And when you think about it, it's remarkable, because those figments of Faraday's imagination, those fields that he invented as mental crutches just to help him understand things, were real. They were as real as the hand in front of your face, because if it weren't for them, you wouldn't see the hand in front of your face, because it's light. So it's amazing that, that these things that we think of in our minds, and often just help us with pictures, sometimes, not always, have an underlying reality that we would never have expected. But again, it's the hallmark of a great development, the greatest development of the 19th century, the unification of electricity and magnetism, that often it makes remarkable predictions, in this case, resolving a problem that had been around since well before Newton. What was light? And now we know light is an electromagnetic wave. I, in fact, I, I think I have this picture of, electric, of, of light as an electromagnetic wave, in case you needed it moving along. And that was the first great unification of the modern era. But that made possible something else. 
and due to this guy here. And you all recognize this guy. Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein wouldn't have been Albert Einstein. Well, he would have been Albert Einstein, but he wouldn't know who he was if it hadn't been for Maxwell and Faraday. And, you know, I get a lot of mail, email every day. Happily email now, because it's easier to delete. Um, <laughs> I get a lot of letters, and, 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 and they, they start like this. Everything you think you know is wrong. Okay. And half of them are about my politics, and then the other half are about science. And they say, and, then, and this is always, almost always the case, and, and they, you check the logic in this, okay? They say, everyone thought Einstein was crazy. Everyone thinks I'm crazy. Therefore, okay. Anyway, and now I know to hit delete when I read that part. Because they actually don't understand one of the most important things about science. They get it wrong. The, con the wisdom, conventional wisdom is that developments in science do away with everything that went before them. And that's, by the way, one of the people say, well, why should I bother learning science now? Because everything we think is true today, tomorrow will be proved to be wrong, so why bother learning it? Okay? And that's exactly wrong. That's exactly how science doesn't work. What satisfies the test of experiment today will always satisfy the test of experiment. It will always be true for the things that it works on. Newton's law of gravity it has been supplanted at the extremes of scale by general relativity and small scales by quantum mechanics, but to describe the motion of baseballs or hockey pucks or whatever you want, depending on what country you're in, Newton's laws will describe them exactly. And no matter what we discover about quantum gravity in the future, if I take a ball here and let it go, it's not going to fall up, and its motion will be described by Newton's laws. So whenever we describe, discover new laws of nature, they have to agree with what has already satisfied the test of experiment. That's immutable. Because if it works, it'll, in, to understand experiments now, it'll always work to understand experiments. And Einstein's, the greatness of Einstein was not that he threw out everything that went before him, but rather that he showed the two things that were inconsistent with each other, but were both the basis of modern physics, and which had both satisfied the test of experiment, and therefore each individually had to be true, but were both inconsistent, he figured out a way to make them consistent. He didn't throw them out. Now, what were the two things that, that were the basis of modern physics? The first was from Galileo 400 years earlier. Galileo discovered that you can't tell if you're moving at a constant velocity. There's no experiment you can do that will tell you that you're moving if you're moving at a constant velocity. If, you're, if, you, um, if, you, if you get on a subway train it's pop, or a train, if, you, if you've been in a train station and, and you look up and then you suddenly see the train next to you start to move for a second, until you either feel the shaking or don't feel the shaking, you don't know whether you're moving or they're moving. Okay? And if there was no shaking, you, there's no experiment you could do that would tell you that you were moving or they were moving. There's just no way you can tell you're moving. If you're in a, I flew up here yesterday, if you're in a plane and the, win, and the windows or shades are down and it's not shaking, if I throw up a ball, it behaves exactly as it would if I were here. And you feel like you're standing still, depending upon how much coffee you had beforehand, but we're not. We're moving around the sun at 30 kilometers per second right now. We're zooming. And our sun is moving around the galaxy at 200 kilometers per second right now. So we're moving very fast, but we act as if we're not because there's no way we can know we're moving as long as, as, long as we're moving at a constant speed in a constant direction. Okay? That was Galileo, and that was the basis. Really, that development was the key thing that led to modern physics. Okay. One second. The other one is Maxwell. Maxwell discovered if I measure the strength of the electric force between two charges, measure the strength of the magnetic force between two, two magnets, boom, I determine what the speed of light is. Those two things are inconsistent with each other. Okay? Now, it may not seem like they're inconsistent. That was part of, Mac, of Einstein's, you know, brains. Because he, he, he realized when he was 16 that they were inconsistent. And he, and he started to think about it. And so I thought of a lot of ways to try and explain this, but um, I first started to think about this when my, when my daughter was very young. So I, I, I come to explain it in terms of projectile vomit. So let's say I'm, I, was, I used to drive my daughter to nursery school when she was young, and I would uh, 
I'd be driving her, and, uh, and let's say I was driving, you know, I'll have to change it into kilometers, let's say at 30 kilometers per hour, um, uh, you know, nice safe speed near the school. And so I'd be driving, she did not like driving back then, she loves it now, but she did not, she was not comfortable. So I'd be driving, and let's say she projectile vomits from the back seat, hitting me in the back of the head in the front seat, okay? Good. Now let's say someone here on the ground is watching, and they're laughing, <laughs> and they see the projectile vomit. So the projectile vomit, let's say, hits me in the, when I'm in the car, hit, it's going from the back seat to the front seat at, say, 15 kilometers per hour, okay? And I'm driving along at 30 kilometers per hour. So in the back seat to the front seat, 15 kilometers per hour. But someone over here is watching, and they see the car zoom, moving away at 30 kilometers per hour, and then they see the projectile vomit go from the back seat to the front seat in the car at 15 kilometers per hour in the car. So relative to the person on the ground, the projectile vomit is moving at 45. What an amazing audience. 45 kilometers per hour. It's great. You know, I, I, <laughs> I was in New York, and I was trying to explain this to my publishers. I gave them a lecture, and I asked that, no one answered. And it's because they all went to Yale. And, and uh, <laughs> I used to teach there, so I know. But anyway. Um, Okay, good. Now, let's say my daughter is a 21st century child, and she has um, a laser beam. So she shoots a laser beam, and it hits me in the back of the head, okay? So the car's moving along 30 kilometers per hour. The laser beam is traveling at the speed of light from the back seat to the front seat, hits me in the head. Person on the ground sees the car moving at 30 kilometers per hour, and then sees the laser beam at the speed of light in the car, so the person on the ground sees the laser going at the speed of light in the car plus 30 kilometers per hour, right? Of course not right, because it's been banged into your head. But why not right? You see, though, unfortunately, the way we teach in schools is that Einstein said, as if it's the Bible, as if it really matters, Einstein was driven to the realization that there's something wrong with that picture, that what seemed to be true for the projectile vomit cannot be true for light. And it's because it's inconsistent with Galileo. Because Galileo says, there's no experiment I can do on the ground or in the car that tells me one of us is moving. So if I measure the speed of the light ray to be the speed of light here in the car, but I measure it to be the speed of light that's 30 kilometers per hour, there's a problem. Because Maxwell <laughs> said, I determine the speed of light by measuring the strength of the force between two electric charges and between two magnets, I can measure that strength, those two things, I determine the speed of light. But if the person on the ground measures the speed of light to be different, then that must mean the strength of the force between two charges in their laboratory and between two magnets in their laboratory must be different than it would be for the person in the car. Because Maxwell told me what the speed of light is. It's based on those two quantities. But the person on the ground can't measure the forces to be different than the person in the car, because if they did, they would know that they were standing still and the person in the car was moving. But there's no experiment you can do that tells you who's moving. So therefore, the two observers must see exactly the same thing, because the laws of electricity and magnetism tell you what the speed of light is. And that's what Einstein realized. The only way to resolve this paradox is somehow if these two observers measure the speed of light to be exactly the same relative to them, even though the laser is moving in the car. And that's why he was driven to that result, which gets drummed into people's, you know, in physics classes. And how could that be? How could it be that those two things are the same? It defies common sense. How could you make it happen? Well, he said, well, look, let's, what, is, what is speed? Speed is distance traveled in a given time. Okay, so the only way the two observers could measure the same speed, even though the object was moving well, relative to one of them, is if each observer measures distance and time differently. That if distance and time are relative and observer dependent, and two observers in relative motion will measure distances and times differently. So Einstein realized the only way to make Maxwell and Galileo consistent was if that's the case. Not to throw them out, but to realize that rather the notions of space and time that we held so dear, myopically, were different. Space and time were an absolute. And, and, and the implications of this, there's three implications. One is that lengths contract. If I'm 
running across this stage very, very fast, say this is 10 centimeters across for me, if I'm running very fast, with respect to you, you'll measure it, it'll be, say, four centimeters. And now people often get the idea that it's an illusion, that you're, you're perceiving it to be four centimeters. It's not. For you, it is four centimeters. Because every measurement you could ever make of this ruler shows us four centimeters. And what is length other than something you measure? So it is 10 centimeters for me and four centimeters for you. It is both at the same time. We're both right. And it's not neither of us, well, both, either neither of us or both of us have an illusion because length is something we measure and therefore the reality of what we see depends upon what we measure. The next implication of that is that things that are simultaneous for me are not simultaneous for you. That means if lightning strikes at either end of the stage at the same time for me, if you're running with respect to me, you will see one event happen before the other. And the last implication is the one that's most used in science fiction is time dilates. If I'm running very fast with respect to you, my clock ticks at a slower rate than yours, as far as you can see. And this is, of course, the basis of much of science fiction, good science fiction and bad science fiction, often in the same show. And uh, it's not science fiction. We measure it every day in undergraduate physics laboratories here, UBC, and everywhere around the world. In fact, we use it in. The very fact that many of you are having cosmic rays go right through your body right now as I speak could only happen because of, of, of the fact that objects moving very fast have clocks that are ticking slowly. And I don't think I'll explain that. We'll leave that for the question three. But, but it's true. So it, it, it happens every day, and we depend upon it. Okay, great. Those, the importance of Einstein's claim was not only did he deduce that this is the only way to make things consistent, but that would not be good enough. Einstein saying it's the case would not be good enough is he made predictions. That's what turns it into science. And at the time he did it, none of the predictions had been tested, but of course we test them all now and they all work. But I prepared your minds for this because this is the same image I showed you for the walls of the cave. And with hindsight, it's kind of remarkable that Einstein didn't think of this, but his math professor, Herman Minkowski, three years later, realized that the implication of relativity was something far more profound. And in a paper he wrote in 1908, he, um, he said, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Because what he realized is this fact that length is different for different observers really represents the fact that we don't live in a three-dimensional universe, we live in a four-dimensional universe. A four-dimensional universe with three dimensions of space and one dimension of time that are tied together. And when I'm running with respect to you, what I'm essentially seeing is a rotated three-dimensional slice of a four-dimensional universe. The, the, the mathematics is a little more complicated. But essentially, I'm seeing a rotated version of a four-dimensional space. Now, we don't, the reason this seems so strange to us is we, is the speed of light is so fast. We often think, we don't realize we're actually seeing even three-dimensional images. Say, I, I take a picture of everyone here right now. I take a picture, boom. I see a two-dimensional image of everyone in the room. But it's not a two-dimensional image. It's a three-dimensional image. Because the light from the people in the back of the room left their faces before the light from the people in the front of the room. It seems like it's an instant because light travels so fast, but it's not an instant. It's spread out in time as well as being spread out in space. And when I'm running with respect to you, in some sense, what I'm observing in my universe is a rotated version. Rotated meaning a little, it's a little more complicated mathematically, but it's essentially a rotated version of that four-dimensional space. And in that case, one person's space becomes another person's time. The rod here seems shorter, but remember, because of the fact that things aren't simultaneous, a clock here and a clock there are slightly out of sync for you. One ticks a little bit earlier than the other. Because for you, events for me that are simultaneous are not simultaneous for you. So the object is shorter in space, but it's spread out in time. And just like when I rotate an object, the x component is, is, is shortened, but the y component is stretched. In this case, Objects are shorter in space, but spread out in time. And if you work it out, there's a four-dimensional length 
called the space-time length, that's unambiguous, that's universal, that's constant, that's absolute. Einstein's theory of relativity should have been called the theory of absolutes. Because there is, indeed, a four-dimensional length, and it has meaning. But we, myopic beings, tied to the walls of the cave, see these three-dimensional shadows of a four-dimensional reality. And that was the second great unification of the modern era. Space and time, which seem so different to us, are really different manifestations of precisely the same thing. OK, great. Now we move on beyond Einstein. And then this guy came along. And that's Richard Feynman, and, and I'm a big fan of I wrote a book about him. And he was one of the greatest physicists of the second half of the 20th century. And what he did was he realized, well, OK, so we had relativity. We had gravity from Newton. And relativity, the world seemed fine. And then, of course, in the early parts of the 20th century, we discovered quantum mechanics, and everything went out the window. Quantum mechanics is crazy. It describes the universe on small scales in a way that defies common sense. And what Feynman and several other people did, a host of other people did, was try and develop a quantum theory of electromagnetism. Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism was beautiful, but it didn't describe the world at small scales, where quantum mechanics reigns. And what, there are many interesting properties of quantum mechanics, but I'd say, I'd like to say quantum mechanics is, is kind of like um, Wall Street or corporate America. Okay? If you can't see it, anything goes. Okay? And we'll learn, I hope, more and more with congressional hearings in my country right now. But, and what it really means is that because of something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there are fundamental things you cannot know about, no matter how good your microscope. Okay? If I measure a system for only a little while, I can never determine the energy of that system exactly. There's always some uncertainty in, the, in, in your determination, for example. Now that changed the way we needed to think about electromagnetism. And Feynman developed a, a beautiful pictorial way of understanding the quantum theory of electromagnetism in something we now call Feynman diagrams. This is how we now think of the electric force between two charges. So one charge is here, the electron is here, another electron is there. And what happens is one electron emits this quantum of the electromagnetic field. Light is a wave, but it comes in a stream of particles, wave-like particles called photons. And this electron emits one of these wave-like particles, the photon, and it's absorbed by this electron, which gets repelled. Fine. Except this can't happen in the world we observe. Because an electron just sitting there cannot emit a photon. Because if an electron is just sitting there and emits a photon, and the photon carries away energy, where did the energy come from? There's still an electron there afterwards. So the energy isn't conserved. You can't, the electron just sitting there cannot emit a photon. But in the quantum world, if you can't see it, anything goes. So if, if this photon carries a small amount of energy, as long as it disappears in a time scale so short that I can't measure it was there, then it's OK. It's, it's, it's like embezzlement. Okay? It's OK to take the money out the night before and make money on it before the stock market opens as long as you get it back in in the morning. And that's the way it is in the, in the real world. So this photon, which you can't see, we call a virtual photon because it isn't really there. Then you could never do a measurement to see it. But, it. but that's the way we now think of electromagnetism. This electron emits a virtual photon. That virtual photon is absorbed by this electron before you could ever see it. And boom, it works. And in fact, it works so well that this is the best theory in nature. This is the best scientific theory we have. No theory competes with what this theory called quantum electrodynamics. You can make predictions based on first principles here and compare them with observations to 14 decimal places. There's no other place that that, that, that works. Okay? It's the best we got in nature. No theory competes. Now, there's another aspect of this theory that's very important. And that is the photon has no mass. Why? That is important because electromagnetism works across the universe. An electron here repels an electron in Alpha Centauri. The electric, the electric field goes out to infinity. That's only possible because the photon is massless. Because remember, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says 
If I measure this system for a little while, I only know the energy to a certain accuracy. But if the photon is massless, then it can carry an arbitrarily small amount of energy. I can emit a photon with an arbitrarily small amount of energy, and that photon can travel all the way from here to Alpha Centauri and still not violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle before being absorbed. If the particle here had mass, then it would carry, it would take a lot, because E equals mc squared, it would have a lot of energy, and it couldn't survive all the way there without violating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the fact that electromagnetism is long range is exactly equivalent in the quantum world to the fact that the particle that mediates the electric force is massless. Okay, everything works. We get the best theory in nature. We've got relativity, quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, gravity. Everything's okay. But then nature comes along again. And we find something absolutely crazy. First of all, there's a new particle in nature discovered in 1932, the neutron. But what's worse is the neutron is radioactive. I remember I learned this when I was a kid from a, a, an astronomer named Tommy Gold, who was a really amazing lecturer and got me excited about this. It should surprise you that the neutron is radioactive, because the neutron is made, all, your bodies are made of atoms and atomic nuclei, and the dominant particle in your body is, is a neutron. There are more neutrons in your body than protons or electrons. Okay? But if I take a neutron out here, and hold it out here, it will decay in about 10 minutes. Okay? Now, many of you will notice, somewhat painfully, that you've been here for more than 10 minutes, and you're still around. Some of you are praying for your neutrons to decay, perhaps. But they haven't. What gives? Well, a remarkable accident. Here's, here's a picture of a neutron. neutron a neutron decays into three particles. A proton, and this is just a fancy way of writing electron, and a neutrino, another neat particle. Now, the really surprising thing is that the neutron and the proton weigh almost exactly the same amount. The neutron is only heavier than the proton by one part in a thousand. So it, it has just slightly enough mass. The mass of the neutron is just slightly greater than the mass of the proton, the electron, and the neutrino. Because if it was less than the sum of those masses, it couldn't decay into those particles because energy would have to be conserved. So it only can decay barely because it, its mass is I, almost identical to the sum of those masses, which is why the neutron lasts 10 minutes, because in particle phys physics units, 10 minutes is a hell of a long time. This decay is called a weak decay because it happens so slowly. Okay? Now, what happens if I drop a nu neutron in a nucleus? If I drop a neutron in a nucleus, it gets bound in the nucleus. What does it mean to be bound? <laughs> Some of you know, but, um, uh, but what it means to be bound is that you lose energy, okay? You fall into a nucleus. It takes energy to get out of the nucleus. So you, the neutron loses energy when it falls in the nucleus. But when it loses energy, because of E equals mc squared, the neutron gets lighter. And in a nucleus, it's too light to decay into these particles. So you're only here because the neutron-proton mass difference is so small. Because the reason you're here is because heavy elements can exist, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, helium, all, all iron, all the rest of the periodic table would not be here if there were no neutrons. But the neutron is stable when it's inside of a nucleus because of that accident of our existence. It's just an accident that this, because of that, not only can stars form carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the rest, but they can, that those materials can survive in your bodies, and we can have this conversation, or rather monologue in this case. Okay, now, this was of some concern because clearly something new was around, because gravity couldn't cause such a decay, and electromagnetism couldn't cause such a decay, so there had to be a new force in nature. And if there's a new force, you have to try and describe it. The first person to give a theory for that force was this guy here, one of my favorite physicists of the 20th century, Enrico Fermi, who was the last sort of great nuclear slash particle physicist who was equally adept at theory and experiment. Now both fields are in those fields that the, the, the theory is sufficiently complicated and the experiments are sufficiently complicated that no one does both of them to rule. But he was able to do both of them. And he, in fact, um, um, he, he actually developed a theory of this um, and he submitted it to the journal Nature. And it got rejected, which gives heart to many of us who submitted things to nature and been rejected. 
And uh, but unlike many of us who might try and respond, he said, forget it. I don't want to do theory anymore. So we went ahead and did experiments after that, which was good for him, because the next experiment he did won him the Nobel Prize in physics, so it worked for him. But he, was, he did many things, including in the, in the Manhattan Project, he developed the first nuclear reactor as a precursor to development of the nuclear bomb. He developed that in a, the first chain, controlled chain reaction in a reactor built at the University of Chicago, actually out of the football field of the University of Chicago, which I always thought was a brilliant thing, because then if anything goes wrong, you just kill football players and it doesn't really matter. So, um, so anyway, he, he, uh, he went into that, but his, his model was sort of then, it was, an, it was an approximation to a theory, but other people worked on it, and the thing about, the other thing that's important about science is that it's like Hollywood. If, if it works, you just copy it. And if it works, you just keep copying it, like you know, Halloween 23 or whatever. It, you know. And so the idea is if we have the best theory in nature, let's copy it. So if there's a new force, let's try and make it look like this force, so we copy it. We draw a similar Feynman diagram, as we call it. And it's a little more complicated. The neutron's made of particles called quarks, but that doesn't really matter. It turns into a proton. And then you have an electron neutrino come out. And if this force is due to the exchange of a particle, maybe this force is due to the exchange of a particle. But the forces are very different. The weak force operates only inside of a nucleus. The electromagnetic force operates across the whole length of the universe. How can we explain that? Well, if this particle is very massive, you see, then that explains it. Because if it's very massive, as I said, E equals mc squared, it has a large mass, so when I emit it, I emit a huge amount of energy. But if I emit a huge amount of energy, the only way I can not violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the only way I won't know that I've emitted a large amount of energy, is if this particle decays very quickly. And if it does that, that means it can't travel very far. So if it's very massive, the force is very short range. So everything works, you see. We have a massless particle, long range, massive particle, short range, great. Well, the problem is, there's a problem. And that is that this theory is the best theory we have in nature. This theory is nonsense. <laughs> By nonsense, I mean, if you take the theory as it stands, with a massive particle there, you get infinite answers when you try and do the calculations. And physicists don't like infinities. Mathematicians love them, but physicists hate them. Because it means you can't predict anything, right? And this was a problem. And this was a problem that so concerned physicists in the 1960s that in fact a good number of them were willing to give up everything that was known up to that point. They said maybe the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity don't apply on the scale of the nucleus. Maybe we just have to give up this beautiful picture here, which works for atoms on the scale of nuclei. Maybe we'll have to think of a whole new framework for physics. Give up particles. There was a Zen-like uh, theory developed, of course, in Berkeley in the 60s, um, the sound of one particle clapping, basically. Uh, it, 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 it said that all particles were made of all other particles. And, and, and eventually that morphed into something called string theory, which was tried to explain things and failed miserably as it still has today in a different context. But, but people gave up on this beautiful picture. And the amazing thing, you know, when I wrote this story, uh, physicists, I'll tell you in a secret, physicists are people. And that means they're pig-headed, and they have biases, and they don't want to change their minds. And that's OK, because the science, the science overcomes that. The process of science, the skeptical questioning, the insistence on testing, empirical evidence, all of that overcomes and drags physicists kicking and screaming eventually to the right answer. But there are times, I, maybe when you read my book, if you read it, uh, when I was writing it, you just want to shake these people because they actually had the answer in the 60s. They just didn't know they had the answer because they were too busy thinking in a certain direction and there, hanging out here, was exactly the right answer and they just didn't see it. And the right answer came from a different area of physics, superconductivity. In 1911, this guy, Kamerling Onnes, a Dutch physicist, discovered if I took mercury and I cooled it down to four degrees above absolute zero, something very strange would happen. The resistance would go exactly to zero. Not become small, but go exactly to zero. And what does that mean? Well, if I take a, a, a loop of mercury wire when it's cold, I can turn, make it into wire, and I, and I 
connect it to a battery and I get a current going, and then I cool it down below four degrees and I take the battery away, the current will keep flowing. But it won't flow for just an hour or a day. It'll flow forever. It'll never stop. Because there's absolutely zero electrical resistance. And this is remarkable. And on, on, it's called a superconductivity, a good word for that. And it is a remarkable fact. It took, it, 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 it took 50 years for the proper theoretical understanding of this due to the complicated interactions of electrons and the lattice of, of mercury and other materials. And it was really one of the great developments of, of, of 20th century physics to explain superconductivity or that kind of superconductivity. But nowadays we have superconductors that are actually go superconducting at much higher temperatures. So we can actually do fun experiments in high school classes like this. You can, we have superconductors that will become superconducting at liquid, at, at, uh, at uh, liquid, uh, not liquid nitrogen, dry ice temperatures. And we put a superconductor in dry ice. And then if you take a magnet and put it near the superconductor, the magnet will float. It's a fun little experiment you can do. Some of you may have, have had it done for you in high school class or university. It's neat. Now, why is that? That's because in a superconductor, the superconductor doesn't allow magnetic fields to permeate the superconductor. They die off at the surface of the superconductor. It basically repels magnetic field lines. So the magnetic field lines can't, can't permeate the superconductor, so they basically get repelled. And that magnetic field repulsion produces a force that causes that magnet to levitate. And the same would be true essentially if I had an electric charge here, too. Electric forces can't permeate the superconductor. OK, fine. What does this have to do with anything I've been talking about? Well, let's imagine that you lived inside this superconductor. What would you, and developed laws of physics. What would your laws of physics be? Well, if you lived inside a superconductor, you would find that electricity and magnetism were short-range forces. Because if I had a magnetic field, it would die off very quickly. If I had an electric field, it would die off very quickly. And you would develop quantum mechanics for the, and you would discover when you develop the theory of that short-range force that in quantum mechanics, that you would find that there'd be a particle that would convey that force, that that particle would have to be massive. And indeed, inside a superconductor, photons are massive. Inside a superconductor, photons have a mass. And therefore, if you were born and lived and died inside a superconductor, for you, photons would be massive particles. Now, all this was known. And it should have rung a bell for the physicists who were thinking along the lines they were thinking, but they didn't. But then eventually the idea came out, maybe we live in a vast cosmic superconductor of sorts. And if that's the case, then what, 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 what happens? Well, it's like, it's like you're swimming. You saw the nice pool at UBC. I was looking at it today, and the new pool building is being built, I guess. And if you're swimming in a pool, you, you can swim very fast and feel light and everything else. But if I fill up the pool with molasses, first thing is you don't want to go swimming. But secondly, if you tried to swim in the molasses, you'd swim much more slowly. You'd feel much heavier. So imagine now that there's a vast, invisible field everywhere in nature. And some particles interact with that field. And as they're moving, they experience a force force of resistance. That causes those particles to slow down and act like they're massive. And particles that interact with that field more strongly act like they're more massive. In that case, the mass of those particles is really an illusion. Just like the mass of the photon, in some sense, in a superconductor is an illusion. And if that's the case, you can imagine then a new unification in physics. You can imagine Here's that Feynman diagram I showed you, turned upside down now. This is the electric force between two charged objects. And here's that, here's that force of the neutron changing into a proton, basically, and producing electron neutrino. These all look the same. But if these particles are exactly massless, just like this particle, the mathematics suddenly becomes sensible. And you can say, well, let's imagine that these particles that convey the weak force interact with this background field and act like they're massive. But at a fundamental level, they have no mass at all. And the mathematics of this is identical to the mathematics of this. In fact, if that's the case, these two things don't look different at all. And in that sense, if that's true, 
the weak force, which looks so different than the electric force, is really the same thing. The, electro the electromagnetic force and the weak force become two different aspects of precisely the same thing, something we now call the electroweak force. And the reason they look so different is, a, is an accident of our circumstances. There happens to be an invisible field everywhere in nature, and these particles interact with it. We live in a vast cosmic superconductor, and these particles get, appear to have mass, and this one doesn't interact with it, it remains massless, and in our world, those two forces look very different. Now, this is a remarkable story, but up to this point, it sounds religious. I mean, look, what did I say? I said, there's a vast invisible force everywhere in nature that's responsible for our existence, okay? What does it sound like? Or Star Wars or something. And if, if that were it, that would be religion, okay? But this is physics. And you can't make a claim like that and just let it go. If there's an invisible field everywhere in nature, we've got to find it. And so the question comes, how can you find this field? And the answer is cosmic sadomasochism. We spank the vacuum. We spank it hard. Someone got excited by that. Anyway, um, what do I mean by that? Well, in, quant in the quantum world, every field is associated with a particle. And if I take enough energy and I dump it into a single point in space, maybe there's enough energy to kick out real particles associated with that field. Let me call that field the Higgs field. And if I can somehow amass enough energy and dump it into a point in space at a single point, maybe I can kick out real particles associated with that field. If it's there, I must be able to kick out those particles, and I will call those Higgs particles. So the idea is to figure out a way to dump enough energy into space at a single point. How do you do that? You build the most complicated machines humans have ever built. The Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. You build the largest particle accelerator on Earth, it, here's Geneva. You can't see very well in this image, but there's Lake Geneva over there. There's the airport, which if you fly into Geneva, you land in the airport, and you see beautiful countryside around you. But 100 meters under the countryside is a tunnel that's 26 kilometers around. And what we do is we accelerate protons in this direction at 99.9999998% the speed of light in this direction. And then we accelerate protons at 99.9999998% the speed of light in that direction, and collide them in a few places. They go around thousands of times every second. Here's the French-Swiss border right there. So they go through the border thousands of times every second without passports or anything, which I think Mr. Trump is, wants to change. But, but they collide, and the idea is if you make them collide in a small enough region, maybe maybe it'll produce enough energy to produce these Higgs particles. And in the United States, they celebrate this anachronistic holiday on July 4th, which has no meaning anywhere else, except now it does. Because on July 4th, 2012, the Large Hadron Collider, we announced that 50 events had been observed out of the billions and billions of collisions in that machine. And those events looked like Higgs particles, they quacked like Higgs particles, they walked like Higgs particles, and if they do that, maybe they're Higgs particles. And since the intervening five years, all the experiments have shown that these particles have precisely the properties you would imagine of a particle that's associated with an invisible field throughout nature. We discovered the Higgs particle. Well, I was shocked. I didn't believe, I, I was fully, I was sure that the Higgs field didn't exist myself, because I, I just thought it was kind of too slippery and slimy an explanation that nature would be more imaginative in some ways than that. But to my amazement, in fact, that field is really there. We really do live in a cosmic superconductor. And the particles that make us up, they have mass because they interact with that background field. And if that background field wasn't there, we wouldn't be there. Because all the particles that make us up, essentially, would have to be massless. The, for the weak force, the electromagnetic force, would look identical. And everything we see would not be here. Now, this story is humanity at its best, I would argue. The story of the development of the standard model of particle physics, of understanding how on a fundamental scale nature looks so different than the world we experience, 
is humanity its best because it's people bravely going where not only where no one had gone before, but where they didn't want to go. Nature took us kicking and screaming to get there, to see that the universe of our existence is vastly different than, than the universe we experience, uncomfortably so. That is, I'll describe it and emphasize in a moment, is that it is the way it is because of an accident. That, that the universe that seems to be designed for us so efficiently is not designed for us at all. At a fundamental scale, we couldn't even exist in it. But it's more than just that. So these people were willing to go where the nature took them, but then we were willing to build over 50 years this machine, this vast billion, $10 billion machine just to measure this thing and just to find out why we're here. Not to make a better toaster or anything like that. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the problems of science in a way, it's not a problem, it's a benefit, but one of the paradoxical aspects of science is that it produces technology, like the technology that allowed us to be here today. But that means that people, when, they, when you talk about science they, or scientific discovery, they always say, what good is it? What will it do for me? Will it make a better toaster, a faster car, what, what? We never ask that when it comes to the Shakespeare play or a Mozart concerto or a Picasso painting. Okay? That's, but it seems to me that they're exactly the same. That the power of science, the beauty of science, is not the technology it produces, but the fact that it changes our perspective of our place in the cosmos, forcing us to reassess ourselves, where we come from, and how we got here. And these machines that we built, I would argue, are like the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century. The Gothic cathedrals, after all, were built by thousands of artisans from many different countries over centuries, using the most sophisticated technology of the time. They had to figure out how to keep these, these roofs up, and many times they fell down until they got it right. The Large Hadron Collider was built by 10,000 PhD scientists from over 100 different countries, working for over two decades speaking many different languages, many different religions, none of that mattered. They all came together, because science can bring people together. That's humanity is best. Religion pu pushes people apart. Science brings people together. And these machines are amazing. If you go there, you feel like Gulliver in one way. There's a, this is one of the machines called the Atlas Detector. It's the larger of the two. The, there's a smaller one called the Compact Muon Solenoid, which has as much metal in it as the... Um, Eiffel Tower, not very compact, but it's amazing to go there if, you're, if you can go there when the machine's not running. I, I have a better picture here, uh, yeah, because I'm in it. There it is. And, 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 and um, it's amazing to see these machines, and you, I have a whole chapter in the book on the, on the Large Shadow and Collider because you cannot speak about it with hyperbole because everything about it is, it, it, as hyperbolic as it sounds, is true. There's so many aspects of it that make it seem so impossible to build. For example, every second at the Large Hadron Collider, enough data is generated to fill more than a thousand one terabyte hard drives, more than the information in all the world's libraries, every second. The tunnel, the 26 kilometer long tunnel, has to be evacuated with a vacuum that's sparser than the vacuum of space outside the International Space Station. Everything about this is amazing. We built it just to answer this question, essentially. How do we get here? And the other thing that's great is that we're not done. The best part of the title of my book is the so far part. Because the greatest story ever told so far is the greatest story ever told so far. Unlike that other greatest story ever told, which remained exactly the same as it was when it was first proposed by ignorant peasants before, who didn't know the Earth orbited the Sun. This story changes, and it gets better. It'll be better tomorrow than it is today. I'm, I'm a big fan of art, and one of my favorite periods is Impressionist art. And um, I like Impressionist paintings because they look great from a distance, but you walk up close to them and they get really crappy. Because that's the way physics is. Because the standard model is great. It explains every experiment we've ever been able to met, do. But there are a host of questions that it brings up. Why is the Higgs field there? Why, in the early history of the universe, did some field settle, freeze, literally, into some configuration in empty space so that 
the weak force would be weak and the electromagnetic force would be long range. Why did that happen? Why did it happen at the scale it happened? All these questions, every time we make a new discovery in physics, there are more questions than answers. And that's great, because that means there are new things to be discovered. And some young people in the audience today may discover them. All those, and then that'll breed new questions. I don't know if there'll ever be a theory of everything. I doubt it, frankly. But it doesn't matter either way. It just doesn't matter if nature is an infinite onion when we peel back each layer, because tomorrow we'll understand more than we did today. And we won't understand it because the universe is the way we wanted it, we wanted it to be. We'll understand it because we're willing to allow ourselves to accept the universe for the way it is. And that is what's remarkable about the human experience of science, and that's what worries me, too. First of all, the good thing is our existence is a cosmic accident. And by that, I mean it's exactly like that picture I showed earlier. These people think this direction is special, ordained by God, meaningful. The force in this direction is different than the force in that direction. All an accident. If they lived on this icicle, a different direction would be important. And as I say, physicists might eventually discover on this icicle that that's just an accident of their existence, that there could be ice crystals pointing in different directions, and there's nothing special about that direction. They might discover that at, say, 4 in the morning. And then at 8 in the morning, the sun could rise, it could heat up, and the icicles could disappear. And then, of course, the nice rotational symmetry of nature would reappear again because there would be no special direction, but it wouldn't matter because those people would disappear because they could only exist on the icicle. And that may be our universe. Because it turns out if you look at the Higgs field and you look at its properties, it may melt. It's just on the hairy edge of being unstable, given the measurement of the Higgs parameters that we have, and it looks like it's probably stable, but it's on the hairy edge of being unstable. And if that Higgs field melts everywhere in nature, if that Higgs field goes away, we go away. Everything we know, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the aliens, everything in the universe that, we, that makes the universe that we know and love, that seem so awesome in our pictures, goes away. We, our, our existence is no more significant than that crystal on a window. And the future could be miserable. Don't worry about this, by the way. If it's, it, it, I don't want you to get scared by this. Um, because even if it were unstable, the calculations we perform show that it, universe, the big field isn't going to decay tomorrow or um, you, next year or a million years from now or a billion years from now or a billion, billion years from now or a billion, billion, billion years from now. It, the decay time is extremely long, even if it were unstable. So it, this is an academic issue, not, not one that's well. Just keep your diamonds and all the rest. But, <laughs> But it does mean that in the far future, the universe could be quite different. That we are here at a very special time in that sense. That our existence is just not only a cosmic accident in space, but a cosmic accident in time. And the universe is no more designed for us than bees are designed to see the color of flowers. If they didn't, they wouldn't reproduce. The universe isn't designed for us. It's not fine-tuned for us. We're fine-tuned for the universe. The universe has these properties allowing us to exist. And this illusion of design is what I want to end with. I want to talk a little bit about this illusion of design because it's so important and urgent now in many places throughout this country and the United States and around the world. The notion that somehow everything was designed so we could be here. Design is a very subjective thing. Take these Christmas ornaments. They're clearly designed for, for, because they look so beautiful. But of course, they're not Christmas ornaments. They're ice crystals. They're, they're snowflakes. And all you need for to make a snowflake is a polar molecule like water. And you cool it down. And, and given the, I think, 57 degree angles of the polar molecule, you will create beautiful crystal structures. So snowflakes aren't designed. Okay? But you say, well, okay, well, that's one thing. But let me think of something that's clearly designed, like this building, architecture. Architecture clearly gives evidence of intelligence. So let's take, say, the Buckminster Fuller Dome. When I was growing up, it was a big deal. All the hippies had one in their backyard and did neat things in them and stuff. And, and it was clearly evidence of intelligence. But of course, if you take soot, 
you'll find a molecule called carbon-60, which appears spontaneously in soot, which is a Buckminster Fuller, we could now call Buckminster Fullerene. Nothing is less designed than soot. Okay? So we have to be very careful when we say something's designed. We have to be skeptical. We have to question ourselves. And really, the first person to really point that out was one of the greatest scientists of all time, Charles Darwin, who did so in the context of life. Life appears to be designed. But what, what he showed was that it's not. It's not. The universe isn't fine-tuned for life. Life is fine-tuned for the universe. And in, in one of the most beautiful paragraphs in all of scientific literature, the end of the origin of the species, he writes, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. It's a beautiful statement of the diversity of life coming from a simple beginning, but it's true for science and for the physics as well. As the universe has gone on, these amazing forms have evolved from stars to galaxies to people from so simple a beginning in which the forces of nature, the one, the weak electromagnetic force, are really the same. All particles are masses, the same simple beginning due to the evolution of the universe and its Higgs field forming. Incredible diversity has resulted, all the diversity of the stars and galaxies and forces and life. But also we have to remember that scientists are products of their time. And in a letter to Hooker in 1863, he said, it's mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. I get paid now to think about the origin of matter. In 1863, it was rubbish. But the story's gotten better. And the origin of matter, in fact, is partly the story of the origin of the Higgs field that I told you about. And so the things that today seem ridiculous, people often say, science will never explain this. You pick in your... You picked your thing. I get told all the time, Son, you scientists, you think you're, you'll never explain X. When you think about that, that's such a, uh, the conceit in that claim is made. Because if you know we'll never explain X, then you must understand X. Okay? And we don't know what the limits of science are until we try. And so far we haven't seen any limits. Maybe there are. We don't know. But I'm worried, especially in my country, right now, because it used to have it in your country. You had this prime minister before the current one. And, um, and, 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 uh, and, you know, in the United States now, they're cutting the budget for all this research that I talk about here, particle physics. They're cutting the Department of Energy, which is the chief funding agency for all physical science in the United States, by 20% in the budget. They're cutting the budget for completely for the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, for the, um, uh, for the Institute of Museums and Libraries, for the National Endowments for the Arts, for the National Endowments for the Humanities, cut to zero in the current proposed budget. And, and that, if you work it out, that saves $1.82 billion. I added it up. Okay. In the same budget, there's a line item of $2 billion, which is the first installment of a wall with Mexico. That's because it's too big to build one in Canada, I guess. Canadians may want to build one soon, believe me. But, uh, but I think of that, this wall being built to hold out these invisible hordes at the expense of getting rid of arts, humanities, science. And, and, and to me, the best sort of discussion of that and the stupidness of that, the stupidity of that, came from a particle physicist, Robert Wilson, who was the director of the first large, well, one of the, the, the largest particle accelerator in the, in the world until Fermilab, I mean, until the Large Hadron Collider, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. And in the 1960s, when it was being built, he was asked by Congress, Will it aid in the defense of the nation? And here was his answer. No, sir, I don't believe so. It has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean, all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to make it worth defending. And that we have to remember. When we're presented with people who would rather build walls, build defenses, than support science, the humanities, and the arts. Because the things that make that country great, or this country great, or any country great, are not the walls it builds, but the legacy it leaves for the future. The understanding of ourselves, which increases with time. 
Those are the things we remember. Those are the things that matter. And those are the things we have to preserve and be brave enough about. So I began my, you can applaud that, that's fine, I don't mind. I, I want to end. I began, I began my book with this quote from, from Virgil, one of my favorite quotes from the Aeneid. These are the tears of things and the stuff of immortality cuts us to the heart, which I used to be able to say in Latin. But the next line in the Aeneid is not as well known, but to me it's the most, more important line because it, it is release your fear. And to me that's what's important. We have to stop being afraid of the unknown. Stop being afraid of people from different places. Stop being afraid of a universe which may not be the universe we want to live in. It doesn't matter. We have to force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality. And when we do so, the world becomes more awesome, not less. And to do so, we have to let the world and nature tell us how it behaves. And rather than bemoan a miserable future or a universe that wasn't created for us, we should instead if this changed. Enjoy your brief moment in the sun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. You just take away from the reflection period. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I do appreciate that tremendously. I, I, we're going to have a question period now, and, and I guess there are two microphones. And I won't take too many questions in public because people have to pee. But, um, but, but I will take some. And then I'm going to be out there signing books, but you, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a book. Okay? If you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. I won't leave till the last question is answered, so don't worry about that. Or, the, heaven forbid, the last selfie is taken. But, 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 um, <laughs> But, uh, but for the moment, if you have some questions, I, be brave, because other people probably have the same questions. So go, go to one microphone or the other, if you have any questions. Oh, good. Somebody. Oh, good. Okay. Excellent. We're getting some. This microphone seems to be more questionable. Yeah. Good evening, Lawrence. Thank, thanks for coming. Thank you. And to the organizers for uh, putting this together. I wonder if you could take a moment and maybe talk to us about um, any thoughts on consciousness and awareness, um, how, uh, why, okay. sure. And uh, are, may, are, are we done evolving in, in that sense? Well, the answer is I have absolutely nothing to say about consciousness or awareness, because I tell people don't believe me. I do physics because it's easy, okay? Because it's the easy stuff. It's the low-hanging fruit. Consciousness is much more complicated. It's a much more complicated issue, and. And I often like to say there are many more books written about consciousness because we understand so little about it. I mean, in quantum mechanics, you just write one book, and there it is. And uh, uh, because we understand quantum mechanics. But consciousness is very, very complicated, and it's going to take a long time to understand it. In fact, it's not clear that we even have a good definition of consciousness. So, so it's, a, it's, it's clearly a fascinating area, and, and we're learning about the brain leaps and brown whole new things about the brain and it, it's an exciting new area of science that's coming along now because, and physics came along earlier and so physics literally is easy consciousness will take a while I, do I think some people say we'll never understand consciousness again that's ludicrous as far as I can tell and most people I know and I run an institute at, 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 at Arizona called the Origins Project and we, we've <coughs> run meetings on pattern processing in the human brain and on artificial intelligence and as far as I can see, there's no distinction between us at a fundamental level and computers. So, so I, I think we are just a form of computer, probably a different architecture. But, but I don't know anything about it. And if any physicist gives a lecture about consciousness, don't go to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, in your work, how do you find or choose good problems to, to solve? Well, that's a really good question. It, you know, it's a matter, it's, a, it's a really the art of that question. In fact, that, I'll answer your question, but I want to describe it more generally. Because one of my big problems with the way science is taught in schools is it's taught as a series of facts. And then, of course, you can have alternative facts, okay? And, and, but that's not what science is. Science is a process for discovering facts. And how do you get to that process? By questioning. 
And the way we should teach science is, is a series of questions, not a series of answers. The answers aren't important. I have more information in my, in my phone than in, in a high school like it was when I grew up. But of course, there's more misinformation, too. And what we have to teach students is how to tell the difference between them. Myth, information and misinformation. That will, will determine what are, who, whether people are viable, productive citizens in the 21st and 22nd century, is how they can tell nonsense from sense. And by doing that, only by learning how to ask questions. And then going about to see about how to answer them. And we answer them by a skeptical inquiry, testing, retesting, working on empirical evidence, and going back, and always being skeptical of ourselves. So the process of learning what the right questions to ask comes, like all things, like learning how to play a violin, by practice. And one of the reasons we subject these problem sets on physics students, besides to torture pre-medical students, <laughs> is, is because that process of problem solving builds some kind of intuition that hopefully will help guide you when you come to ask questions about the real world. So there's no try to a fast rule for how to, do, how to pick problems, and, and some people are better at it than others. But if, once you know where things are, the, the, the questions become clearer. People write me all the time, not just the people who claim I'm wrong, but write me with their theories of nature. And the problem is they, they just don't know what our current theories are, and therefore they don't have the right questions. And so it's a lot of intellectual baggage, and it's a process. And, and then it's an art. And what's interesting if you look at the history of science is that the questions people ask, the, the great physicists, they ask the right questions, but only for a little while. You know, Einstein asked the right questions, but eventually he got out of touch, and his questions weren't interesting anymore. And so for all of us, we're very, very lucky if at any point in our life we ask a question that touches at the heart of nature. And if that happens to any of us at any time in our lives, we feel very lucky. But there's no, there's no rule for how to determine the good questions except practice, just like how to become a good violinist or artist or, or musician or, th or writer. Uh, you know, I write, and the way I learned how to write was to write. And, event, and so it's just that, keep asking questions. I say to parents and teachers, particularly parents, the best thing you can say to your kids when they ask you a question is, I don't know. We all want to have the answers, but I don't know is so important because then you can say, Let's figure out how to, how to find out the answer. And in schools, it becomes a process of discovery instead of a process of memorization. So that was a big, long McGill, as we like to say, as an answer to your little question, but it's a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, yeah. Um, hi, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for the talk, and also uh, thanks for making the tickets really affordable. Um, I didn't, but that's good. I'm glad they were. Thank you. Good. If I had my way, they probably would have been a lot more expensive. But anyway. Okay. Well, I bought your book, so yeah, you're not getting any more money from me. No, um, I was just wondering, based on our current understanding of science, do you think we can definitively say one way or another whether the universe is deterministic or not? And if we can't, what's your inkling? Well, I think we, given the science we know, I think we can say pretty definitively that the universe is deterministic. Quantum mechanics, you know, it seems to be the great out. I have. I was going to say my friend, but he's not. I like to make him mad. Deepak Chopra. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's really easy to make him mad. I do all the time. But, um, you know, these people rely on quantum mechanics. There's this weird thing that allows everything to be possible. And quantum mechanics, of course, is probabilistic, right? You measure things. You don't know the exact answer. But it, measurements give you a, a range of answers. But the theory is probabilistic. Quantum mechanics is based on second-order differential equations. Which, and by that, it means if you provide an initial value for what's called the wave function, then it's, that wave function is completely determined for all the rest of future history. So the wave function in quantum mechanics is determined. Now, when you measure it, the results are, are, are probabilistic, but the probabilities are completely determined. So at a fundamental level, the laws of physics are deterministic. But that doesn't change the fact that on the scale in which we live, where interactions are so complicated and so many things uh, are coming to the determination of almost anything, the world effectively acts as if it's not deterministic. We act, we, the world, we act as if we have free will because effectively we live in a world in which effectively it's indistinguishable from a world in which we had free will. 
It may be that I had no choice in what I had to say now, but the, there's so many factors that go into that that, that I, I might as well act as if I did. We may as well take responsibility for the actions we make. So the resolution of this complicated philosophical issue in my mind is quite simple. The world is deterministic, but we act, we, the world, effectively, the scales we live, it's indistinguishable from a world in which there's free will. And I can live with that. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Hi, thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for um, being here today. So I was wondering um, what your take on the more exotic explanation um, that the cold spot on the cosmic microwave background um, is a signature of a collision with another bubble universe. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> It's a good question. Um, so, there are anomalies in all observations to the forefront. And those anomalies are almost always wrong. Or at least, there are, there are inclinations to assume significance to things that aren't necessarily significant. The cosmic microwave background um, is, uh, is this background coming from the Big Bang that's largely uniform in all directions. It's got small fluctuations in it. And those fluctuations are fluctuations of temperature at the, one part of one, at the level of one part in 100,000. It's amazing we've been able to measure them. And they represent small perturbations which are essentially put in at the beginning of time. Now, you can describe those fluctuations because they're due to quantum mechanics statistically. And when you do that, you can look at the microwave background, and the statistics of the microwave background are largely exactly what you'd predict from statistics. Okay? But then there are certain anomalies, and the question is, when you see something, is it a it, does it imply new physics, or is it just an accident? Okay? And so, if I see a, a seven-foot-tall person in this room, I can ask, are they a different species? Or are they the tail of a distribution? Okay? And the problem is, let me put it a different way. Let's say LeBron James and I were sharing the stage, okay? And let's say the building collapsed, okay? And all the rest of you were never found. <laughs> but, but they found the skeletons of me and LeBron James. And they were the only humans that, that these aliens ever saw. They look at my skeleton, they look at LeBron James' skeleton, and the tendency would just be able to say, these are two different species. Okay? If you only have a sample of one or two, how do you know if you're seeing the tail of a distribution or two different species? Now, if the cosmic microwave background, as we have every reason to believe, is due to quantum mechanical configurations in the early history of the universe, then if you have many different universes, you'll have many different configurations. And in some of them, there'll be deviations at one point, we're called two sigma deviations, unusual ones, okay? If you measure enough universes, you'll see that it's uniform. But if you measure one and you see some weird deviation, is it significant? Okay. And the answer generally is to assume it's not, unless there's compelling evidence that it is. And so there is, there is an anomalous cold spot in that distribution, and you can work out the likelihood that it would be there. And the likelihood, is, is, I forget the number, but it's probably around 1%, some 1, 1 to 5%. So there's a 1% likelihood that fluctuations would produce that. But 1% is a lot. In, 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 you know, in medicine, the 99% confidence in something is enough to win a Nobel Prize. In physics, it's not. You need a 99.9999995% confidence. So when we see something that happen in one of 100 universes, maybe we're just one of those 100 universes. So the assumption is that the best assumption that I know of is that it's not significant. Some people have claimed that maybe it's giving us evidence of another universe. But to me, that extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. And that certainly isn't extraordinary evidence. And, and, um, and I do think we actually could develop evidence of other universes, and I've written about it, but I don't think that is. That's, so that's my guess. But right now it's just a guess, and unfortunately, we live in just one universe, or most of us do. The Republican Party in my country lives in another one, but, but, but that's a different thing. But thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we understand now that we live in that superconductor, right? 
Yeah. We, we live what? In, in a superconductor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do we understand where is the source of this superconductor, or is is there a way for us to ever? Well, know we that? we understand that the source of that superconductor is this weird field, the, the Higgs field, that 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 froze. Just like the electrons freeze in a superconductor in a very special configuration, make it a superconductor, the Higgs field forms what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate in the early history of the universe. So we understand exactly where the superconductor comes from, except we don't know why the Higgs field froze. In our model, it freezes. But what determined the physics for that model of the Higgs field? What determined the fundamental physics of the Higgs field? That's still an open question. We think. We have potential answers to that question, which is why the whole Large Hadron Collider is not turned off. It's still running. It's going to run for 15 or 20 years. And we think that one of the explanations for why it froze the way it is, is that there are other, there's new phenomena in nature that result in that. And maybe a whole new symmetry of nature that produces a whole new set of particles called supersymmetric particles. And we think we may discover them at the Large Hadron Collider. That's the best bet, but maybe it's wrong. But we don't know the answer. And I'm happy to say I don't know the answer. But the good news is, we're trying to find out. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take, I hate to do this to you, um, but I'm going to take your question, and then I'm going to take your question from the young man, and that's it. Okay, I'm sorry. But I, I think people, you know, then I'll be happy to answer the questions later. Okay, yeah. Well, now you're making me want to. Uh, These better be damn good questions. <laughs> no, uh, no pressure. I come to you as uh, the non scientist, nerd, geek lover of atheism, lover of humanity. All good things. All the amazing things, the important things in life besides science. Have you and the gang, Richard and Neil, uh -huh. have you guys just ever thought of stepping into politics, politics <laughs> and world government and like you know all these scientists from the, the Hadron well, Collider. Like we need to stop. Trump. Yeah, no, no, thank yes. you. I, I think, I think... Um, All of this shit that's going on. No, I thought of it. I, I'm very political. I'm, I can't help but be political. I, I, I've always been that way. And, 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 um, and, and politics <laughs> occupies far too much of my thinking. Uh, I wish it didn't. Uh, but it does. Um, and so I've thought at times of, of, of running for politics. And um, uh, Neil, Neil wouldn't, because it would be too big a pay cut at the very least for him. But, <laughs> but, um, but um, uh, um, and, and, and my, my decision at various times, I, I've come close, and I haven't, for two reasons. Uh, one is I promised my wife I wouldn't, but that was a different thing. But, but more importantly, um, first, I think I can have more of an impact doing what I do. I'm fortunate enough to have some kind of impact, and I have an audience, and I can... I can write and I can speak and some people listen, so that's important. But also, the process of being a politician would be a compromise for me because if I wanted to be elected, I mean, I thought of running purposely to lose, that's just to get a voice, just to get a voice. And I almost did in Arizona when John McCain um, w w w didn't have an opponent at one point. And I thought, wow, he'll be running for president and there'll be a lot of attention paid to a Senate race. And, 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 um, and so I thought of running with the purpose of losing. Um, but to win would just require too much of a compromise. I could not say what I really meant. And, and I just don't think I, I could as a politician. You have, to, you have to compromise too much, and I'm not interested in compromising. What? We've already won. All we need to do is get together. Well, I mean, yeah, well, it'd be great. It'd be great if, I could, if, if, if we had a world where you could say what you mean and, um, and, and win. And I think we'll only have such a world when we educate people to be skeptical, questioning, and be willing to open their minds. And, and that's not the world we live in now. So I'd rather devote my energies to try and develop the former rather than the latter. But it is important that there be some scientists in government, just like, like it's important that, but I don't think, you see, the point, the value of science is not to determine policy. The value of science is to provide the evidence that allows you to make sound policy. And so if we, we don't need scientists in government if they're willing to accept the results of empirical evidence in making policies and using reason. So I don't think a, a government of scientists would necessarily be any better than a government of lawyers. Well, I do think it would be better than a government of lawyers. But, 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 
so, so look, I have a friend who's a congressman, Bill Foster, and there's only one got PhD physicist in the entire Congress, 535 people, only one PhD. It would be nice to have more empirically based, but there are a bunch of doctors. But as I learned when, when uh, my, I have a friend here who knew I, you know, I wanted to be a doctor when I was younger. My mother wanted me to be a doctor desperately for a long time. And, um, and then she made this mistake of telling me that doctors were scientists, and I became a scientist, and I realized that doctors aren't necessarily. Some doctors are. But, um, but you know, take uh, that idiot who's running Health and Human, or whatever his name is, running, uh, what is he running now? Ben, Ben Carson, I try to forget his name every day. <laughs> yeah. He's an example of the fact that doctors don't need to be scientists. He's anti-science. So, but anyway, that's my personal decision. But I, I'm happy to say that I know of now a few scientists who are running for Congress, and that's great. But, but people from all walks of life should run. Because it should be representative. Democracy is supposed to be representative of the population. And, and, um, but it doesn't matter what, what your background is. What really matters is whether you're willing to base policies on reality or on bias and prejudice. And if you're willing to base it on reality, I don't care what your background is. Last question, young man. If I couldn't solve a question, what advice would you give me so I wouldn't get um, discouraged about not being able to solve that question? Oh, what a great question. Well, that's very good. Well, you know, life is full of questions we can't solve exactly. In fact, one of the greatest disservices we do to students like you, and this will happen throughout your career, which I'm sure will be a wonderful one, is that we, we give students these questions that they can always solve, or they're always supposed to be able to solve anyway. And it gives them the illusion that all problems are solvable. But the minute you get out in the real world, whether you're a scientist or, or anything, you find that questions aren't exactly solvable. And the trick becomes how to take a question that you can't solve and turn it into a question you can. And that's the exciting thing, because often there's a reason you can't solve that problem. And if you understand the reason why you can't solve that problem, you can turn it into a problem you can solve. And then you can get the satisfaction of moving in a new direction. So every brick wall you encounter can be walked around. And just remember that, that there's nothing that stops you from eventually going around it to find the answer. And ultimately, the key thing to remember when it comes to brick walls and the people who provide brick walls for you. The only advice I give to young people when they ask me, you know, what's your advice? I'm a young physicist. My advice is always the same. Don't let the bastards get you down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Lawrence Krauss and Dr. Sam Harris. What you guys are done. We were counting on like 10 minutes of applause at the beginning, so we didn't have to think very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all uh, for coming out. Yeah, it's really good. Thank it's, you. It's amazing. So, uh, you know, I, we were talking before uh, about what types of topics we might hit on, and we're trying to do things different in each of the towns. There's a lot of people who are here uh, because they feel that one or more of us may have had some impact on their lives and influence them. And I thought it'd be a good place to start uh, for each of you to talk about. Who opened your minds? Who excited you about knowledge and understanding and, and flipped light switches for you? Uh, I told you not to mention the lobotomy. I told you. But uh, um, I, I think for me, you know, one of the reasons I write books now, I think, is, is I read books by scientists and, and uh, George Gamow. For me, probably Richard Feynman more than many, I think, because he was the first when, I, when I, I was at some summer science program and, and um, the teacher could tell I was bored and he gave me the book by Feynman called The Character of Physical Law. And it was the first time I realized that there, it wasn't all done. It wasn't all done by dead white men a long time ago. And that there were still big problems that we didn't understand. And, and uh, so that was the first time I realized, hey, there's something left to do. And I got really turned on. I think by, and of course Feynman was, was really important in, in encouraging skepticism, in explaining that science 
A good scientist tries to prove a theory right, but tries equally hard to prove it wrong, and, and that's probably the first time I heard that. Mm. Well, I guess uh, taking that very literally open in my mind, I, I have to say there's a couple of meditation teachers who, who uh, literally did that. You just, and uh, I guess it would be Tukurugan Rinpoche, who's a, this great, very elfin Tibetan Lama who I met back in the early 90s, I would think, and, and he was just a, um, a guy who had been in retreat for about 15 or 20 years and uh, just a, quite a, a kind of a magical and brilliant teacher of, of just, actually the, the topic you, you and I were fighting about last time, the illusion of the self and the... And he the, led you astray yes, early yes, on. Yes, so yeah. he, he induced this hallucination that you're worried about and it's persisted for many years. Yeah, and I, I think actually that's probably a good segue as we didn't, there were a number of topics that we discussed in New York, but this one I don't think, I know I didn't get to an understanding of what you mean when you're talking about, from a standpoint of meditation, et cetera, getting into the introspection and, and losing a sense of self. Hmm. So, if you, I don't know, would you expound on that so that we can either come to an understanding of it or beat it to death after? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we should frame what I'm about to say with the understanding that, that basically every word out of my mouth for the next minute is going to be setting off Lawrence's bullshit detectors. <laughs> uh, and that's a problem. I will argue that's a problem. Uh, and it's not my problem. Uh, <laughs> Poor mine. <laughs> so, so the setup to this is that, and this is not something that I always knew, this is something that, that was, thank you, your body language is, yeah. uh, it's amazing to fawn and c yeah. communicate the derision in the same gesture. Uh, so, uh, I mean, em empiricism is obviously the, the bedrock of the, the scientific method and a naturalistic attitude of just observing the world and being led to theorize about it in a way that's constrained by, by evidence and, and consistent observation. And introspection in the West has been fairly unfruitful because most people, even going back 150 years or so, when people like William James and, and Wundt and other people, and the, kind of the the dawn of psychology tried to get introspection off the ground, they looked inside and noticed that you really can't discover much about the mind by just looking inside. You, you can't even discover that you have a brain. Uh, needless to say, you can't discover the, the, the dependence of the mind on the brain. And there are many things in science and in a scientific understanding of the mind that you can't get through introspection. But there are some things you can. And um, so to the question about the self, I mean, the, the, the self that is illusory from a, a, a Buddhist or, or, or meditational point of view is the sense that there's a subject in the head riding around in the, in the, the center of experience. So there's, there's clearly experience, there's clearly consciousness and its contents. There's a world that we see and hear and touch. There's the body in the world that we see and feel with, with sensations beyond touch, if we have proprioception, we have a, a sense of our internal uh, uh, en enteroceptive states, uh, you feel your gut, you feel emotional uh, reactions to things which are kind of an extrapolation of, of enteroception. So we have, we, all of this is, this is, this is not illusory, uh, but most of us, certainly most of the time, feel that we are a self, a subject, located somewhere in the head that is an unchanging center to, to all of this, this cascade of experience. So there's, there's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, and other senses, and all of that's happening to a witness, a center in consciousness that is thinking the thoughts and hearing the sounds. And meditation is just a technique to look more closely at that sense of there's, that there's a center. And you can actually find it to be absent. And it makes, and this, this should interest you, from... Uh, I was, I was amazing, waiting, so, I was waiting yeah, for that part. It's, it's, okay. amazing how, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how sassy that can sound, um, but it should. The, uh, this is 
far more convergent with, with what we know about the brain. I mean, there's, there's no neurological sense to be made of, a, of an unchanging center to consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's analogous to something like the optic blind spot. So the optic blind spot is, is something that most of us learned about in school. For Obviously, for thousands of years, people didn't know it existed. It's something you can observe about your phenomenology with some effort. I mean, you need a piece of paper, and you do, draw two dots on it, and you move it. To, to the right spot and one, one dot disappears and it reveals something about the anatomy of the eye that's true, that we can, we can, we can find the corresponding you know, third person physical correlate of it. And for, for fun, when I'm sitting up here, I'm constantly making your head disappear just yeah. by oh, yeah. Sam's head's gone. Yeah. So the, um, well, that's true. Okay. That is true. That is true. I mean, it's counterintuitive, but if you, if you look out at a crowd of heads you know, and close one eye, there's almost certainly somebody missing a head, and it's, yeah. uh, it's, it would be hard to notice. But the, the, sen the sense that this is something, the fact that it takes some work to observe this, and this is something that actually makes more neurological sense, should give your feeling of not having observed it, having put very little effort into observing it, uh, well, you told last time you said it was a minute and a half, or or, or oh, oh, when you'd make me do that stuff, supposed yeah. to calm me down. Yeah, I yeah. just can't do this right. for more than okay. a minute or so. So that's that's one reason why at least you should be you should be open-minded as to whether or not there's a there there. I, I, given, I, I'm open-minded to the fact that you may experience many things under drugs or or under meditation, uh, and um, and those are experiences. And, and I think, you know, Oliver Sacks said hallucinations are real to those people who are hallucinating. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they are. And so I think you, everything you experience can feel real to you. It, it's, just, it's just that... But, but um, would you, let me, it's just let me, that let me there ask is, you a few uh, questions. Well, let, let, let me gonna, I mean, you're going to be talking, but I just want to ask you a few questions. I was about to talk, actually. I know, actually, but... I want to get you right on track. Okay. Because, oh, um, thank you. If, <laughs> if you... If paying more attention reliably leads to this experience, and paying less attention reliably leads to the experience you're having, what would, what would, what does, would that suggest to you? Um, it suggests you can do many things with your mind. When I'm working hard on a physics problem, I may lose complete consciousness of myself. Right. That's fine. My, it's good that my brain can concentrate, but I don't have the I don't have the, um, any idea that I don't exist when I'm, when I'm working on it. I realize that, that I'm just, I'm just excluding all those things that are getting in the way of what but I want to no, think but about. You exist. The person exists. Well, yeah, but yeah. the cell. I mean, I was just thinking about this backstage. That to me, I was going to use the word miracle, but I won't. Um, uh, uh, the great. Pr I'm a physicist, but if I had to think of one of the most amazing things in the universe, it's the fact that we have a self. The but fact the, that you can take we a might complex, mean different things by complex the word self, then. computing system of at some level, huh. and it can become self-aware is to me one of the most remarkable things about the universe. Oh. And so, so, so that, that, that existence is something we should celebrate and not uh, try and the, get rid of. Then I think you're getting misled by the word self. We're using it differently because it's not, there's absolutely nothing miraculous or wonderful about this type of self-awareness that I'm saying is, is transitory. I mean, is it like self-consciousness in the, in the sense mm -hmm. of Oh, you've got something on your face, and you feel like, oh, what, what oh, me? Thank you. That, that, that recoil from experience, that sense of suddenly being behind your face, that's not the, the, the majesty of subjectivity that you're talking about. No, I'm saying that, we, that I'm self-aware, that, that, that and, and, that, and may, maybe you, there are other animals who are too, but that you can reach a level of computational complexity so that we can understand that we exist separate from the universe around us and that and that we have a self and that I said, said, I said to you last time I know you have a self I well, cut your head off and your self ain't there anymore okay but again I mean it's not a little man you're using the but, word differently because it's not yes if you cut my head off I would be dead right so I'm not disputing yeah, that yeah okay so but but uh, so, let me so, just ask you one more question because I because maybe we're, we're hitting a brick wall here I mean wall there here, is but. a separation between you can try, I, look, I think you can do amazing things when you, when you focus on it. The mind is an amazing entity, which we still don't understand. In fact, we don't understand self. We don't understand consciousness. These are words, but we don't really, in my opinion, understand them yet. But the, so the fact that you can reach a state where you have this feeling but is it's neat. Not, it's but not, it's not a state. 
It's, a, but, it's so, the same state that people have uh, when they fear that God's talking to them. It's no, a, no, no, no. But, so, just one uh, a, lo a logical way to come at this. So, there's consciousness and its contents. So, everything you you can experience is part of the contents of consciousness. Your feelings yeah, and your mm -hmm. your thoughts and your sensations. Uh, now, this experience of having a self has to be an experience. Otherwise, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say that it exists, right? And, and, and my, my losing a sense of self also has an experiential quality. I mean, there's something that has, has been lost, right? Yeah, but we have to be very, uh, so, but we have to be very skeptical of ourselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think and we should be. We, yeah, and we have indeed. to be very skeptical of our experiences and not, and, and especially when it comes to internal experiences of, of assessing yourself, which we all do every day. We all lie about ourselves every day. We have to be skeptical about that. And if we experience something that gives us this, this profound revelation, it's profound revelations about ourselves are usually wrong. Yeah, no, well, that, no I'm, I'm just saying the revelations on, the, you've got the revelation on the wrong side here. Yeah. Well, or the there's, false a, there's a part of this that I don't get. Well, I, there's this one point yeah. I just didn't make here. Let, let, him, let okay. him talk no, because log, he's digging I, just, a I hole. want to give you the logical okay. piece yep. here. Okay. So if there is an experiential component to the sense of yeah. self, right, this is, if this is an object for consciousness, right? Consciousness, su subjectively speaking, I'm not talking about yeah. something spooky about consciousness yeah, I know be, being yeah. the, the, yeah. the ground floor of, of reality, but consciousness subjectively is prior to this feeling of self. I mean, this, this, this feeling is appearing among the objects of consciousness. It's a feeling in your face. It's a feeling in, yeah. your, mm -hmm. in your chest. So consciousness being prior to it, don't you think it might be possible to take the perspective of consciousness and see that feeling of self as yet just another object in consciousness? Another sight, another sound, another sensation, another thought? Y yeah, sure. Okay, big deal. Okay. And what do you think that feels like? What? What do you think it would feel like to actually be able to do that? Um, if I think, I, I do think it would feel somewhat similar to the sense, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't meditate, but, but if I am, the rare times I get to really work, if mm. I'm writing or doing physics or something. You, loo uh, you lose uh, yourself uh, in your work. I lose myself in my work, yeah. and I, so I think I can, you know, people always tell me you can't, you can't, you don't know what that's like because you haven't experienced. But I think that that is as close as you can get, and it's a very satisfying feeling. Well, there's there's one difference. So so that, but that is a clue, that should be a clue to you because that is that is a clue that this sense of self is transitory. It's it's perturbable. You can lose it. You can pay so much attention to your work or to anything else that you no longer feel that way. You can have a, a flow experience, whether it's in athletics yeah. or whatever, and yeah, but, then retrospectively you come back and assess, oh, that's, that happened to me. I'm, I'm I, I guess, self. That, yeah, that, so the sense of self may be dependent upon your state of consciousness. I would agree, but, I don't, but there is a self. There, I'm me and you're you, and, and, um, and well, um, you know, sometimes I would like so to be you, case but case I'm case. happy to be me. Okay. Two different usages of the word yes, self, yeah. because my point of confusion is, if you have the experience of losing this sense of self, then what is the experience here? And I think you're just saying it's just consciousness. Con consciousness and its contents. Everything is the same. But I, I doesn't there's sights and sounds and thoughts. But what and makes sensations? it better? I mean, I, I you know, well, I guess the, that's the second. Question. The point is, okay, it's a neat thing. I mean, and, and I think you said somewhere you can get it from taking drugs too, right? Um, well, if you're lucky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Depends and, on your dealer. And, and yeah. I mean, there's a lot. So fine, but there's, but there. It's just another feeling. It's nothing well, no. special about it. Well, no. Again, you're just not in a position to say that. So always see something. now that. Yeah. Well, no. I, yeah. I think it's it's legitimate to ask. Okay, there's two separate issues. Can you lose a sense of self? And if you, in fact, can, why? What, what's, why? A good, what's that good for? What's, yeah. What benefit is it? Right. Well, th so there's two benefits. One is that it's actually just just the intellectual benefit of it being more true. It's like you're actually noticing your experience more closely than you otherwise. You're not taken in by an illusion, and that has its own rewards. But it actually... I think that, that's an assumption on your part, but okay. Well, no, because I, but the thing is you can, you can do this so much. This is not a peak experience that you have once a year. You, you yeah. can do it, you know, I can do it now. So I can talk about it, and I can notice what it's like to lose... to to lose it and regain it, right? I mean, I can, like, like, like that's, that you, you can traverse that boundary a thousand times you, you in a see, day. You don't understand the incredible exhilaration you get by being totally absorbed by yourself, right, yes, which yes, I can yes, explain right. to you I know. at some point. Well, uh, but the real benefit is that all of our psychological suffering is the result of being lost in thought and not knowing it. I mean, we're thinking every moment of our lives 
about all of the things we want or regret or wish had turned out differently. We have an argument with someone and then we replay it in our heads for the next hour and a half. You get suddenly angry and then rather than just watch the half-life of that emotion dissipate over the course of literally seconds, you rekindle it moment after moment after moment for an hour or for a day or for longer based on thinking about all the reasons why you should be angry and you're not even aware that you're thinking. So you're talking to yourself every mm -hmm. moment of your life and this automaticity is uninspected and you don't even have the tools by which to inspect it. I mean, most people don't even know there's an option to inspect it, but even if they tried, they would just be lost in thought again in the next second. And the, and the character of being lost in thought is to feel like a self and to be hostage to whatever emotional payload that thought is bearing with it. So all of the depression and the anxiety and the sadness and all of it. I, and I've heard so this you, before. So you, so you can break that spell. But talking to yourself is a, a nether, again, another it's a tool. It huge can leap. Be a tool. I mean, it, it can be a tool. Yes. my good friend and your good friend Noam Chomsky would uh, say, yes. to, um, um, very close. That, well, I, and I know Noam has said to me, but I think it's true. He argues that language actually was not developed to communicate outside, but to communicate internally to yourself. Huh. And I think that's an interesting thought. That least. might be one of the things he's wrong about. It could be. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> Well, I, I've heard you talk before about, you know, all of our suffering is tied up in this self, and so gaining the ability to lose a sense of self would minimize or reduce or eliminate this sort of suffering. But for me, hmm. if that's true for suffering, first of all, I think we can learn from our suffering, and so I think there's value there. Well, but you also, will suffer. I mean, it, it, you know, it's... Suffering well, is, gonna, is guaranteed. I think there's so things to learn from this there, constant There will be enough. Here. There will be enough in any case. Okay, but I still think there's things uh, to learn I'm from I'm going to learn constant. from this conversation. Yeah. If, uh, um, there's a subtle... No, anyway, okay. Right. I think, Some I think people there's in the something audience to learn got from the joke. constant self-reflection, okay. but wouldn't the self also be responsible for joy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So if I'm so, practicing... So, some joys, yeah. What, but that, but, what joy wouldn't be... a but what's wrong well, with reliving good moments? Well, the thing, guess, okay, so just to come yeah. back to his flow experience of getting so immersed in his work, most of what, I mean, the joys that people really crave tend to be these moments in life where you're not waiting for the next thing to happen. You are totally immersed in the good thing that is happening right now. So whether that's sex or sports or entertainment where that's so good that you've just, you forgot you're even watching a movie, what, you're, you're completely one-pointed on something. Now, it is actually a feature of the human mind where, and this is a surprising feature, it doesn't actually matter what that something is. It, it, it concentration ha is, is intrinsically pleasurable. And that's, that's, you know, you can think that might have, you know, a, an odd moral valence, and, and I would grant you it, it might. I think but, it works as a, as a, but you can. Wouldn't they mean suffering is also a point of joy? Well, it, well, it, 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 it actually, well, it actually can be. I mean, because you, you can you can be so one. I mean, this, this is something that happens on you know meditation retreats. You can sit with a lot of physical pain, and the the difference between agony and ecstasy can sort of become indistinct. But, I mean, it's just the, intense. But experience. it's not. But not but, just being in the moment. I mean, I can. I, I'm. I get. I'm getting pleasure out of. Think anticipating what's going to happen next, what's going to come out of your mouth next. That's, that's another and that's, kind of pleasure. And, and that, I would it's argue not, it's it, not thinking about the moment. It's, it's sort of saying, gee, what's going to happen next? So, so, and, yeah, and, and that, that's But this is uh, not going to be the best experience you're going to have all year, presumably. <laughs> Sam, I think you're selling yourself short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really do. Another backhanded compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the point being that you can actually, you, when you pay attention to those moments where you have really forgotten yourself in a good way. I mean, you can, you can lose yourself in anger, say. I mean, you can, lo you can lo lose yourself in a, in a morally, certainly unproductive and, and kind of classically unpleasant emotion, but uh, it's not, the most pleasurable moments in life are not the moments where you're thinking, you're reiterating to yourself why you should be happy. You're simply just happy. I mean, so like you're, you're simply, mm. Well, I think, right? well I, look, I, there I think, are those moments. I think be, you're, look, there's, yeah. a lo it, uh, there's something to some of what you're saying. And um, but, uh, no, really, but what I think you're, I do think you're influenced by, by your interest in Buddhism there. I think the value judgment, well, I, the only thing that I disagree with you about mm. is, is not, the, I mean, I think I'd agree that you can have these experiences that are quite interesting. It's the value judgment that they're somehow more worthy than well, the other experiences that I, that I. Uh, it's, an, it's, not a, it's an observation about 
the mechanics of my own suffering, right? So I'll, I'll just okay. make it as yeah. local as possible. Sure. Good. Now this is a, an experience that is attested to by an uncountable number of people who have run the same experiment on themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's analogous to like, you know, somebody getting in shape at the gym, right? Like, mm. you know, how did you get those muscles? Well, I, live, I picked up these heavy things, you know, thousands mm. of times and I ate, you know, this diet and yeah. this is what happened, right? Now, it just so happens in that case, you can see the person's body. And so you have this, this visual correlate to what they did. But there's, a, there's an inner gym. I mean, sure. you can actually kind of change your emotional tone. You can change your capacity to fly off the handle, you know, you can, you, yeah. can, you can become the guy who used to get angry and stay angry for half a day and spend all, all that time saying and doing the things that, that angry people say and do to mm. disrupt their lives and the lives of others. And you can cease to be that person and you can know how you affected that change. And so, and, and it's a very common experience to develop enough, you know, what's called now mindfulness, which yeah. is, a, is a buzzword, but it, it, it enough, uh, enough of a capacity to observe the mechanics of your own disorder to notice that you're getting carried away by thoughts yeah. and to just pull the brakes earlier. Now see, I'm no, completely I, on board with that. I, yeah. I just don't know that that requires me to lose any sense of self. I can look at something it and say, it doesn't. it's a waste of my time to keep mulling over this thing that happened, yeah. so let it go and move on to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, you Is know, I, and I, you know, I've been, you know, when, with you and you've done these, some of these things and, and stage and and um, mm. and I know I admire that ability in, in in many ways and I admire I you know I think this this mindfulness I do think is useful at times but I, I just I also think though as human but, beings that it's also really useful to be mindless at times and 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 yeah, and, and get sure wrapped up in those we're, things we're and that's the words a, the same way but no no yeah. but I, I think I mean you know sort of uh, not get I think it's sometimes really useful to get wrapped up in these things and, and, I've, um, and grow from that. So I, I guess the point is that I think there, it's a really, it's a good, I, I think you're right that it's these tools and these, these training mm. to be more mindful is, is, is a useful thing. I, let's let's agree there. Okay. Um, and uh, with all the caveats implied, but, but no, no, I think it's a useful thing, and, and I think, and I, you know, I, I see you, and you're just calm, and I wish I could be that calm, and and <laughs> and and and, and um, I'm just not. Yeah. You know, I, I just think of that Woody Allen line all the time about meditation. You know, it's what? it's he does meditation because he ripens and then he rots. And, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, Woody and, uh, Woody Allen, Woody Allen, can we still refer to Woody Allen? Is, I was noticing there was a hush when I mentioned there, the name in the, in the, in the, is there a Bill so Cosby line? So I'm going to say it line, again, Woody Allen, he's actually a very funny guy and a great film director, and so I think it's okay to mention the name. Well, I, I think we've taken we've this lost about half as the far as we can go. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and, you know, you talk about mindfulness as a buzzword, at least within, you know, clinical psychology and treatment. I always, I, I don't care about the buzzword aspect of it, but I love the fact that we can teach people how to be aware of what's going on and how to be aware of what they're doing uh, in such a way that they may be able to overcome things without having to resort to pharmaceuticals and other things. Although perhaps, um, I, I don't know how far that can be taken and I will at least concede that while I don't know, I'm not convinced that what you say is possible from a purely philosophical who is the observer, hmm. moving the self down to where it may be co-equal with consciousness. I'm also not necessarily convinced that it's beneficial fully, but I'm with Lawrence well, in that I see... I'd love, it wouldn't have to be beneficial. I mean, it's either true or not. So it's like, it's possible that the self is an illusion, but seeing it to be illusory is actually bad for you or, or is a net neutral. Oh. You know, like, uh, uh, there's no, no guarantee that it's good for you but it just so happens to be good for you psychologically as testified by people who've done well, it. Well, you know, that's what I worry about, testify people who've done what's good for them. But and again, but, it's like exercise But, but you know, I would love to spend or, a day. Yeah. I really have thought about this. I'd love to spend a day with you. I mean, I'd love to learn new experiences and new techniques as one of a handful because I'm alive for a little while and I'd like to have yeah. all the, certainly the conscious experiences that are possible. And I'd, I'd actually, I would like to learn those tools. And, 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 and you know, you and have all of them at Burning Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> my, and, and I don't know if I could give you something in return, but I would love to do that. But I just think of it as, it, it is a, a remarkable thing to be able to experience the full kind of gamut of things that, the, that you 
that consciousness allows. And, and experiencing that gamut, I, I suspect, is good for everyone because we, we can, it gives us a greater perspective on ourselves and the universe, mm -hmm. which is why I do science. So, so I'll, 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 so we'll, we'll spend a day together. It might, if, it, if I only have a day, it might require drugs. <laughs> so, I'm, you're a, hard, I'm you're not a hard opposed case. to that. And, you're a hard and, case, and, Lawrence. And, and, and we can start there. Well, I think I, I, think I have a, a better understanding than I did in New York, and I'm intrigued about other stuff. Uh, and so that raises a question because this issue, obviously, you're presenting your experience, and it's very different from a bodybuilder's experience, because we can see that. Mm -hmm. And we can see certain things in your character, although I don't have your previous character mm -hmm. to compare it to. Well, but I mean, you, just to give you one local example that someone might find interesting here. You know, I used to be terrified of public speaking. I mean, that was actually just something, I would not do something like this. And um, it's, my, mindfulness is not the only antidote to being afraid of public speaking, but it is certainly a very useful component to it. I mean, the, the, there, there's no alternative to just speaking, right? You yeah, can't, that's you can't privately get over your fear of public speaking without ever speaking. But what you can do is, I mean, so if, if you feel anxiety before getting up on stage or giving a toast or, or putting yourself out there in some way, you can, feel, you can be willing, mindfulness is, rather than avoidance of this feeling of anxiety, it's a willingness to just feel it without judgment, without trying to push it away, without trying to change it, just feel it as energy in your body. And if you do that, it, become, it, it loses its psychological significance. It becomes something like indigestion or a pain in your knee or, I mean, something that doesn't, it doesn't capture your whole personality. It's just, it's just energy. It's just an appearance in consciousness. And if you, if you allow yourself to do that, well, then the half-life of this thing is... I guess I've been mindful, yeah. Nothing. I mean, I, I mean, I never thought of it in those terms. I, I, I have always thought that kind of anxiety or whatever is a good thing and just, and just sort of accept it. Well, that, but that's a reason. Speaking that's a or when I, when I yeah. teach too, I mean, yeah. I try to be as unprepared as possible so that I, I, I uh, no, seriously, to some yeah. extent, because I think it's good to be, to have that kind of anxious thought that people can see what you're thinking. Yes. And, and, and I think but that's, that's not debilitating way. anxiety. That's, that's no, it's not debilitating. Yeah. Were you, you debilitated? Have, well, I just, I was avoidant of the whole project. I just wouldn't. Re really? It. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. When but, was that? Because I know well, you I, for a while. And no, no, but before, before um, when my first book came out, I suddenly discovered I had to do a book tour, and there was just... But I met you, know, you know, just like, around the time your first yeah, book came out. You yeah. seemed pretty well, I just, I mean, zen I, even then. Well, I had been meditating. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, so I was terrified of public speaking, which is why I didn't become a preacher. Every, you know, mm -hmm. The people in my church is like, oh, God wants you to be a preacher, and I didn't want to do that, and I was terrified of it. My solution to being afraid of public speaking, uh, and I say this kind of half as a joke and half serious is, turns out if you're not trying to bullshit anybody and you're not overly concerned about people perhaps not agreeing or not liking with you, mm. public speaking is a piece of cake. Uh, you know, it, you know, it is. You and, just and talk, well, that helps. One, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's funny because I think of that because it, you know, I, when I watch musicians come out and I think, God, I wish, I used to think it would be terrifying to do that and then I realized they're just comfortable, they're doing what they feel comfortable doing and to, what can be more comfortable than just having a nice conversation? So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that, that I wish I could do that. I wish I could be as comfortable playing music as, but, but yeah, just talking. I, I, I never seem to me to be a, an issue. But it's, it's a hugely common fear. It might even be the most yeah. common yeah. fear. And it's not, but I mean, what you just suggested, thinking about the anxiety differently, you know, or, or, think, or, or noticing that anxiety doesn't feel that different from something like excitement, that yeah. has a very different, that you interpret differently. That's, that's called reframing, and that's something that is also, that's a useful skill to have. It's just, it's just well, they've co-opted everything I, that works. I, I, I don't like, yeah, yeah, it's all these labels are fine, but okay, if that's what it is. But, it, but it's, it's, it's different than, than what, it, what I'm recommending, but yeah, I mean, oh, but, both are good. You can do both. So we'll give, we'll give again, you... I think we, again, I think we're at loggerheads. Yeah. Maybe we should both be afraid of public speaking now. Yeah, I think many of the people in the audience together. wish we were yes. right now, actually, yes. because okay. we'd probably move on to something They're going to prove me wrong by booing us all off. So, Lawrence, mm -hmm. what's the next big thing in physics? And for those of us who haven't been paying attention, what's the big thing now? Okay. 
Well, the, I, al I do get asked, the first question I get asked a lot, because, and I, the answer is always the same, which is, if I knew, I'd be doing it. Uh, it's really important because we, the whole point of discovery is it's discovery. So the next big thing in physics will be the thing that I didn't expect. Uh, will be the biggest surprise that I can get. That's why science is fun, because you're constantly surprised, at least that's, for me that's the whole point. So I think there, I can imagine areas where there's lots of activity. Generally, if we're building in, in science, or at least in physics, the next big thing will come from an area where we have a new window on the universe. Because science and physics, even though I'm a theoretical physicist, is driven by experiment. It's not driven by theory. And, and, and so therefore the surprises come from nature. And so every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised. And the last, and that you know, then brings me, I guess, to the current big thing. I mean, so, so let me say, there are areas where we have, obviously, astronomy, we have a lot of new telescopes, the James Webb Space Telescope's going to go up next year. There's an air, quantum computing is an exciting area because it's a, a window on, on maybe on, on, on processes that might be relevant to understanding how we think, too. But, but the, the current big thing is this new window on the universe, I'd say, which is gravitational waves, is the fact that in this room, when I do this, I wave my hands, which I do all the time, I'm generating gravitational waves. And it's squeezing your head. <laughs> I've been Back feeling in, that. And, and it's getting smaller going. and bigger. And, and then this end is getting smaller and bigger. And that it's happening. And that, and that it's, it's here. And yet we never thought we detected it. Because gravity is the weakest force in nature. And, and, and let me just say one thing for those who haven't heard me talk about this. The, the discovery of gravitational waves is amazing because it seems impossible. The fact that anyone would imagine they could do this. So to try, gravitational waves are more intense for more violent explosions or more violent motions of matter. And nothing could be more violent in this universe today than, say, two black holes colliding. So we build this detector to try and look for black holes colliding around the universe. And those would produce the most intense gravitational waves you can measure. And so we build this LIGO detector, which has two arms. Each is four kilometers long. And if a gravitational wave comes by, it's really simple. One arm will get shorter, the other one will get longer. And we just have to measure that difference. Sounds easy. But to measure, to build a detector that could detect gravitational waves from the most violent events in the universe today, colliding black holes, you'd have to build a detector that could tell the difference in length between two four kilometer long arms. When a gravitational wave comes by, one arm would change in length by an amount equal to one one thousandth the size of a proton. Okay? Yeah. No science fiction writer would ever suggest that's possible. We, that's what we did. I mean, I, it's amazing to me that, that, that that's the kind of thing that, and, and it, it requires bravery, it requires dedication, and luck. Uh, the, one, the wonderful thing about that particular discovery that amazes me, it was a discovery of two black holes colliding 1.3 billion light years away. How? That means the signal took 1.3 billion years to get there. The thing, the detector went online, it, well, it went online 15 years earlier, but it was upgraded so it could do this. And they, and it was gonna, they started to test it on September 15th, I guess 2015. And Ray Weiss, uh, who was one of the designers of it and won the Nobel Prize along with others for the discovery, told the students, don't, you know, this is just an engineering run, don't take data. And of course, they didn't right. listen. And, um, and an hour after it turned on, that's when the discovery was made. An hour. Now just think that signal had been going for 1.3 billion years. If they turned it on an hour later, we would have missed it. But how, how often is it being pinged? I mean, well, it's, we, we didn't know how long often it would be pinged. We had ideas that it would be pinged maybe a few times, uh, 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 maybe once every month, maybe once every two weeks, maybe a few times every year. And I will tell you, the re uh, this, I'll stop talking physics in a second, but I'll tell you one of the neatest things. For Who's, who's wearing gold right now in the audience? Yeah, okay, good. Don't tell people out in Chicago when you walk out there, but, um, but uh, okay, so another event that was seen this year was not two black holes colliding, but two things called neutron stars, mm. which are amazing. It's stars, the, ma the size of the Earth collapsing to the size of Chicago in one second, producing a giant atomic nucleus called a neutron star, basically, whose density is uh, billions of tons for each teaspoonful of material, okay? When, the, when those co collapsed together, that binary black hole collided. Unlike black holes, which are just a lot of nothing, just gravity, there's nothing there but a hole in space that has gravity, neutron stars have stuff. So 
LIGO on another detector, uh, which then came on later, discovered these, these neutron stars, by the way, spinning around each other, each the mass of the sun, spinning around each other 200 times a second, mm. which is amazing that it happens. When they collided, not only gravitational waves came out, but stuff came out. So the LIGO detector s discovered it and told all the astronomers in the world, look, and they looked and we saw X-rays and gamma rays and visible light and we could study all these things we never saw before. And what we discovered, we never knew where things like gold came from. Because in stars you build things up to iron. But where do the heavy elements came from? Well, people thought maybe the collision of neutron stars. And what we could see from the X-ray radiation after that in the days following, we saw that an Earth's mass amount of gold was wow. created. Wow, that's cool. Something we predicted. But it really means every time, what you're, if you're wearing gold, that stuff was created in the collision of two neutron stars, and it's on your hand now. It wouldn't be there. You are really cosmic things, and I just find that amazing, that yeah. connection to the universe. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's the, that's, the physics, that's the physics segment. Now we'll go on to You just sold a stuff. lot of gold. Yeah. Buy gold, people. Yeah, sir. <laughs> No, it's I'm become, it, it's actually game, become, right. it's become less valuable now because there's a little more of it in the universe, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can't quite get to it. We could start a neutron yeah. star yeah. cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it would probably be as real as the other cryptocurrency. <laughs> Although, for something like the LIGO detector, the mere fact that you can measure the device sufficiently to construct it should mean that when you turn it on, you would just expect it to work because now you know how to measure. It's, no, it, no, you it, don't know if you're right. We've never seen, we didn't even know if black holes, solar mass black holes existed in the universe. We had ideas that they might, but we didn't know that. We, see, well, we don't we know see, when it's going to get pinged, but I'm saying you, you, the, the marvelous thing to me, and I could be you know, wrong because I don't know shit, but is the, me the precision of measurement required to construct it is the right. same as the precision. Yeah, but, but how do you know if you're be, when, when, a, when a truck hits a pothole 25 miles away, right. it produces a bigger signal than the signal from a black hole. So how do you know you're going to be able to separate it from the noise, yeah. which is one of the reasons why there are two of them. There's one in Hanford, Washington, one right. in Livingston, Louisiana, because right. it takes eight milliseconds for something traveling at the speed of light to go, which gravitational waves do, from one to the other. So you get lots of noise from wind, from all sorts of things. From, uh, and, and, but what you do is you look for the same signal in, in, in Livingston, Louisiana, eight milliseconds later than the one in Hanford, Washington, and that gets a lot, sure, a lot. Right. but still, the idea that you could somehow isolate that much noise was something I personally was extremely skeptical about. That, uh, uh, whether you could measure that distance is one thing, but the fact that you could separate everything else out, the fact that you could lose all that oh, other no. stuff. <laughs> and, 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 well, Are and you learning anything from this make a, history make a, of your own skepticism? Yeah, no, well, I, yeah, I was skeptical of that too, yeah, but in the, so. unlike other things, that was, a, that was definitely a good thing. Yeah, well. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm someone, being hard someone on Someone can you. teach you to build your own LIGO detector. And I will, couldn't. I couldn't. You will not I'm a theorist. Yourself, I'm, amazed, I'm amazed at experimentalists. That's why I'm not an experimentalist, because it was 25, 30 years, almost 40 years to build it. Just like the Large Hadron Collider. All the, the fact that people are willing, and we still are willing, hopefully, to devote lifetimes to discover things that, that have no practical significance whatsoever is wonderful. And we, no, I'm serious. Mm. Because, uh, 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 what the what do you that, make of that? Uh, so say, say more about that, because that it, sounds like a decadent thing to say. No, it's not, it because it's, it, you, the problem the is that the best thing about science, the problem with science is it produces practical things. And it's great. We wouldn't be here. Most of the people in the room wouldn't be alive, and we wouldn't be able to communicate if it weren't for those, technical, those practical things. But people don't realize that what the real virtue of science is a cultural virtue. It's the same virtue as art, music, literature, is to see ourselves in a new way. The same way yeah. the experience you get when you meditate. To experience ourselves in a new way. To get a new perspective on our place in the cosmos. And we never ask if the Art Institute is nearby. We, we never ask if a Picasso painting... Well, what's some what's a Picasso do. painting good for? Some it's, people do, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, exactly. And one of my... A uh, quote I've been, I've been framing a lot lately because it means a lot to me as I think of the current situation we're in, which I try not to. Um, uh, so when the budget for this new person who's there uh, came out, um, <laughs> and, um, 
Uh, so the first budget, so you, you know, zeroing out the National Endowment for the Arts, zeroing out the National Endowment for the Humanities, zeroing out the, um, uh, uh, the, the Institute of, of Museums, for example, all these things, zeroing out the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We're going to save $1.6 billion, a line item in there for a wall of $1.8 billion. What makes America great is the cultural things we generate the things that enhance the experience of being human. And, and the quote that I like is from a, the first director of the, the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, uh, Robert Wilson, who was asked by Congress in 1965, what, will, this, will this accelerator help in the defense of the nation? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, but it'll help keep the nation worth defending. If, yeah. we, if we don't have that, I mean, to think, to think that we would get rid of all of the things that make life worth living, which is, which is the cultural things that we enjoy to build a wall is just the stupidest thing in the world. And, 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 and we should, yeah, well, you can comment that too, but it's, yeah. it doesn't, and, and, and it is decadent, but when we are, when we are so bereft of, of any economic uh, well-being that we cannot afford to continue to ask fundamental questions of the universe and ourselves, yeah. it's over as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing is that you can never tell. I mean, even if you're convinced that the, the real virtue in science is helping people, uh, you can never tell where the line between just mere curiosity and useful knowledge You don't is know what's going to happen. And, I mean, yeah, yeah, so. the 50 percent of our gross natural product came from curiosity-driven research. Yeah. That's why it's a big problem nowadays. And, and a lot of people say, we've got to fund applied research and this and that. And that may help in the short term. But what's going to create the economic well-being of society 25 years from now yeah, is, the, is exactly. the research and fundamental curiosity-driven driven things. And when you say it's true that maybe science I actually don't think the science is to, the purpose of science is to is no. To I was just, just conceding to those people who do. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, and and you, you know, all, anyone who's done science knows that the reason we do science is very selfish, because we enjoy it. And that's that's. And when kids ask me, I say, you know, just do what you enjoy, and and that's the real reason science. They don't want to make the you know make the world great. They, they, they of course they would like that as a byproduct, but they just want to do what they enjoy, and that's. Why people do science? That's why people do music. That's why people do magic. That's and and, and if you don't enjoy it, you're not good at it. And and uh, and so kids now. That's another problem. I think too many kids are being driven to to not realize that. You know, we all end up doing things we don't enjoy, and we all do, many people end up in jobs that they might not. But when you're young, you shouldn't be driven to be looking for a career that's without being at least focusing on what you enjoy at the very beginning. And then if you have to give that up later, it's fine. But I really am sad to see a generation of young people being driven by, by you know, I want to go into Wall Street or something because I can make money quickly. And, and, and it's, right. uh, it, it should be the joy. That's, that's the central thing to do. Anyway. There was, right. a, there was a question, and now I have to rethink it, because it was, how do we encourage the next generation to care about science and truth? But if the real value is in encouraging them to do what they love, how do we get them to love truth? In a world where, you know, none of us can be experts about everything. Some of us aren't experts about anything. And anybody can cite their own expert. And in a world of fake news and you don't know who to trust, uh, I, I get this sense that people in general are giving up on whether or not they have access to truth. And I worry that the next generation coming up just won't even have a good enough understanding uh, to, to begin to care about whether well, what's real. The problem is the next generation, the new generation has got a lot bigger challenge than the old one, uh, than, 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 than certainly when I was growing up. And, and the problem is that we teach the new generation as if they're before, we, we, in schools, we, we, we you, still many people have this notion schools are to provide information, but there's more information in, in you know, my iPhone than there and more than there is in school. But there's more misinformation, and and so what schools should be teaching is not that information. It's a process for deriving. 
It's a process for finding out facts. It's not a bunch of facts. Mm -hmm. Science, it's a process for deriving facts. So it's the process we need to teach, the process to, ha to, to, to tell the crap from the, the nonsense from the real stuff. That's what science is all about. And we have to teach that skeptical process in schools. And that's all I care about, kids learning in schools, because most of what I've certainly learned as a physicist, I've learned after I got my PhD. And I think what you really want to build are lifelong learners, and that is not giving them a bunch of facts about when the Battle of Hastings were, was or, or what, what the 92 elements are or any of the other things that people are forced to, often, too often to memorize which causes them not, not to like science. It's a process of discovery and that it's a process of discovery is sifting, is learning how, not truth so much, but, but learning how to separate out the nonsense. And I think when you say how do you get people excited about it, I think people are born excited about it. What we do is we beat it out of them. Kids are natural scientists. No, well, I don't, I'm keep giving these applause lines. I didn't mean to do that, but those, anyway, those are machines. We put those machines, machines there. Make to, me yeah. feel better because I need that. You don't because you're in, in yourself. And, That's uh, right. <laughs> I, th I think there's more than that, though. I mean, I think we, I mean, implicit in, in something you, you just said is, I think, a crisis of meaning that people are feeling that is more than just loving science or loving truth or, or not wanting to be wrong. I think, I mean, you, I mean there, there's some, some scientists, even not all scientists can get meaning out of doing the, what they love and, and well, having that be science. Meaning. But a lot, not everyone's born to be a scientist. Not everyone is that curious at the end of the day. And they still struggle to have a life that's worth living. And obviously this is where religion is doing so much work for so many people. And what we're noticing now is, I, mean, I really see this focused quite uh, almost to a, uh, a laser beam in the, the sudden rise of, of Jordan Peterson, who we were talking about earlier, <laughs> who, um, who has some fans. Uh, and I, you know, I, I count myself one, in, in fact, in that you know, I've had some terrible conversations with him, but I notice, <laughs> Other people have great conversations with him. And when I hear him in conversation with those other people, fully 90% of what he says, I think, is great. But there, there's 10% that makes no sense, and, and that 10% really matters. And, 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 what, what that 10 per, and the fact that that 10% is surviving criticism among his fans or, mm -hmm. or, or not receiving any criticism reveals to me that there, there really is a hunger for a kind of quasi-religious... Uh, there's got to be more than reason way of thinking. And actually, I just th I thought that um, there's an analogy to draw to magic because so there, there's, there's real magic and there's fake magic, right? And, and actually, I think Dan Dennett was the one to point out that there's kind of a paradox here because the, the real magic is, in fact, fake, and fake magic is the, 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 the magic that people think might it be real. It was either Dan or Randy. Yeah. I can yeah. never get the citation yeah. right. So, it's, so the magic that's not really magic, but that relies on props and subterfuge and sleight of hand, that's the real magic. And then there's fake magic that people believe in and it's not really there. Um, and it's as though people, and, so, so, and the pleasure of enjoying real magic is not predicated on believing in the fake magic. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not, like when you do a magic trick, my pleasure in being on the receiving end of the trick is knowing that I got fooled, yeah, knowing I that I, I can't figure it out, knowing that it's not real magic, yeah, or you know, it is real magic, but it's not, it's not, it's not supernatural. And uh, that's the mystery, that's what's cool about it, right? Now, there are people who are out there pretending to have the supernatural skills, you know, this yes. happens in India. Someone with their skills goes to India and, you know, they go, they go to the ashram and they can, you know, they material, I mean, Satya Sai Baba, this, this Af Afro-headed uh, guru in, in Bangalore for years was, you know, materializing ash and, and jewelry for people and had, you know, tens of thousands of, of credulous students around him uh, for, for decades. And uh, he was clearly just a stage magician, but, what Peterson's style of talking about myth and uh, you know, Jungian psychology and religion and, and, and the, 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 the tools he's, he's 
advocate and that people use, part of, what's, part of the communication is that you need to relax your standard of intellectual honesty in order to make the most of these tools. It's, it's, almost, like, it's almost like to really have fun with magic, I'm, I have to think that, that something really spooky is going on. And that's, that's clearly false. And there has to be an adult, intellectually honest way of using archetypal thinking if it's at all useful. I mean, you have to be, you, to, to, there, sh there should be no place at which you need to lie to yourself or pretend to know something you don't but know. But the problem is, look, yeah, there should be no place, but we all lie to ourselves. I mean, we do it every day. You don't, well, but the rest of us do. Yeah, but well, but, well, um, but uh, no, we all tell don't ourselves, you, you know, that we like our that jobs or our spouses or, or, or we want to be on stage or whatever. And, and we all, we all, we're not, we're not ra just rational beings. And I, I talk to my friend Richard Dawkins yeah. about this all the time when we're on stage. Is that he, he doesn't understand that you could be not rational. But um, uh, so, so we all want to believe it. Like the X-Files, we all have these built in, it's, it, and it's probably evolution. Of course it's evolution, it's evolutionary psychology that's caused us to want to believe in certain things beyond ourselves for many reasons. And so what, what we have to do is learn, just like you learn, you know, I could use the analogy actually to the tools you were talking about there. Mm. The tools of science are tools we have to learn. Yeah. They're not natural, they're not easy, they're not intuitive, but they're tools that you need to build up and we all need to build those tools up to inoculate ourselves against nonsense. Yeah. And we need to more now than ever before because the internet is, has got you've got to have tools to tell the sense from the nonsense. And so, but, and we, what's great about science is that it's, it's 400 years of tools that have been built up, simple tools that we can use to get over our natural willingness to believe certain things like that which happens to us is significant, which is just, you know, we all believe that everything that happens to us is significant. And, and, and we've got to overcome that notion that uh, all the, that, that natural notion, and, and the only way I know to do that is science. I, I, and, but but yeah. to not accept that it's there is, is of course, naive. And, and it will always be there, and people will always be able to appeal to it. I suspect there will always be con artists and churches. And, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it would be nice if there weren't, but I, I think what we need to do is find a way to people are, are convinced that, that they get more comfort from that. And what we have to work is to try and convince people that you can get comfort from not knowing and from, and from uh, you know, having an uncertain future and, and being insignificant in a universe that doesn't give a damn about you. Or you can well, you be do. less uncomfortable about not knowing. For me, I, and you talked about it before, but we're, we're sort of essentially beating the sense of discovery and exploration out of natural scientists. Uh, how many times has a kid been in a classroom terrified that they're going to be asked a question because they don't know the answer and they desperately don't want to say, I don't know. And yet, I don't know is not only probably, in their case, the right answer, it may be the right answer for all of us. But all teachers and, and, and parents should, we go? should all, I mean, I don't know is the most important thing that we should sit, be able to be comfortable saying as, as adults. And, 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 it's, uh, and you know, because I, 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 I just thought of this a while ago. I was in Ireland. At, there was a wonderful movie that I guess I was in a little bit called, the, what's it called? It's about the Voyager, uh, uh, Voyager spacecraft. The farthest. You should watch it. It's a very beautiful movie that was made. Um, but I, I was talking to some people about education, and it's amazing to realize that when you discover, when any child learns something for the first time, it's the first time in the history of the world for them that it's been understood, and they don't never comes about except for that I don't know part. Because yeah. what you need to do is say, I don't know either. Let's figure it out, and then learning becomes a process of discovery instead of regurgitation. And that's what should be, that's, yeah. the, that's the orgasmic experience that everyone should have. I want to, uh, hopefully, now short, lost the other half of orgasm. Of there's, about, there's about five more minutes before we start taking questions, so if folks want to line up and remember the rules that I had before. But I kind of want to keep going on this, not the Jordan Peterson thing. He, I'll, you're going to have another discussion with him. I'm going to have one in April, and mm -hmm. I don't know enough to know whether I give him a 90-10 split. But this idea of meaning and purpose in life. Uh, 
you, you were lucky enough in, in New York, and Lawrence had met him before, uh, Chris Johnson came to that event, and he did the coffee table book, uh, which is at, like, theatheistbook.com, but it's 100 atheists giving their thoughts on meaning and purpose in a life without God. Mm. And when I hear someone like Oprah suggesting that atheists can't experience awe, and then I listen to Lawrence describing a lifetime of experiencing awe and how we can encourage that, it seems like this is, this is something that should be obviously false to people. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's really sad. And yet it's not obviously false. It is outside of where do we get our morals from, uh, this idea of meaning and purpose and how atheists and seculars can't have meaning and purpose in life or there can't be any meaning and purpose in a deterministic universe, that's, that's like the second most common thing that we hear yeah. if somebody's not actually making a classical argument for the existence of God. It's just like, how sad would life be if I had to stop believing in a God? And I remember at one of the events, there, there were some Catholic students sitting in the back uh, who during the Q&A thought they'd pull a gotcha by asking uh, Russell and I, ah, but which worldview is most beautiful? And my immediate response was, I don't care. I don't care which one's more beautiful. I care which, which one's more true. But if you want to know, I would think that the, the atheistic worldview would be more beautiful. I don't, you know, Hitchens would talk about how uh, uh, terrible it would be to think that somebody's watching you. But we don't consider our meaning and purpose in life. It, you, you guys talk to students all the time. If there's students in the room, do you want your parents to pick your major for you? Do you want your school or your but state I, to I assign think it? To get back to go complete circle to what Sam was talking about earlier, I, I, think, I think people make too much of meaning and purpose. I mean, it, it, namely, we should recognize that we make our own meaning and purpose. And it's, and it's our own. Mm. And it's, but in an objective sense, it's as big an illusion as Sam would say the self is. Well, that's, that's uh, what I was getting to, is and, that and, 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 you know, and so that's would, okay. We would rebel if the state tried to tell us what our meaning and purpose was. We would rebel if our parents or the school tried to tell us what our meaning and purpose is. And yet, for some reason, in the broadest range possible, people seem to laud this idea that they need to be given their, their lifelong meaning and purpose externally from a God. Externally, yeah. yeah. That, that, and, but also they want their meaning and purpose to be the same. They want it to somehow have some more significance because, again, yeah. it, everyone wants to be significant. So somehow your meaning and purpose has to have a cosmic significance, and Oprah well, is the prototypical example of I, that. I, think there's and, a, I, don't, I don't think we're as insignificant as you let on because I think you can, again, taking consciousness as the the focus, we, as far as we know, there's no place in the universe that is more meaningful than right here. I mean, the, the, the human consciousness is the best game in town that we know about. Yeah, and, so? And so, so that's a big deal. And no, we, it's, a big we deal. And, it's a big deal because we're here. But if we were yeah. there, then it wouldn't well, be no, such a big deal, well, right? What, what would be over there? Just well, a, maybe there's a other conscious beings. Well, there or, might be. There might be other conscious beings. The yeah, point is, but we don't know is, that. If we you're don't right, know that. if if we are the only, we should. I, I think I agree with you that we should. It's sensible to act as if we're the only conscious organisms in the universe, because maybe then we'll begin to take care of the planet on which we live mm. in a way that, that, that yeah. can make yeah. that sustainable. But, That's and, true. And, but the reason, what, but so the, there's an implicit value judgment there, which is, I think, is one I certainly agree with, which is if we manage to play our hand so badly as to cancel the future of our species, mm -hmm. right? If we don't get through this bottleneck yeah. of the, the 21st century, that would be tragic and it would be tragic only because of all the good and beautiful things we and our descendants won't get to do, because this is where the lights are on. I mean, this is the only place in the universe where we know the lights of consciousness are on. Yeah, and, yeah, I guess and, so. And in my, well, why, why is that such a well, lackluster? No, no, thing no I, you're absolutely right. It's a wonderful, no, it's a one, I'm happy to be conscious right now. It's a great, you know, while I have a chance, it's the, it's the, it, I mean, it's you were, only the best game in town, it's the only game in you town. You were just talking about a kid learning you know, the Pythagorean theorem for the first it, time. No, as, it's as fantastic. Being... We should all enjoy, realize that we have a brief moment in the sun and make the most of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm just thinking in a cosmic sense, if we, it is true, First of all, whatever happens, everything that ever happened to everyone in this room is going to be, in a cosmic sense, is going to completely disappear and be forgotten. So it has no cosmic significance whatsoever. Everything, we've, all the beauty, the Shakespeare plays, the art, the music, no one, it's all gone but in the, the far but, future. But the cosmos so, has no cosmic significance but, either. But, but the neat thing is, let's say we go, but, and, let's, and, and then it's not clear that there won't be other consciousness that arises 
on this yeah. planet yeah. afterwards, and and that would be wonderful then too. I, I, so, yeah, let's enjoy it, and let's. Uh, well, I mean, we don't have a choice. Except that, well, we mm. do. We do seem to have a choice, and some people in the White House don't mind not having a consciousness. See, and and, the, the, and this is where they get to. Well, yeah. This is where they, some of the particular theists get to the fatalism. The idea that, well, in the end, none of it's going to matter. And th that always bugs me because I'm like, who gives a shit about the end? Yeah, it matters exactly. now. Exactly. I, you know, the if, car if, I bought is going to rust away someday, but it gets me where well, I'm let's going take, now. Let's take, from what I learned from my good friend Christopher Hitchens, one of the more evil people in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no, not, not Christopher, M Mother Teresa. Yes. Um, and... and, and so I learned from him how evil she was, and she was evil because for exactly that reason. Because if you realize that, it's, that what we have is what we got now, and there ain't anything afterwards, then this becomes more precious. Yes. This becomes everything. But if you're like Mother Teresa, then you say, you know, the kids should suffer now. We shouldn't give them medication because in heaven, they'll, they'll benefit from it. And so you see this, you see the exact opposite. Take the real, real existence and make it as miserable as possible for some illusion in the future versus accepting reality and enjoying it. Well, to bring us full circle, mm -hmm. I think her fetish with suffering could benefit from some of what Sam was talking about of her lo she losing her <laughs> sense of self earlier. Uh, I don't know if you, you, if I trampled over over something you were going to add, but no, it was it, it's just a couple spots. implicit in in that fear, that theistic fear about what's the point if this doesn't last forever, is it completely diminishes the significance of now, as you yeah. said. I mean, it, it's the strangest idea to think that now doesn't matter at all if it doesn't last for eternity. Yeah, that's yeah. Like, that's like if ever there were a bizarre intuition that. That and, that, and, that, and that somehow we don't matter if the world universe wasn't made for us. That yeah. somehow it makes us, you know, it, it, mean, it means we don't, can't enjoy it or, or, or feel meaning in ourselves or care about or our experiences are relevant. If the whole universe wasn't created for us, what a, what a, uh, a, a more arrogant, I can't imagine a more arrogant, you know, and, and it yeah. really pisses me off in groups like um, the Templeton Foundation. Uh, who, that pretend to support science in you're the name you're of religion. You're just making friends all night. Yeah, I know. Um, because they say, we want the humble approach, as if science, I mean, and religious people say scientists are arrogant, but it's, what's more arrogant? Uh, what's more solipsistic than assuming the whole universe is made for us, whereas science is saying, you know, hey, it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. On that note, if we can get the, the lights up around the microphones where people are clearly lined up all the way out the doors so we can see. Uh, are people really lined up? No, they're not. The mic are the mic where are the microphones? So for my first trick, I'll make the microphones vanish. Uh, Where's the microphone? From their place. There they are. Oh, they're coming. Oh, I get it. See, these people are far more organized than we are. Are there any yeah, up there? This, this notion that, you know, this is one of the reasons why I tend to focus so much on religion. I do the Atheist Experience Show. I, I'm convinced that people have been sold a, a bill of goods that devalues all of humanity and I, I oh shit I don't know yeah. well, it's it, it, but it explicitly does do that it says it does that that's yeah. not a surprise no no yeah. okay they want to ask questions and I bought into yeah. it we'll start we'll start over here sir and, I, and and just if you're comfortable with it say your name and who your questions for or if it's for all of us and we'll try not to trample over okay uh, my name is Dove Weiss I'm a professor of religion at the University of Illinois mm -hmm. At Urbana Champaign. I teach the history of Judaism. I'm not a believer. Uh, my question uh, for you, Sam, is do you see any value in studying religion from an academic, okay. from an academic perspective? Um, and how do you feel about the fact that taxpayer dollars go to support the research that people like I do? In other words, can the study of religion contribute yeah. to our understanding of society and culture, yeah, yeah. or is religion? best left to the ash heaps of history like magic or no, other well, no, I, superstitions. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a fine thing to study. We study many things, again, that are not narrowly tied to utility. I, mean, I can make a very good utilitarian argument for studying religion because so many people believe it in earnest. So it's even more worth studying than something perhaps like art history or something that isn't, is 
purely about aesthetics. But art, I've got no problem with the, you know, the funding of art history. So it, it, we, it, to connect with what Lauren said, I mean, I said, I said decadent because that's a, a, a possible criticism, yeah. but the reality is it's a sign of, of the wealth of our civilization that we can spend time on ineffectual things. Right, I mean, we, I mean that's just merely beautiful, mere, merely curiosity-driven things. You know, the, the archaeology. You know, what's the use in that? Right. I, but, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I, by the way, I often, you know, when questions are directed at Sam, I'll answer them too. Yep. Whether I. <laughs> um, uh, but no, religion. I mean, it's even more important than that. Not just that so many people believe now. Religion is a central part of human history. So. If you're interested in understanding modern civilization, it would be insane not to understand the impact yeah. of religion uh, because it's been <coughs> one of the most important cultural components of humans since humans have been humans. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And as long as the funds aren't being used for proselytizing, I'm all in favor. Mm -hmm. I, I've been saying that uh, comparative religions courses shouldn't be electives. They, sh they should be mandatory. Mm -hmm. Well, and actually, to be even more specific, you, you, there's no, probably no more effective way to become an atheist than study religion. Yep. <laughs> On this side now, yes, sir. Hi. Uh, this question is for Sam or really anyone who wants to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, the new atheist is often accused of a kind of sociological... We, we can't hear you. You've got to get a little closer to the mic, I think. Yeah. Uh, the new atheism is often accused of a kind of sociological blindness or insensitivity. Um, my question is, uh, given sort of... I, mean, I think Sam has been unique among new atheists in acknowledging the need for a social equivalent of religion or some sort of something that performed the social functions of religion. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I mean, it's sort of left vague and you're not entirely certain. So my question is, what, why is it worth destroying something you acknowledge as sort of sociologically vital and utilitarian mm. um, in order to, in, it, why is it worth destroying that before you sort of know what to put in its place? And I, I'm asking it particularly in the context of like the social crisis among the working class, which mm. I mean is often attributed to the collapse in social capital, which is basically a euphemism in part for the collapse of organized religion. Right, right. Well, I guess two answers. One is that it's not a matter of aiming to destroy religion just to destroy religion. It's just, it's wanting to talk honestly about what we know to be true or mm -hmm. have good reason to believe is true or, or good reason to believe is false. And so it's very much in the attitude of science, just trying to, just trying to figure out what's real. But I would add that the reason why I hope we will one day empty the churches and empty the mosques is because of all the harm yeah. that way of thinking manifestly does. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so, a key point. And I think the harms, the harms of religion uh, vastly outweigh the benefits, and we can have those benefits by other means, and we, we get those benefits by, in other ways in a kind of piecemeal way. Yeah. Uh, and yes, I, I would argue that there are blind spots in, in secularism and we need to fill in some of those holes. But uh, no, I mean, just you take the extreme case, you take you know, the fundamentalist Islam or fundamentalist Christianity or the Jehovah's Witnesses or Scientology or just take, take the, the hardcore most devout of any dispensation the downside is just, it just advertises itself it's not just continuously. The, it's not just the extremes. I used to think in terms of those extremes until but I, I got more easiest, involved. That's the easiest places. Yes, yeah, it's the not, easiest it's places. Just, of yeah. course, it's easiest to look yeah. at those extremes, but it's, it, was, it was only, I think, after I, I did a movie with Richard, The Unbelievers, that, that we, I get letters, and we both do, that I, I, I had never appreciated the really insidious aspect of religion, in my mind, the most insidious. It's not those extremes. It's all the people in these communities that feel bad about themselves because they ask questions, because they doubt. Yeah. And I get those letters all the time. And they, and what, and, and, and yeah, okay, you don't need to talk. But um, uh, that, that uh, they feel alone too. They feel like they're the only ones and, and they feel bad for it. And that is the, in my mind, the, the, I think the, the really insidious aspect that's far more common than people realize because everyone doubts and we should all be encouraged to doubt. But, but also to add what Sam said, it's this, this notion, it's not as if you're t 
tearing things down. And we use that word loss of faith as if you're losing something. When you lose faith, you're not losing anything. We need to ask, and what Sam said is I agree with 100%, can we ask what are the th good things that religion provides in the sense of community or, 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 or some sense of belonging, and ask can we do it in a way that's real? It, because it, why do it in a way that depends on fairy tales? Because, you know, again, to bring up Noam, who, he said to me once, you know, I don't care what people believe, it's what they do. But the problem is what they believe influences what they do. Yeah. And if your worldview is based on nonsense, then you're going to do nonsense. Anyway. Okay, well, now we can plot again. I'm saying. Hi, my name is Lucy Anderson, and thank you so much, Matt, for bringing up the uh, uh, idea of truth because uh, that's what my question is about. I'm going to ask you guys to tap into your creative side here and tell me if you had an artist who you could commission to make a piece called Truth and they were going to just depict truth in the most uh, intense and perfect way, what would they make? What do you want the artist to make? Sam, don't say like a copy of the Magritte painting with the clouds <laughs> over the face. Well, if I could give you a <laughs> off-the-cuff answer that would be satisfying, I would be that artist. Yeah. I, don't, I, I, I so think I don't, I'll, I'll start then. Okay, one, yeah. Yes. I could do it because do it. I think a, the, the best example of truth would be a blank canvas. With gesso no. or no, just, just blank, fiber. nothing on it, blank stuff. Because that's what that that's to me because it invites you, it's inviting to you to to, to create something, and. And, and oh, I think uh, that's dangerous. Hold on. No, no, but hold on. No, no, I'm not being in the, I'm not saying that in the pat way. I mean that truth is really an anathema to science. I mean, believe it or not, science isn't all about finding truth. There's no, in physics, there's no such thing as absolute truth as far as we know. We just, there's things that are likely and things that are unlikely, and there are things that are wrong. There's absolute falsehood. Yeah, That's true. There's absolute wrong. You're falsifying against a, a sense that the reality is some way. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And you're trying to get closer and closer so to that, it. That's but there's truth. no idea that encompasses all of reality yes. exactly as far as we know. Some string theorists hope they would do that, but they haven't. <laughs> and and, and so I'm, I'm not being facetious. They really did think there might be a theory that described nature on all scales. We have no physical theory. The best physical theory in the universe right now is something called quantum electrodynamics. It's great, but it only works over part of of the range of, of life. So, so there is, so we have this blank canvas and we, and to try and pretend we're capturing truth is always to some extent illusion, it's illusion. It's getting closer and closer, but never real. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm on, partially on, on board with the idea that I don't know that we necessarily have access to truth. I'm, I don't think we have absolute certainty about anything. The, for me, the painting, because I have a compatibility model, where essentially truth is that which conforms to reality. So any accurate painting of nature would be sufficient of me to pick, to pick truth. And absent that, I think I'd like just a single Venn diagram with one circle with A and not A, and then I'm fine. But when you say conform, yeah, okay, that's good. I like that. But when you say conforms to reality, what you really mean is you make predictions and you test them, yes. and you see if they're right. That's what it means to conform to reality. There's no other, there's no other definition that I can think of. Yes. Or you, you see when they're wrong. I mean, your, your falsifiability is the measure of... of yeah, science. yeah. I mean, so you're capturing some aspect of reality if you're right, yeah. but you're not necessarily right. You're not wrong yet. But you yet. know when you're wrong, you're wrong. Yeah. And that's, and then it's just like, like Sherlock Holmes said, you know, you get rid of all the stuff that doesn't work and what's left is probably, probably got some semblance of reality. Tentative, probabilistic, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Well, that's why we should never use the word believe. No. We, well, I, still, I try not to use it anymore, but it's either likely or unlikely. It's not that I believe this or believe that. Remember that. Don't ever use it. And, and go back and watch the, uh, the, the event that we did in, that Krauss and I did in, in Toronto, where I, I am fully fine with the idea of using the word believe uh, and not the word faith. But we had that. Yeah, kind of and, and you were wrong then too, but it's okay. <laughs> And yet, curiously, you agreed with me because if by belief all you mean is I am convinced that this is likely the case, then there's nothing wrong with saying I believe. But, and I can be convinced otherwise if it's not. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, sir. This is a question for the entire panel. Please feel free to draw on your own personal experiences when you answer this. But tonight, you stress the importance of raising a future generation that believes in science and reason and is free from faith and uh, Stone Age myths. Sam, you've described religion in the past as being the motherload of all bad ideas. I'm trying to raise a two-year-old in a part of the country mm -hmm. that has more churches than museums or libraries, unfortunately. 
what would you recommend would be the best way and at what age would you address these issues with them so that they can be raised without internal anxieties, without feeling ostracized from their community, but without the mother load of bad ideas mm. on board before reason and science has a chance to improve their lives and have them grow it further? Yeah, well, it, I mean, the first thing to recognize is that your two-year-old is already a non-believer, right? Your yeah. two-year-old does not. <laughs> so if you don't screw that up by... Just keep it, yeah, just don't, don't screw it up. That's know, right. Reality will, will cooperate and... Uh, I mean, if, but my view of this is that you don't want to... You don't want to put your kid in a situation that is that is starkly uncomfortable. You're not you're not putting your, you're not you're not raising a little atheist to put on yeah. the front lines of this culture yeah. war, right? <laughs> so, um, my, in my experience, you know, raising two girls, I've never had to lie to them about anything, and the the questions come when they come, and they and they and they, these these kinds of considerations become relevant when they become relevant. And you're not teaching them contempt for other people. You're not teaching them contempt for, for uh, the, the people they will meet who are religious. You te you're teaching them difference. I mean, you know, some people celebrate Hanukkah, some people celebrate Christmas. Uh, you, this is all, this, it all can be in the spirit of understanding the world's religions in an academic sense and, and you know, just aesthetic differences and cultural differences and, you know, different kinds of foods. And none of it, get, none of it need acquire the charge of sectarianism until they're grown ups and they can actually deal with, you know, just how closely people hold these beliefs and how freaked out they get when they're challenged. So I, I haven't, you know, I, my old, I mean, again, I haven't walked into this. I only, my oldest daughter's nine, but even as, I mean, she's, she knows exactly what we believe and don't believe and she, you know, she doesn't, she's aghast that anyone believes these things, but she's socialized to the point where she's not, you know, she's not an asshole, right? So she yeah. just, <laughs> so it, it's, no, not, it's not hard. It's, it's not really, hard. you know, your point is really well taken, especially if you live in a, a you know, if, you, you don't want, one of the reasons that I, I heard at, a, at a, a skeptical meeting why there may be less, fewer women who, who are there is because of the fact that in certain communities, if you're a, recognized as a non-believing family, people don't want your kids to come over there or vice versa. And so, and, 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 and caregivers who are in this in the world, for the most part, are generally more, more often women, are more sensitive to that and are more hesitant to have their children labeled that way. And of any label is a bad label in that sense. And, and, and the fact that we even label kids, the first time I think my consciousness was raised in that regard was, was when Richard Dawkins showed this beautiful picture from, from a newspaper, Christmas time, and there's four little kids together playing, and one is you know, a Christian kid, one's a Jewish kid, one's a Hindu kid, one's a Muslim kid. And he say, Jewish kid? And why don't we say, you know, neoliberal kid? When we say, I mean, how you label a three-year-old uh, 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 you know, by, by a, a very complex idea of, of Judaism or, or Islam or Christianity or any of these things, the fact that we even label them is the worst thing we can do to them because they, they're not that. As I said, they're born unbelievers. But I think the thing you can, you sh can do along the lines of, and I have a much older daughter now, um, and, and an, another stepdaughter is now a teenager, so I, I try to encourage this, is that... Um, is just encourage that safe questioning, that any question is okay, first of all, that questioning is a good thing, and that not to trust your answer. Literally, that to be skeptical of what you say. Yeah. And I don't have kids. Yeah. But super quick, love your kids, know that you're going to screw it up, and don't panic if things don't go as planned, <laughs> because I was a believer for many, many years and turned out okay, so things can get fixed. <laughs> On this side? I have a short but two-part question for Lawrence Krauss. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, if Einstein could see the way people use smartphones today, uh -huh. do you think he would ever regret sharing his research? with people also in that same way do you think there's any scientist that has 
invented something or discovered something that helped humanity and thought, kind of wish I didn't tell those people because they're like really ungrateful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good question. I think, I think, I, I think Einstein was, was, was fascinated by popular culture in his own way. And so, uh, so he would have played with uh, smartphones, I think. Um, uh, but, but it comes back to the more general thing. I don't think the scientists ever discover anything for anyone else. They don't discover it for other people or to make, or to, you know, they discover it because they want to know. And that's, and, 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 that's one of the pe reasons that, that that's unfortunate, because you know the scientists are doing it for themselves, but to be but there's a requirement. I mean, if we're going to create knowledge, we have an obligation at some level to disseminate it, and that, that's why I spend a fair amount of my time trying to do that. I think it's equally important, but it's also not an excuse for scientists to then step back and say, I'm not interested at all in the social or political ramifications of what I do. I think that's, uh, that's absolving themselves as responsibility, not because they have a special role as scientists, but because I think every citizen has an obligation to utilize, um, to recognize that they live in a society and the tools and the things they develop have an impact on that society. And we all have to be political beings. And so scientists need to, need to play a role in the political process like everyone does, but because science is so successful, that role is particularly important. I mean, I have friends of mine who are, there are very few, there's one PhD physicist in Congress right now, Bill Foster from Illinois, actually. And, um, and, and you know, if you come from that district, vote for him because he's a good guy. But, but uh, I, and I'd like more scientists in Congress, but I don't think that, that that's the solution. Science should inform public policy, and an informed public should make decisions about how to use that public policy. So, so scientists develop things for themselves, but, but those who say, well, I'm not going to worry about the implications of my research, are just being irresponsible, like anyone else is being irresponsible, if they don't care about, about the implications of what Congress is going to do for the dreamers, say, for, for, for example. I mean, it's just irresponsible because we are, we do have a social compact and we all, the whole point of having an advanced society is that we all have skills that we can use to, to make it better for everybody. Anyway. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name's Andrew Spanner. Um, this question is for Sam. I've struggled with addiction my whole life. In your view on free will, is it just my luck and experiences that determine if I can stay sober, or can someone like myself make a decision to change their life and stay sober because they want it bad enough? Can you expand on free will as it relates to addiction? Yeah, well, you can, you can definitely decide to do something or not do something and have that decision be the proximate cause of your doing that thing or not doing it. And you can more and more understand all of the variables in your environment and in your relationships that support or undermine that effort. Addiction is, a, is an especially charged example, but take something that has no charge. You're just learning to play the piano, right? I mean, if you, if you wake up tomorrow really wanting to learn to play the piano, there's a way to do that. And then there's, uh, there are a million ways to fail to do that, right? So, but there's, there's a very narrow path that you have to stay on in order to, to come out a, a competent pianist at the end, right? And it entails practicing the piano and studying with a teacher and being interested in music and all of that. And so it's not, you don't, you don't learn the piano by accident, right? And you can't just wait around to see if you learn the piano. It, you, you have to actually take all the steps. And so it is with, with getting free of addiction. Right? It, and so there's all, all these rational steps you can take, but none of that requires free will. It's still, it, you, you still have the, the mind and, the, and the, the exact brain you have in this moment, right? And you know, if what I'm saying to you now makes sense, that's, it doesn't make sense by virtue of your free will. Right? If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't 
not make sense by virtue of your free will. I mean, it's like it, it, everything is just happening in each moment, but part of what's happening are all of these other things that can arise in you that can, that can for good or for ill, you know, so you can, you, so you can more and more witness the downside of, of addiction and, um, and surround yourself with people who support that in you. Uh, or you could do the opposite, right? And, and that will all have a, a cascade of effects. And those effects, again, will not be demonstrative of free will, right? It's just, it's, it's demonstrative of the, the causality that, that helps make a mind and body what it is. And we're, we're all part of this, this, this causal fabric of, of you know, just intersubjective reality. I mean, you're affected by everything. Things you hear, things you read, things you watch on television, conversations you have, glances that, that you know, people give you, uh, you know, the, the amount of money you get, the amount of money you lose. I mean, all of it is, is a cascade of influences and um, it all matters. It all, has, it all is causally summing to something, to, to this next moment in your life. Uh, and the, the flip side of the, of the no free will argument is that you actually don't know how fully you could change in the next moment. I mean, you're, you are, you are, you're an open system. I mean, you can radically change your life. You can be fundamentally different from who you were yesterday. I mean, the example I gave of being afraid to speak in public, right? At a certain point in my life, I decided, well, I need to speak in public. There's got to be a way to do this. So now I'm going to start doing it. And almost immediately, I was someone who had to regularly put himself in circumstances like this, there's no problem now. I mean, I, this, is, this is a totally anxiety-free thing for me to do. That was not, it was not at all obvious that changing myself that fully was possible, but it's clearly possible, right? And that's, that's true on a uh, on hundred other fronts, and you just, and that's part of what, that doesn't entail free will, that just entails causal effects. Uh, it, I think you, know. you can even be, build on that, especially in the case of addiction, where you feel like you have no control in some sense when, when, you, when you experience addiction to anything. But if you recognize, by recognizing in some sense you, the lack of the existence of free will, you can use that in your favor. You can say, what is going to help me determine my behavior and how can I influence that how, by education, by surrounding myself with the right mm. people. So basically recognizing that your decisions are going to be influenced by a whole bunch of factors and so, and, and using that and acknowledging that, you can then try to orient yourself so that the factors that impact on you are the factors that are going to drive in the direction that you'd like to go, and, and so that, that reinforcement. So I think accepting the fact that we all make decisions because of a host of factors, and we are influenced by our environment, and we are influenced by our peers, and we are influenced by education, utilize that influence uh, to help direct you to the extent uh, that it can to try and overcome uh, addiction, N not that it's easy. That, that's actually a very important point that I, I just want to emphasize. That, I mean, the science on will it comes to that punchline, which is your will is very unreliable as a, as a way to, to stay on any path. So you do need to understand the environmental contextual drivers yeah. of your behavior. And so I mean, if, you're, if you want to go on a diet, the first thing to do is to get all of the junk food out of your house, right? Because you, you, have, to, you have to hedge against your future self who's going to suffer weakness of will. Because yeah. we, weakness of will is coming. So you can't have the drugs or the food or whatever it is available because, because your will is going to break down. And the science behind that is very well understood. So you need to, you need to uh, approach it as, as an environmental. And, and if it helps. And good, good luck to you too, yeah. sir. Yes. Yeah. And if it helps. The three of us aren't in complete agreement on free will. We discussed a little bit. But we're all in agreement that we're thinking agents with desires and that there are actions that we can take to bear those out in the way that, that both of them uh, were talking about that. I think your question betrays something that Sam and I spoke about, uh, that Dan Dennett has a fear of if there's no free will, people will fall into this idea of fatalism and that everything that happens to me is either my fault as a failed being or the cosmos just batting me around like a play toy. Um, and I understand that fear, but I don't share that fear. Uh, and I think the fact that there are three individuals up here with slightly different views on free will, all telling you that 
whether or not you have free will is irrelevant to the fact that you're a thinking agent with desires and you can cognitively process a plan to meet a goal. Yeah, that's good. Let's move off free will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good luck, sir. Yeah. Hi, my name is Vinny. I'm from Chicago. Hey, uh, that's a, a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I have kind of a two-part question. Um, I love all you guys. I follow you regularly. I consider myself a Hitchensian. <laughs> I, uh, I find myself more and more stuck on the baggage of language, and it's a common topic. Um, the idea that there's so many people right now that are talking themselves in circles to try to fit a certain narrative. Jordan Peterson does it, where he's so stuck on trying to redefine his idea of truth that he just runs in circles and circles and circles until he wears you out, basically. Um, so could you, Sam, please just give him the intellectual ass-kicking he deserves? Do it, Sam. And then my second, the second one is for uh, Professor Krauss. Would you sign my tits? <laughs> That, that, uh, that, a, a year ago, I might have said yes, but the answer is no now. <laughs> that question was 14 billion years in the making. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Stars yeah. died, just so we could <laughs> yeah. get those questions. Are you wearing gold by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, but th thank any, you for your vote of confidence. I, I, will, I will try. Okay, um, this is another one for Sam. Yeah. Um, how much would you recommend that the average person pursue um, meditation and spiritual inquiry if someone has the ability, like you, to spend a decade of their life um, pursuing this? Is that you know, worthwhile? How much um, does someone need to work to hit you know, your level of enlightenment or a level that's worth having? Well, I think any non-zero amount is already a lot, a lot more than most people are tending to do. So five minutes a day, can actually be a, a huge change in your life. Uh, it's, a, it's a skill like anything else, and, and so practicing it regularly is, is really the only way to, to, to acquire it. But it's just, it, it totally depends on your individual circumstance and interest and, and all the rest. But going, going from zero to five minutes, can, five minutes done wisely and in a way that is intelligent can be a huge difference. I mean, it's like, it's like going from being totally sedentary to working out a, a little bit every day. And I mean, that's true even with physical exercise, even zero to five minutes, if it's the right five minutes, can be, uh, you know, 75% of, of the, the, the health difference in exercise. I mean, so that's so maybe, yeah, you know, but I would just say that, yeah, but, um, um, you, no, no, I would say, look, different strokes for different on folks. If it works for you, great, but maybe five minutes of exercise is just as good. And so it's, I, I think it's hard to, it depends on the individual. And I think so, if you have to try things and see what, what, what helps. What, what percentage and, of the population would you not recommend physical exercise to? <laughs> um, I know, I know one... Uh, no, no, but look, it's a matter, look, no, no, it's not, it, but the point is it's a matter of priority, so you've got a certain amount of time in the day. Yeah. And some yeah. people spend three hours a day on physical exercise, some people spend five minutes, and people have to choose their priorities. But is there, and, but and is there works, anyone who and, you And wouldn't? for some people, three hours a day of physical exercise is what makes them, uh, allows them to survive the rest of the day. And for some people, five minutes is, is, is too much. And so, uh, of course, it's, it's, empirically clear that physical exercise is a good thing. Right. But you and I would, uh, but I know there are many days when, when there are, I have other priorities. I like to work out every day if I can, but, but there are days when I can't. And so, uh, you know, there are other things that you need to do in life. And so you have to, life is a balance. And there, there are and so, usually but, other things you need to do in life. Yeah, but, but I would, but, but, you know, I guess what I'm really worried about, and I don't think you're really saying this, so maybe I, 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 I hope you weren't, is that, I can't tell you what's the best thing for you. You have to try a bunch of things and see what works. And it's good to try a bunch of things, but, but it's not clear that the same thing will work for everyone, in my opinion, anyway. I'm, uh, anyway. Uh, 
it's a, the analogy to physical exercise is a good one. And if you can't, if, if a certain kind of physical exercise doesn't work for you, that can be understood. You know, if you, if you can't do push-ups because you've got an injured shoulder or whatever, there's some workaround. It's not like, yeah. pu it's not like push-ups don't work and it's not like yeah. push-ups aren't for everybody. They're just not for people who have, for whatever, for whatever reason, some reason why they can't do push-ups. But there's some principle, there's a principle by which push-ups work for most people that can be invoked even in the case of mm -hmm. somebody who's missing an arm or has mm -hmm. an injury. Um, and that's true of, of meditation too or, or mindfulness. There's some version of it uh, which in moderation I would, and, and the research I think is more and more bearing this out, is basically good for everybody. Now there are people who suffer various kinds of psychopathology where I certainly wouldn't recommend that they go on intensive retreat. You know, you don't want to go into silence for 10 days and meditate for 14 hours a day if you have you know, some kind of thought but, disorder or, but, you know, you're but, bipolar but, and you're, 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 you know, I mean, you're... I think you're right that there are things that meditation provides that are good, but, but you might say to someone, spend a half an hour playing the piano if that's what you... I mean, because for yeah. some people, it but doesn't have to be meditation. It's, it could be you get the no, same but that, benefit. But, that, but that's just not true. I mean, as witnessed by you. I mean, you don't know what I'm talking about. No, you're right. right. Yeah. I mean. so, so, yeah. That's exactly what, and it's a different version of what I was going to ask because, you, you know, you, you said something which, you know, how, what percentage of the population would you not recommend physical exercise to? And I would say the portion of the population that doesn't need it to have a fit and balanced life. There are people who, the cor through the course of their daily actions, are never going to, the, the highway workers are not going to need but, to go to the gym. They're getting exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. But what I'm saying, when we tie this in, um, if throughout the course of, we'll just use me as an example because I'm perfect, uh, my daily life, I get the same benefits of easing suffering and not dwelling on things and anxiety mm -hmm. it, it, through, without actually going through 10 days of not talking because mm -hmm. that would kill me. Uh, well, but, but then you would become interested, you should become interested in why it would kill you. I mean, so if you, if, you, if, you suddenly put, if you suddenly put yourself in that circumstance and found it intolerable, the mechanism by which you were finding it intolerable could become interesting to you. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not objectively in, intolerable, it's just you hate it. And that is the wellspring from which all of these other forms of, of restlessness and dissatisfaction are, are going to ambush you in your life. You know, if you can't be alone with yourself in a room without your smartphone, you have a psychological problem. I'm, I'm good with and, that. And, it, and it, it is not an accident that solitary confinement is considered a punishment even inside a maximum security prison. I mean, so you, you're, you're, you're put in a box with murderers and rapists, and most people still dread being alone in a room more than being out with the murderers and the rapists. Well, because we're natural. Well, hold on, but yeah, l let me. I'm going to keep trying to. Take we're the naturally advocate. social I agree primates. With the, yes. the law, but but I mean, we are social beings. Humans, humans can't survive alone. We yes, just can't in, survive in the state with, of nature. Uh, that's true. Yeah. And so to not acknowledge the fact that we need social contact is to not acknowledge what it is, means no, to we, be human. So it's not a bad I, I, thing. I'm not. Not. I'm not. I'm not saying we don't need or want social contact. I'm saying if the, the best way to enjoy social contact is to actually be happy already. It's not to need it in the way that pe needy people need it. The people who are f afraid to be alone, afraid to lose you, afraid to... Uh, well, sometimes that, that, that's, actually the best that time complicates for social... relationships. Yeah, well, I'm going to keep disagreeing because yeah. it's fun. But um, uh, the, no, but sometimes the best social contact that I can have is when I feel miserable and then I'm with someone, let's say my wife, who makes me feel better. That, that, that's great. That's a great, that's a great, that's a great so I don't have to be happy to, to have a wonderful social contact. My experience can make me, can take me out of depression. Yeah, but, but there's the other side of that experience, which is you're miserable and now you're making everyone around you miserable. Well, that's true. I do yeah. that as a rule. I mean, so if, you, if, a, if, you, if my wife were here, she would tell you the, oh, the, no, no. the, 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 the frequency with which I complain about petty stuff to her is not a, it's not a, it's a, it's not a feature, it's a bug, right? And you, you, you do that? Oh, sure. I never yeah. figured you did but, that. But the, but the, I would do a lot more of it if I didn't meditate. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I, I would argue that you're not making them miserable because they're responsible for whether or not they Let's get miserable. some more questions. Yeah. Anyway, well, over here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Ryan, and this question's for either one of you. Um, 
So I want to preface it with saying that I love your book, The Moral Landscape, Sam, but I have a question in regards to, so you talk about in your book, obviously, that science can influence and tell us about objective truths about reality, but you often appeal to a low-hanging fruit where you talk about, you know, if you cut off someone's head, mm. that's objectively, you know, wrong. But when you start talking about more nuanced things like healthcare policy or economics, do you think science can still influence or tell us about objective truths in those fields? And if so, could you give an example? Yeah, well, so just to tell you why I, I would go after the low-hanging fruit for part of the argument is that it, I'm, I'm making an argument that there are right and wrong answers whether or not we can find them. I mean, that is, that is the nature of scientific truth. That is the nature of realism in any area, whether it's scientific realism or moral realism. The, it is a claim that reality is a certain way whether anyone in this room knows it or not, mm -hmm. right? And it's possible for all of us to be wrong. It's possible for just one person to be right. It's possible for that person to die and now everyone is left is still wrong, right? So it, it's possible not to know what you're missing in every area that, where there is a reality that's bigger than you are. And it's, that's also true of the, the moral domain as defined by the possibilities of experience in this universe. This universe admits of, of an extreme range of possible experience, and we've all been buffeted around the continuum of you know, just pointless misery to sublime, you know, rapturous pleasure, uh, and we want a lot more of this and we want less of this, and uh, both personally and collectively. And, uh, and again, we, we, you could be more or less informed about the dynamics of that movement, right? So you don't know that you know, substance abuse is as bad as it is for you, say, or you don't know that this relationship is you know, undermining your happiness. And, uh, but there's a right answer there, whether you know it or not. Uh, you don't know how much happier you would have been had you married that other person. Or, so there, and there, there are many of these questions that we will never find out. We'll never get the data. You'll never get, you know, exactly what is the weight of every person in this room combined if we could put you all on a balance. We could actually give a pretty good estimate, right? We know how many people are in here almost. We know the average weight of a human being. We could get within, I'm sure, 5% of the exact number. But the, there is an exact number, right? Well, you know, to, well, to, whatever, to whatever measurement error and to, to whatever decimal place you, you <coughs> arbitrarily care about. But uh, we're never going to find it. So th this is a difference between answers in practice and answers in principle. In principle, there's an answer to that question. In practice, we'll never get the data. And so, that, so many of the, the, the more complicated questions of you know, wh what healthcare policy is, would maximize the well-being of, of everyone living under it, that's something that, to a first approximation, we will, we will want economists and, and other smart people in the relevant areas to eventually figure out, but whether we're, we'll ever be sure we have the right answer, we will never be totally sure what, what better answer we could have found or what in, in some alternate universe the counterfactual answer paid you know, better uh, results. So it's, it's, we're still living with, with un, impressive uncertainty, and yet it's clear we can navigate in this space, and it's clear there are, there's a there there. There are answers to be discovered that, that will surprise us. And, and that's, um, that's, all, that's my claim with respect to morality. It's, it's a navigation problem. Yeah, I, and I, I, it's one area where I think Sam and I are in extremely close agreement. But to take it even further, there is, you won't get to that answer by revelation. Right. The only way to get to that answer, I mean, and you might not know what the right answer is, but the only ways to, to, to get there are, are using rationality and empirical evidence. And that, those are the only ways to even get close. So, so any other way just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Landon Clip. I'm a student at the University of Illinois. Uh, my question is for Sam. Um, in your book, Waking Up, you talk extensively about your travels uh, to India. Uh, you spent uh, a significant amount of time amongst various gurus. Um, my question is, what possessed your brain to upend your life? Uh, to do that sort of thing? Um, and also, would you recommend uh, that experience to the regular person, or is it enough to experience it vicariously? 
Well, it, so uh, as I said in waking up, and I think in the first chapter, the first page, the what possessed my brain will literally possess my brain. It was a it was a drug experience that I had on MDMA when I was 18, I think, uh, and the. The, the, the net result of that was I, I could no longer overlook that it was possible to be much different than I was tending to be, right? So I, I took the, I mean, not everyone has this experience and not everyone draws the same message from it, but the message that is to be drawn from it is that it's possible to have a very different experience than you're tending to have neurologically. It's a neurological fact. And the drug isn't doing anything to your brain that your brain can't do, right? It's, it's, just, it's just pulling the levers and turning the knobs that are already in there. Uh, and uh, so I've, it's possible to come away from that experience thinking, well, you know, MDMA is, this, is very interesting, uh, but unhealthy to take again and again. So, the, you know, there goes that project. Uh, <laughs> Or you could realize that there are other ways to overcome all of the limitations in yourself that you were noticing overcome in that experience. And, and that's the message I drew at, the, at that point. So I became very interested in just what other methodologies were out there and what other philosophies and, and conversations were out there. And again, so as you move into that esoteric eastern side of the, the bookstore, you, there's just your there's just a tsunami of, of woo and, and craziness that you get hit with that you have to use your critical scientific faculties to differentiate. Uh, but there's a, a central strand of empiricism and methodology and just, just learning to pay attention to experience. Uh, and, it's not, and this is why mindfulness is, is everywhere now and, and, a lot of, and chanting to Krishna isn't. Right, because it, mindfulness really is just, it, it's, it's just paying attention to experience. There's nothing you have to believe. There's no, you don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't have to care about Buddhism. There's, it, is, it is as culture-free an act of attention as anything could ever be, right? It's, it's literally just attention, it's just directed attention to whatever. It's just noticing what you notice in each moment. So if, you, if you're hearing and you're sensing your body in space and you're seeing changes in light and you're f f noticing thoughts arise and you're noticing moods arise, if you're just, you're not all that stuff, stuff is happening anyway. Mindfulness is just the faculty of mind that notices in real time what you're noticing, right? Which it, which it, so the only difference between that and what, you're, what most of us are tending to do is you're no longer lost in thought in that moment. You're not having a conversation that you're not noticing. You're no, if, if, if thoughts are rising, you're noticing the next thought arise. So there's zero culture, there's zero belief, there's zero iconography, it's just pure attention to experience. And it's um, that, you know, I, I certainly recommend that. There's no need to go to India and meet anybody to do that. Uh, at a certain point in my life, I felt it was incredibly useful to, to go into a, a crucible of a, of, of a retreat, a silent retreat, to do nothing but that for a period of time. Because it is just the first thing you discover when you actually make a serious attempt to do this is that it's incredibly hard to do. I mean, you just, you cannot pay attention to anything for more than five seconds. Uh, and, and, it, and that should become, that should be interesting to you because that, it's, that's a very strange feature of our minds and there's no way that's optimal. Right, it's like the, the idea that that is just, that that default setting is somehow this perfect, you know, fine tuning of the human psychology to its optimum, that's just patently insane. Uh, and then once you notice that most of the thoughts that are intruding in your experience are unhappy ones, right? You know, you're trying to listen to what I'm saying, but you just got distracted and the thing you got distracted by is annoying, right? Well, how, how good is it to have a mind like that? Right? Or you're trying to read a page of text and you've read the same paragraph three times in a row because you just keep worrying about what you have to do tomorrow. Right? How good is that? Right? That's a lack of, that's, a, that's what it's like to have an untrained mind. It's like, it's, it's like, it's like being you know, someone who's never worked out, but you're put into some Olympic event you know, and just set to fail. Like here's a pole vault, you know, just you know, run at that, 
you know, you know, point it, point it over there and run. Let's see what happens. Right? That's how most of us are living our lives. And and so, um, so I highly, I mean, as you can tell, I'm kind of evangelizing for this this training. But there's nothing esoteric or weird you need to do to actually. Uh, do it. So what you're saying is I don't have to go find the blue flower that glows on the side of the hill and carry it up to your mansion in the, in the, in the mountain. No, although it, it wouldn't hurt. Sensei thing. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just say I'm Batman, yeah. that would really. Uh, that was a good answer. I agree. With I like that. Answer. So everybody's going to hate me. No, let them nope. go another few okay. minutes. One more question. Because they, they've, already, they've already flagged me uh, to wrap this up so that we can say good night and get to the book oh, signing. We have, stuff. A book, so we have a book signing afterwards. There's a book so signing we're, afterwards. We're, and so you get the honor of the last question. Thank you for waiting. And our apologies to everybody else who was waiting. Hi, uh, my name is Shauna. I work as a clinical psychologist. Um, I generally have no idea what Jordan Peterson is talking about. Mm -hmm. ah, um, okay. Just get that out there. Uh, my question is for all three of you. I am curious what book or what books are currently on your nightstand? Oh, wow. That's... Oh. I mean, I literally... I, this is what, what the Kindle uh, has done to yeah. culture. I mean, I, I have... There's a there's hundred answers to that question. Yeah. It's made me a very fickle reader, but I, I have... Uh, because, because of my podcast, I'm reading so many books for that that I can just kind of go through with my upcoming guests. So I just, I just had Neil Ferguson, his book, The, the Square and the Tower. It's very interesting. Um, Robin Hansen, The Economist, I'm doing an event with soon. He's got a book, The Elephant in the Brain, that is also very interesting. Uh, so I, there's a lot of, it just is a stack of uh, books that are, that are you, can, you can just look at who I'm doing live events with in the next month and you know what books I'm reading. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah well, I'd, I'm, Except for his book. I didn't read his book. <laughs> <laughs> I, read, I read your other book. We, we did a podcast, though, but yeah, it's true, you didn't read the book. I read the book for that podcast. Yeah, um, we've done two podcasts, but... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> so you read two of my books. Have we done um, two But, okay, so let's see, there's, there's a, a few. I, I have a Kindle, so I'll, I'll use, but I actually like to read. So one of the hard copy books is Robert Sapolsky's book on, yeah. that I've been reading, which, which is interesting. And, um, and also Ed Young's book, I Am Multitudes, which is how, um, how uh, microbes affect your body in, in great ways. But there's also two books in The Origin of Religion that I've been reading, one by Stephen Greenblatt, The Origin of Adam and mm -hmm. Eve, and, um, and, uh, and another one, but what's his name, who I'm gonna, who's gonna be at my Origins event, who I love, his book, he's coming out with a new one. He's a, he's a theologian, he used to be, in North Carolina, he used to be a strong believer, but he's... he's, he's, uh, he's Bart Ehrman? What? Bart Ehrman, yeah, that's right, yeah. Bart Ehrman. I'm, uh, and yeah. I'm reading it, one of his books. He's got a new one coming out the next week, which is good, and he'll be at our Origins event in April. But the book on my nightstand um, is uh, Harry Potter, because because my, my no I was I was culturally deprived I never read it and my wife used to read it to her daughter when she was young so so now I'm reading it aloud to my wife every night before I go to sleep. Nice. That's so th this will be disappointing. Uh, but the book that's actually on my nightstand right now is is by Ian Rowland and it's. Uh, the full facts on cold reading. Ian Rowland is a mentalist in the UK who's a friend of mine, and uh, that's he just gave me the book, and I'm reading it. So, hmm. and yeah, and and the, also, and the Bible, <laughs> <laughs> because I never stop studying. Yeah. Uh, it, well, you you might be wrong. A, there you is might. a Bible in there, and it, it's a lot of it's prep work, but uh, some of it's you know masochistic fun. Hey, you know where my Bible is? I do this, uh, I do, it's really freeing, I, you know, we're staying at a hotel here, and now every time I go into a hotel, I take the Bible out of the, out of the nightstand, and I throw it in the garbage can. No. And, <laughs> and, and it's, so, it's so much fun. I really, uh, and I usually wrap it up so they don't notice it, so there's one less Bible in, 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 in the hotel. Well, and we wonder why atheists get a bad name. <laughs> at least I don't steal it. Uh, On that note, yes. uh, thank you guys so yeah. much, Chicago. Thank it's you all for coming. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Hey, Vancouver, let's talk physics and more. I'll be at the uh, Vancouver Playhouse October 13th talking about my new book, The Edge of Knowledge, 
along with Travis Pagburn. And we'll talk about a lot more than just that. We'll talk about life, the universe, and everything. And we'll also maybe talk about uh, atheism a little bit. Uh, I notice I have my God detector, and I keep looking at it every day and notice there's still no God. So maybe we'll talk about that as well. But mostly I want to focus on the mysteries of the universe, and we'll have a Q&A so you can ask questions. And I hope to have a great time out there. See you October 13th at the Vancouver Playhouse. Take care.